Good morning, everyone. It's Sunday, January 4th, and here's the latest news. NBC reporters in London and Washington are standing by, and later we hope to contact our staff correspondent in the Dutch East Indies. First, however, we turn to Britain. Go ahead, London. This is London. John McVeigh speaking. London today heard from Singapore that the British forces in northern Perak have fallen back again. The Japanese kept up their pressure during the night and followed the British closely. The British say they inflicted heavy casualties on the enemy. The Japanese yesterday made a landing at Weston in British North Borneo. Japanese ships off the west coast of Malaya were bombed last night, and 24 enemy planes raided Singapore. American and British planes based in Burma attacked a Japanese aerodrome in Siam. They shot down two fighters in the air and destroyed four planes on the ground. British bombers in Britain last night made another attack on the docks at Brest, where the Scharnhorst, Neisenau, and Prince Eugen are still held. Mr. Eden is expected to follow his radio talk today with an account of Parliament of what he saw and did in Russia. It isn't known how detailed an explanation he can give, because the Germans are probably even more eager than the British public to hear what Stalin and the British government decided. But members of Parliament will want to hear as much as possible about Russia's part in the Allied plans. The contacts between British and Russian fighting men and the visit of Russian trade union leaders to Britain are like Mr. Eden's trip, evidence that relations between the two countries have changed a lot since last June. Whenever officers and men of the British and Russian navies and air forces have got together, they've worked on the basis of easy understanding. And it seems likely that when the Russian trade unionists finish their tour of British factories, they'll have some new ideas about what the people of this island are really like. The Colonel Blimps of the Munich era, with their ideas that hardly extended beyond their own club doors, have been submerged, or at least eclipsed, by the realization that Britain must depend on allies for their very existence. Russia and America, too, have their Colonel Blimps, although they don't call them that. And things like the 26-power declaration and the announcement of unified command in the Pacific a significant proof that their views don't matter so much anymore. But General Brownrigg, writing in the Sunday Dispatch, today points out that some of the old-fashioned Colonel Blimps still exist in Britain. He says he was surprised to meet some members of a London service club who criticized the British commando raid on Ramos' headquarters in Libya. The general said there was a shade of doubt as to whether this type of thing was quite according to the accepted rules of war. General Brownrigg says, what has been done at Rommel's headquarters can be repeated elsewhere. The man at the helm of Germany may even feel that his own headquarters are not so safe as before. He may begin to wish that he hadn't started the game of playing rough. The British have been taught time after time the lesson that in any area of war, the side that has control of the air will win the battle. From France, through the Battle of Britain, and right down to Libya, the point has been proved and proved again. The fighting in Greece and Crete, proved that when air control is opposed to sea control, air control will win. Some experts, like General de Gaulle, believe that the real success of an invasion across water lies in the air and not the sea. That's why recent invasion exercises to test the defenses of British aerodromes are worrying the press and public here. The exercises are said to have proved what a lot of people suspected, that aerodromes in Britain aren't heavily enough defended to hold out against an intensive attack. The protection of aerodromes has been a joint affair conducted by both the Army and the Air Force. For a long time, observers have demanded that one force or the other should take over the job of protecting the fields and do the job right. The fact is that in the Far East, the loss of key aerodromes has opened the door to enemy military victories, is giving a new note of insistence, the demands for unified airfield defense. In Britain itself, there are so many airfields and Air Force units are so scattered that the Germans did get a few of them, in an invasion attempt, the loss might not be vital. But the British have seen how a toehold can develop into a foothold, and the prospect isn't a pleasing one. Some people here are beginning to feel that as the marshalling of the Allied forces increases, the probability of Axis defeat, so does it increase the possibility that Hitler may make a neck-or-nothing attempt to conquer the British Isles. Major Oliver Stewart, the Sunday Observer's air expert, warns that most people in Britain don't bother to carry their gas masks around these days. And he says, rumors have come in, the assembly of large quantities of gas bombs of the Germans. It would be appalling if at this stage of the war, we were again to be surprised by the ruthlessness and treachery of the enemy. This is John McVeigh in London, returning to the National Broadcasting Company in New York. 
And from our New York newsroom, here's a bulletin with the date marked Cairo, Egypt. British headquarters today raised its estimate of the number of Axis prisoners taken in the fall of Bardia to 7,000, of whom 1,000 were said to be German. Clearing of the battlefield is continuing, a communique said, indicating that the final total might be still higher. Earlier estimates had placed the number of prisoners taken in the Bardia zone at about 5,000. Advanced British units operating in the Agadabia zone, more than 300 miles to the west, were reported harassing German and Italian forces trying to make a stand there. And now for news from the other side of the world, we take you now to San Francisco. From the San Francisco newsroom, we take you now to Batavia. Hello, NBC. This is Sidney Albright speaking in Batavia, Java. Time is 9.36 Sunday evening. Today's most important piece of news in the Netherlands East Indies is the appointment of General Wei Hao as Commander-in-Chief of all Allied forces in the Far Eastern area. General Wei Bell is known here and is highly respected as a military leader, entirely capable of assuming command of the Allied operations. Like General Wei Bell, Admiral Thomas C. Hart, Commander-in-Chief of the United States Asiatic Fleet, is also well known to the people of this country. Only a short time before the Japanese launched their attack on the Philippines, the Royal Netherlands Navy CNC visited Admiral Hart in Manila. The head of the Indies Army, General H. Terporton, was conferring in Manila with General MacArthur and Admiral Hart when his predecessor, General Beresford, was killed in a plane crash in Batavia. At that time, Terporton was chief of staff. It will be recalled that the Dutch are, to a great extent, responsible for the continued efforts towards the formation of a solid ABCD block, which they had advocated long before the trend of events in the Pacific reached the showdown stage. Consequently, it is easy to understand the enthusiasm in local quarters for what is actually the fulfillment of their own hopes. It is pointed out that in this case, the democracies did not wait too long to act, which is a favorable indication that future emergencies will be handled with the same promptness. A matter of utmost importance in this war was so much hindered on the single word term. Further details of the new Allied command apparently are unknown here, or else are being kept a closely guarded secret. In any event, there is a great deal of speculation as to the location of the headquarters. Some say it is likely that General Wavell will select Malaya, whereas others are of the opinion that Java is the logical place because it occupies the key position in this section of the theater of war. Nevertheless, there is wholehearted approval here for the plan. In fact, for any plan which brings the Allied nations closer together. Local observers are wondering where the Dutch commanders-in-chief will fit into the picture. Although General Terporton has only been in command a short time, he has already demonstrated his ability as a master strategist, in addition to the fact that he was chief of staff under General Scott. From the very beginning of the Indies defense preparation, very little need be said about the ability of Admiral Helfrich, a naval commander-in-chief who was directly responsible for the Dutch assistance in the operations with the British in Borneo and off Malaya, as well as with the American forces at Davao. To say nothing of the independent thrust made at Japanese supply lines by the Dutch Navy, which, so far, are the only important successes in all the Allied operations against the Nipponese a fact that is acknowledged by the press throughout the world. The latest communique of the Netherlands Indies fighting forces reads, there was little enemy air activity over the territory. Only at a few points, Japanese aircraft were observed. No bombs were dropped anywhere. In the northwestern part of the archipelago, a Greek steamer has been bombed by Japanese aircraft. Particulars about damage done to the ship have not yet been received. End of the communique. Another expression of loyalty reached the government today from the Achi warriors in North Sumatra. They have offered to organize guerrilla bands to harass enemy landing parties and parachutists. Any attempted landings in Optimese areas would find hard going against these unsubdued jungle fighters. I now return you to the National Broadcasting Company. We now return you to New York. Again in our newsroom in New York, we bring you a late bulletin. From Moscow, the Soviet Information Bureau declared today that the Russian advance is continuing on all fronts and that a number of additional populated areas have been reoccupied and much German equipment 
has been captured. And now for news from our own nation's capital, we switch to Morgan Beatty in the newsroom in Washington. Tomorrow, Congress begins the battle of production, the undramatic but critical battle of this war. Congressmen gather for the second session of the 77th Congress, well aware of the importance of this phase of the war effort. Most of them remember the confusion of our production effort in the First World War. They recall the inflation and the panic spirals that followed. The first bill of importance on the Senate calendar takes into account the difference between 1942 and 1917. It's a bill for drastic control of prices almost immediately. Late in the last session, the House passed a price control bill, a measure generally recognized as a mild one. The administration had asked the House to permit a price administrator to license business and in this way control civilian production and prices. But there was no war in the Pacific then, so the House rejected the administration's idea and instead provided a board of review to keep a tight rein on the price administrator. Now, with war raging on all continents and the United States in the struggle up to the hilt, the Senate will consider a far more drastic measure. It provides for a price administrator who will in fact become a sort of economic czar for the duration of the war. He could license business. He could set ceilings on prices of almost anything. This price administrator would be the Second World War's counterpart of Barney Baruch, the industrial czar of the First World War. Debate begins on the measure Wednesday. Senate Banking Committee has already approved it. If the bill goes through, and it would appear that it will prevail over the milder House measure, Leon Henderson would probably become the nation's price czar, despite charges that he has surrounded himself with radical people. Henderson's many appearances before congressional committees in the last few months have impressed conservative members. Some who would have opposed him last fall are among his staunchest supporters today. They believe he has a firm understanding of the first problem to be met in the battle of production. And that first problem is inflation. Henderson has already taken preliminary steps to control the situation. The bans on automobile and tire buying are a part of his general plan. Also, the restriction on wool for civilian use. He has limited new wool consumption by civilians to 40% of last year's sales. This order is intended to give the woolen industry the go-ahead signal to manufacture 20 million uniforms and at the same time to prevent the escape of wool required for those uniforms into civilian channels. But this is all preliminary. It's only a part of the picture. The Department of Justice is analyzing war contracts. The purpose seems to be to prevent a flock of war millionaires from springing up before production controls are completed. Congress is expected to receive a $50 billion budget from the White House on Tuesday. The next point to decide will be how much of this we should pay now and how much war we should fight on credit. The president will probably call for more taxes, perhaps for payment of about one-fourth of the cost of the war as we go. The purpose behind this higher tax percentage would also be anti-inflationary. The more money Congress takes away from us in the form of taxes, the less we'll have to spend on our own needs. And the less we spend, the less likely we are to bring on the confusion of inflation. The Battle of the Philippines continues unabated. There are no new announcements from the War Department this morning. But even the Japanese foresee a long struggle before they subjugate the island of Busan, the stronghold of the Philippines. Tokyo newspapers are warning the Japanese public today that guerrilla warfare probably will continue for some time. That's one way to explain the Japanese need for large troop concentrations in the Philippines after the Japanese claim of victory. For those troops will be needed. Not only is there a possibility that General MacArthur can hold out for a long time, but also the Philippines knows themselves are not easy to whip. That's all for now. And that's the news up to this moment. These have been reports by John McVeigh in London, Morgan Beatty in Washington, and Sidney Albright in Batavia, Java. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Ladies and gentlemen, here is the early morning news of the world, and before we start our roundup of world capitals, here in the New York newsroom, we have the latest reports on fighting in the Pacific Theater. Now, the first round of the battle for the Dutch East Indies may not be over yet, but so far the Allied nations are way ahead. Upwards of 30 Japanese ships so far have been sunk or damaged in the great running sea and air fight in Makassar Strait between Borneo and Celebes. American and Dutch forces between them are believed to have accounted for close to 25,000 Japanese soldiers gone down with their transport ships. The latest success 
is the torpedoing of a Japanese aircraft carrier announced by the Navy Department last night. The big ship is believed to have sunk after the attack by an American submarine. The Australian Air Force, employing the same tactics as the Americans and the Dutch, struck at the Japanese invasion fleet in the Bismarck Islands during the night, and a Melbourne communique says that three Jap ships were damaged in Rabaul Harbor. Now, Tokyo today claims the Japanese troops in Malaya are within 30 miles of Singapore, but there is no British confirmation for that. Remember, that's a Tokyo claim. Now, there's no indication yet of where the British line is now that uh, Batu Pahat has been lost, but on the west, at least, the front is less than 60 miles from Singapore. In Burma, according to a Rangoon communique, there's no change in the situation. And it isn't quite clear from that whether General Headquarters at Rangoon means that British troops still are withdrawing toward Mulmain or whether they've braced their lines. The American volunteer flyers in Burma have smashed another Japanese attempt to attack Rangoon from the air. In the latest clash, they shot down three and maybe four Japanese planes. The exact toll of Japanese losses in the Battle of Makassar is most difficult to compute because communiques from various sources overlap. But Washington has announced that American naval forces have accounted for at least eight and possibly ten Japanese transports. American flying fortress bombers sank another transport and set fire to one. And then there's the aircraft carrier, which makes at least 13 ships sunk, or probably sunk, by American forces. Now, the Dutch have blasted as many or more. Now, here's a late bulletin from Batavia. The Japanese are believed to have extended their landings in southwest Celebes. The Netherlands High Command says the invaders apparently have occupied their points in the Kendari region of that island. In the southern hemisphere, the Pan-American Conference at Rio de Janeiro closes today, with every indication of being the most important in the history of interhemispheric relations. A final plenary session is scheduled to give formal approval to 39 resolutions designed to cleanse the entire hemisphere of Axis influences. Adoption of the resolutions is regarded as, well, just only a formality. But one century-old problem still threatens to sound a discordant note at the otherwise harmonious finale. It's the border dispute between Ecuador and Peru. Now, Ecuador may bring up the argument at the conference today unless Peru previously accepts a formula for settling the controversy. In Montevideo, an authoritative source discloses that Uruguay's diplomatic delegations in Berlin and in Rome have closed their offices. Now, the staffs will leave soon for Lisbon, preparatory to sailing for home. Uruguay is one of the 17 American nations that have broken diplomatic relations with the Axis. The diplomatic break, in addition to an economic break, has been recommended by the conference. Uruguay also is supporting anti-Axis financial moves by requiring exchange permits on all remittances to foreign countries except Great Britain and the United States. The United States delegation to the conference regards the financial measure as, well, perhaps the strongest of the entire conference. The head of the American delegation, under Secretary of State Sumner Wells, says that he's eminently satisfied with the outcome of the conference. Broadcasting to the United States last night, Wells said the conference has more than accomplished its purpose, and said, Wells, the unity of the Western Hemisphere has been preserved. From Moscow, the Red Armies are driving westward for further victories this morning. But Soviet communiques reveal no details except to say that a number of additional villages have been taken and that German losses are heavy. Word from unofficial sources is that Reserve, that's just 140 miles northwest of the Kremlin, is expected to fall any minute and that other Russian troops are pressing forward at uh, Veliki Luki, only 80 miles from the border of Soviet Latvia. The Soviet communique concludes with news of two more enemy transports sunk in the Barents Sea. Next comes news from that great democracy across the Atlantic. Go ahead, London. This is Robert St. John in London. Scrappy, round-faced Winston Churchill reported to his nation today. On the stroke of noon, the Prime Minister began a serious, hour-and-a-half fighting speech in Parliament. By his own wish... 
that speech started off a three-day debate on the whole conduct of the war. And also by his own wish, the debate will be climaxed by a vote of whether or not Parliament wishes the Churchill government to continue in office. A vote of confidence or no confidence. There is no doubt here in London about what will happen when it's all over. When all the serious and petty complaints and criticisms have been aired. There is no doubt but that Parliament will tell the world it does have confidence in Winston Churchill. Churchill himself insisted on a really free debate and a really honest vote. He insisted on this demonstration of British democracy so that, as he put it, the whole world may know where we stand. He even urged his critics not to be mealy-mouthed in their speeches. Before actually reviewing the war, Churchill was several times a bit whimsical, tossing out occasional light banter, occasional jibes at his critics. Once, for example, he chided those who have lighter burdens to carry than some of the rest of us. Once... When he referred to the flight of Rudolf Hess to Britain, a member interrupted him to ask, Where is Hess now? Without an instant's hesitation, Churchill snapped back, Where he ought to be. A high point of the Churchill speech was his announcement that a joint Pacific Council has been established, a council on which Great Britain, Australia, New Zealand, and Holland will be represented, and that Australia, New Zealand, and Canada have been granted uh, representation in the war cabinet. Uh, he called on Britain not to allow itself to become rattled by events in the Far East. He refused to predict how long the Pacific War will last, but he frankly said it will be attended by heavy punishment. He doubted that the Japs will attempt an invasion of Australia. He pledged himself to do all in his power to aid Australia and to persuade America to do likewise. Churchill told dramatically how when he left Washington, Roosevelt gripped his hand tightly and said... We will fight this thing through to the bitter end, whatever the cost may be. Churchill referred to American troop landings in Northern Ireland and said a considerable force will follow. And he also gave Hitler something to think about when he said American fighters and bombers will defend this island and will attack Germany. As the Prime Minister got into a serious review of the war, I looked over at, at a tall, thin man in the balcony near me and I noticed that he bent forward, cocking an ear and drinking in every word Churchill was saying. That man was American Ambassador John G. Wynant. A lot of other people were listening just as intently. Not a single seat on the floor of Parliament appeared to be vacant. They were there from all over, from Scotland, from Northern Ireland, from Wales, from all over England. There to hear Winston Churchill tell of his trip to America, his leadership uh, at uh, the Empire's most crucial hour and his opinion of how the war is going. Often, Churchill was interrupted by little rumbles of approval, by shouts of, hear, hear. Churchill paid tribute to uh, uh, his and our Russian allies. He disclosed that Britain has sent Stalin exactly what Stalin asked for in the way of raw material. At the moment, there is only a slight lag due to the weather, but Churchill said this lag will be overcome next month. Then he turned to Libya. He told how when the winter battle began down there, the British had 45,000 troops against an Axis army twice that size. But, said Churchill, two-thirds of those men of Hitler and men of Mussolini have been killed, wounded, or captured. The British loss has only been 18,000. Churchill was grim when he told Parliament how this battle has tested our men. He said the desert fight has proved that men cannot only die for king and country, everyone knew that, but that they can also kill. He admitted that Rommel is a daring, skillful opponent. He admitted that a grave new battle now rages. But he said uh, he never hazards a prediction about the outcome of a battle while it still is in progress. And now this is Robert St. John returning you to New York. Now for a report on events here in the United States as given by Earl Godwin from the newsroom in Washington. And good morning, folks. What I have to say comes right along behind Robert St. John because it's a part of the big effort. Your Uncle Sam and his pal John Bull get right down to cases now and pile up everything they have, all their resources, all of their ingenuity, all of their ships, all of their factories, all of their stuff, and promise to use it commonly in the common defense against this very common enemy. That's the meaning of the White House announcement which was released this morning about three joint war boards and so forth. 
The White House announced that the new boards will handle separate phases of a plan to knit still more closely the gigantic efforts of the United Nations. One of the new groups will control shipping. Another will control raw materials. And the third, possibly the most important, will direct the disposition of munitions. All possible information between this country and England will be exchanged under the plan, and though only Britons and Americans will actually be board members, it is believed and said they will confer often with representatives of the other United Nations. It is expected these board members will be appointed shortly. I think that would give you a better picture if you just envisioned a, a common storeroom to which these boards will go to take the stuff that is needed here, there, and everywhere, everywhere, and just use them against the onslaught without resort to as much red tape and conferring as there has been. Meantime, Washington hears rather loud, short and sharp, sharp cries from down under, where the Australians and the Dutch are telling us, in effect, to hurry up and get busy or else. That seems to mean that the Aussies and the East Indian Dutch want the United States and Britain to help in a terrific and possibly a reckless offensive against the Japanese who are coming right down the line regardless. They are stopped for a brief time by successful naval engagements against them in the Straits, but no one believes the Japs will stop there. And incidentally, that remark of St. John's that the British government does not believe that the Japanese will invade or attempt to invade Australia is the first we have heard of it here because here in this country or in this, in this city, I haven't heard anybody uh, say that the Japanese would not invade Australia. In fact, we have thought they would if they could. The president signs that bill, by the way, to extend the retirement system, and that includes congressmen who must contribute a slice of their wages, same as everyone else. And the House finally agrees to what it looks to me to be a rather ragged version of the price control bill. The Senate may take it up and finish the thing today. Nobody, I haven't found anybody who gives the way this bill is written a 100% endorsement, but it provides a vast and severe price control authority including authority to control rents in defense areas. And it gives the price administrator the power and authority to license you to do business. And if you don't conform to the government price regulations, out you go on your ear. But the price controller, of course, must get the court to do that. Also, you're permitted to go to court and sue anybody who overcharges you, and you may get three times the overcharge back. Sugar rationing this morning stands at about 12 ounces a week per person when they actually get down to rationing. The Dias Committee is in a mood to say I told you so and will reveal to Congress all it had on the Japanese espionage organization on the West Coast, which Dias says he was urged to keep under cover while the executive branch of the government tried to smooth over the Japanese situation. That was more than, I think that was within the last two years. And a heavy concentration of Japanese merchants here were organized into a front for Japanese spy work, and Dai says that he has all the information and intends to put it into a booklet and lay it before Congress in about two weeks. That's all from Washington at this time. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, the latest news of the world. Now, you've heard our reporter, Robert St. John in London, Earl Godwin in Washington, and this is John Fraser speaking from New York. For the latest news, keep tuned to this station. This is the Blue Network. The News of the World, Wednesday, February 11th. Once again, Columbia prepares to call in its correspondents in various world capitals to give you the latest news by shortwave radio. This morning, we shall call in London and Washington and also attempt to bring you the news direct from Batavia in the heart of the Far East fighting zone. In addition, Harry Marble will report on the latest developments at points not covered by our direct pickup. But first, here is the situation in brief. The Japanese are closing in on the city of Singapore from the north and west, but the British have launched some counterattacks. In Burma, the Japanese have crossed the Salween River. MacArthur's men are holding their lines on Bataan. The Dutch are fighting a stubborn delaying action around Macassar on the Celebes and Banjanasan in Borneo. And now, Harry Marble. Before calling in Batavia for the report of William Dunn, here is the latest news of Russia. The Red Army announced this morning that the Germans have lost still another general. He was killed in the Smolensk region, west of Moscow, and this time there is no question about how he died. 
Soviet guerrillas blew up the staff car in which he was riding. The Red Army continues to carry the fight to the Nazis. A bitter battle is raging around Rajev, where the besieged German garrison is trying to fight its way out, and German reinforcements are trying to fight their way in, both without success, according to Moscow. Another battle is raging around Kharkov, the industrial city in the Ukraine, and the Berlin radio admits Soviet gains in this area. For a report direct from the Far East, we take you to Batavia and the news by William J. Dunn. This is Batavia. Fighting continues tonight along the southwestern arm of the island of Salobu, where the Japanese are carrying out landings at points nearly 100 miles apart. The House communicator of the NEI fighting forces says that landings have been affected in Malamita, Yenaponto, and Barambong, as well as at MacArthur. Few details are available. The communique also reports that a flight of Japanese bombers on its way to Surabaya was intercepted by Dutch fighters and broken up. It failed to reach the city. Enemy reconnaissance is reported over northern Sumatra and part of West Java. It was also announced this evening that three Dutch fighters were shot down during Monday's machine gun raid of aerodromes near Batavia. All members of the crews of these aircraft were killed. This afternoon, I had an opportunity to inspect several of the streamlined detachable gasoline tanks, which have given the Japanese Navy old fighters a cruising range comparable to that of a small bomber. These tanks dropped in the vicinity of the cave during Monday's raid, resembled a small torpedo, about seven feet in length and 24 inches in diameter. They are constructed of exceedingly thin aluminum and are light enough for the average man to lift with ease. Each has a capacity of 90 to 100 gallons of fuel, which should add nearly two hours to the cruising time of the plane, with the engine operating at fractional power. The tanks are attached to the underside of the plane by a single connecting rod and are cut free in flight when empty or whenever necessary. One of the tanks I saw today was badly battered and torn by its fall and could be examined thoroughly. Probably the most impressive part of the mechanism will be to serve its extreme simplicity. My non-technical eye could pick out only a pump, a gas line, an air pressure pipe, and the connecting device. The cost of the entire tank should be very nominal, particularly in the light of other wartime expenditures. Complete with gasoline, the tank should add a little more than 750 pounds to the flying load of the fighter plane. Batavia tonight is still watching the Singapore situation with extreme concern. There has been almost no news from the besieged island today, but there is little doubt here that the battle for the British stronghold is rapidly approaching a crisis. The American volunteer flying group in Burma continues to be one of the biggest headaches imposed on the Japanese Air Force. The Air Officer Commanding Burma has just issued an order commending the force for the destruction of their 100 anti planes since the war started. Last week at Surabaya, a salvage crew was engaged in pulling Japanese airmen from the wreckage of a bomber which had been shot down over the city. As each man was removed, he was subjected to a thorough examination. One of the Japs was wearing a pair of trousers which carried a neatly lettered label inside the belt band. The label read, Java Story, Surabaya. This is William J. Dunn in Batavia. I return you now to Columbia in New York. Next, across the Atlantic for the news direct from the British capital, and now to London and Charles Collingwood. Good morning. This is London. British resistance at Singapore is stiffening. An authoritative London commentator said a few minutes ago that the British are counterattacking and that their counterattacks are meeting with some measure of success. It is reasonable to say, said this authoritative source, that the situation is certainly no worse and there are indications that it's better. The British are counterattacking toward their original line from which they withdrew day before yesterday. They are also attacking against the second Japanese landing to the north. A broadcast by the Malaya Broadcasting System this morning says that the Japanese are using the better part of three divisions against the Singapore defenders. The broadcast went on to declare that all useful installations in the great Singapore naval base have been blown up. Ships of the British and Dutch merchant navies are daring the almost continuous Japanese bombardment 
to dash in and out of the harbor, evacuating as many women and children as possible. All reports from Singapore say that the civil population are reacting with complete calm. Smoke from burning oil stores in the north of the island rises like a great pillar of black cloud by day, and by night gusts of wind whip the fires into towering tongues of flame. Against this background, the life in Singapore City provides another curious example of the way in which old habits and ways of life persist through the most fateful situations. People are going on working in Singapore just as usual. The buses and the rickshaws make their normal rounds. People dress up and go to a tea dance at the big hotel. Perhaps most surprising of all, people stand in line to get into a movie. It's hard to say just what else they might do. They would only be a nuisance in the fighting line or on the road. People in London acted the same way during the days and nights of the great German air raid. There's no particular moral attached to it. It's just surprising to see how people act while their destiny is being fought out around them. The affair of the Vichy supplies to the Axis forces in North Africa is still causing a great deal of interest and some concern here in London. Although the supplies don't seem to have been large, the British Minister of Economic Warfare confirmed in the House of Commons yesterday that they were being sent. There's been a great deal of speculation about just how these supplies get to Vichy, North Africa. Today, an authoritative London commentator suggested that they had almost certainly come in French ships. These ships were probably sent either from Italian ports or from French ports. The supplies actually got to Rommel's forces by road and rail from Tunisia. Well-informed quarters say that in view of this information, the whole question of allied relations with the Vichy government is being reconsidered. In Libya, where these French supplies are supposed to have been getting to, the Axis forces are still stalled well to the west of Tobruk. They've recovered about two-thirds of the ground which they lost to General Auchinleck without having to do any real fighting at all. However, there are indications that if they attempt to proceed any farther, they will come up against well-prepared British resistance. One of the factors in this Axis halt may well be their lack of air support. The RAF has almost uncontested air superiority over the forward area. British fighter pilots report that they are meeting with almost no opposition from the Luftwaffe. The Royal Air Force was also active in the west last night. British bombers attacked Bremen and other targets in northwest Germany, and once again, bombs were dropped on the docks at Brest. The RAF is doing its best to say that the Scharnhorst and the Gneisenau stay put. This is Charles Collingwood in London, returning you to Columbia in New York. For the news in our own nation's capital, we take you to Washington for the report of Eric Severi. Today is the national holiday of Japan. Some authorities in Washington, whose job it is to carefully check the progress of the Philippine fighting each day, believed last weekend that the Japanese would try to complete the capture of the Philippine Islands in time for today's celebration. This morning it appeared that Singapore might fall before the Philippines. But there is a feeling here that the final hour of trial for MacArthur's men is now at hand. The fight for Luzon has continued 65 days. No one here any longer speaks about reinforcing the men in the Philippines. And for what material can get to the Far East, other areas with more chance have priority. There's little speculation about MacArthur's chances of evacuating. It's believed by many that the small group will first try to withdraw the, to the Corregidor Fortress in Manila Bay. That fortress probably could withstand a fairly long siege, but it's recognized and that would be defiance without hope. As the two forces line up today, something less than 20,000 Americans and Filipinos are facing something more than 100,000 Japanese. The military problem of coping with the Japanese in the Far East has a parallel in the legal and administrative problem of coping with them on the west coast of the United States. Yesterday, a committee of Pacific Coast senators and representatives asked that all persons of Japanese ancestry, and that would mean many who are now American citizens, be evacuated from the coast and that individuals be, would be readmitted only on license. Mass evacuation of citizens or ousting of individuals, according to the Justice Department, would be illegal unless the land were condemned for use by the military. One solution now being discussed is a declaration of martial law in these areas. Then the Army would move citizens as well as aliens. Pacific Coast congressmen are expected to meet again tomorrow. They may ask the President to issue an executive order to carry out the evacuation they want. Another possible solution is the arrest of citizens and aliens for what is known as protective custody, arrest for their own safety. That has already been applied in two or three cases. For example, in one southwestern town, an industry had brought in Japanese workers to replace whites who had been a long time on strike. Then the war began, and it so happened that a large number of sons and brothers from that town 
were in the Philippines fighting against the Japanese, and a number died there. The resentment against the Japanese locally flared up, and for their own safety, the Japanese workers, undoubtedly quite innocent of any fault of their own, were gathered up and moved away. Problems more severe than the legal problems are involved. In some big Pacific areas, the Japanese grow and deliver a high percentage of the vegetables and fruits consumed. And there happens to be a nationwide campaign underway to increase food production. And by careless action, that could be harmed. Tonight, the Republicans will dine. At their annual Lincoln dinners around the country, they will work up the first flush of enthusiasm over next fall's election. Joe Martin, Jr., the Republican national chairman, said the dinners would be mostly patriotic affairs. The speakers will insist on the right of constructive criticism during more time. At the big dinner here tonight, the principal speaker will be not the last Republican candidate for president, Wendell Wilkie, but the one before that, Alf Landon. I return you now to New York. The word security, the great illusion. In every capital of the allied world, there were bitter charges that there had been too much of the illusion of security, too much complacency, too much lethargy. Australia threw away the word security. Mother India forgot it, as the Japanese opened up their all-out drive on Burma. Britannia, ruler of the waves, found that her own Straits of Dover were no longer impregnable. Singapore, with its hundreds of millions of dollars worth of fortifications, thought bitterly of that word security. And America's leaders warned, and warned again, that we are taking a licking in the Pacific. The warning came from Donald T. Nelson himself, the industrial czar of our war effort. Even America's own shores were not secure in their rock-bound distance from the enemy camp. Submarines working off those shores had proved it. It was proved again in flames, fire which swept the line of Normandy, a blaze started by carelessness. The critics of these appalling setbacks pointed to but one factor, false security and gross and utter carelessness. In London, in New York, and in Australia, carelessness was blamed in the public print for the plight of Singapore, for the victory of the German battleships Mazenau and Scharnhorst reaching the Straits of Dover, for the Normandy fire, for lack of air power. In all the highlights of the week's news, there was but one highlight for the Allies, only one bright spot, and that, the disclosure of the terrific damage wrought by the American Navy in its attack on the Japanese-held Marshall and Gilbert Islands. A couple of emperors didn't get much sleep on the night of February the 11th. Emperor Hirohito's royal head didn't touch a pillow all night. The Tokyo radio says the emperor was gripped by insomnia. So anxious was he to receive without delay the latest reports on the Japanese fighting in the city of Singapore. Emperor Hirohito could just as well have got his eight hours on the night of February the 11th. In Hsinking, meanwhile, the temperature hovered at 20 degrees below zero on the night of February the 11th. In the very coldest hours just before dawn, Emperor Kang Ti of Manchukuo got up in his bedroom, had his royal aides help him on with his royal clothes. Then, while it was still dark, Emperor Kang Ti made a cold journey to the shrine of the Japanese sun goddess. There he, too, offered his prayer for Singapore. Well, that particular morning, Emperor Kang Ti could have saved himself the trouble and turned over and grabbed an extra hour in his warm bed. Because Singapore didn't fall that day, or the next, or the next. For the British troops were busy writing their history into the proud annals of the British Empire. But critics said the reason for Singapore's invasion was not a proud chapter in anybody's history. Yes, and the critics were numerous throughout the British Empire. Those who were there say it really began at Penang, this disaster which was engulfing Singapore. Penang is a little island off the northern Malayan coast, abundant in tin and rubber. The Japanese took it in a lightning thrust, but how they took it was another matter. There were charges that the British had no anti-aircraft guns at Penang, that there were no fighter protection, that they hadn't even camouflaged vital area targets, and that they did not carry out a scorched earth policy in their retreat from the rich middle earth, in their retreat from the rich middle earth, in their retreat... Good morning, everyone. Here is the Sunday morning roundup of the news from our correspondents all over the world. First, here is our reporter in London, England. This is London. John McVeigh speaking. London has heard the Tokyo claim that the British forces in Singapore have asked for an armistice. But so far, there's no confirmation of the reports here. London heard from Cairo a few minutes ago that considerable movement of enemy mechanical transport and armored vehicles was observed yesterday east of the line to Mimi Makili. 
The British harassed them from the air and during the day practically wiped out an entire enemy air force of 30 dive bombers and fighters. London also learned from Batavia that the Japanese began a big sea attack today against Palembang, the oil center on the southeast coast of Sumatra. It's reported that the Dutch have begun destruction of the oil installations. If completed, it would be the greatest material voluntary destruction the world has known. It's said here that Palembang is the main center for supplying fuel to the Allied navies in these parts of the world. If Palembang falls, the island of Banka will almost inevitably come under Japanese control. This would cut off the southern approach to Singapore, making the encirclement of the island complete. As you know, there's been a lot of discussion in Britain about the Scharnhorst and Gneisenau. Commentators have talked about little else for the last three days. I've read most of what's been written here, and I've heard what various authoritative quarters have to say. Perhaps the most significant point is that if the German Navy has come up the channel once, it may do so again. There seems to be no real reason why, given proper weather conditions, the German Navy couldn't hold the channel for 24 hours, long enough for a fleet of invasion barges to get across and establish a bridgehead in England. The Germans now have a pretty sizable naval fleet, led by the battleship Tirpitz. With the British and American fleets scattered all over the world, the Germans can put out a naval striking force that might establish temporary control of a limited area. The destruction of big allied convoys or the guarding of invasion craft seem to be the two most obvious ways of using that force. To work in mid-Atlantic would give the British and American navies the chance to concentrate against the German fleet. But working in the North Sea, off the Norwegian coast, or in the Channel under heavy fighter protection would mean the Germans could do their work and get back to shelter before we could challenge them with any power sure to destroy them. Even in mid-Atlantic, the German fleet wouldn't be easy to find. If the enemy did get their whole naval force loose in the Atlantic, it could threaten all Atlantic communications, open up the possibility of a prestige raid against the, in the eastern coast of the United States, and generally challenge allied control of the Atlantic. Unexpected audacity has paid the Germans well more than once, and it might do so again. The action in the Channel proved not only the value of fighter protection for warships, it also proved that aircraft alone are not enough to stop big naval craft that are properly guarded. The British put between two and three hundred bombers and between three and four hundred fighters into the attack. The weather was so bad that the whole attack seems to have turned into an every man for himself offensive. But even if it had been better, there's no reason to think that the attack would have been sure of success. The German fighters had to protect only the small area above the moving convoy. If the weather had been clear, air losses on both sides might have been greater. But the British, the British would have had a better chance of scoring bomb hits. But the torpedo planes wouldn't have had any better chance of getting close enough to make sure of hitting the warships. The Germans are believed to have been helped in predicting weather conditions by the German embassy in Dublin. Weather moves from east, from west to east, and full reports of era weather today certainly help build up the German picture of what the weather will be over the Dover Straits or the North Sea tomorrow or the next day. The Sunday Times writer Scrutator, noting that the Germans met nothing bigger than a destroyer, today says that everyone understands that the Navy's larger units must be stationed outside the narrow waters. But it's another matter that they should be stationed too far off to attempt interception at all. Scrutator says the action serves as a distinct warning that on certain sides, the RAF's efficiency needs keying up. John Gordon, editor of the Sunday Express, says one might reasonably have thought that after two years of preparation for an invasion, the British would have, have an anti-invasion machine ready in the channel, which would make the channel an inferno the moment hostile ships moved into it. The instant the Germans were spotted, he says, one might have imagined that clouds of mine-laying airplanes and small ships would have been strewing death in the limited sea path through which they must pass, that oil ships would be setting the sea on fire, that battleships fit to meet them would have been somewhere near to pounce on them. Yet what happened, Gordon adds? Airmen went out to bomb them with most magnificent bravery, but with the wrong machines for the job. This is John McVeigh in London, returning you to New York. And next, a story as received here in New York from Moscow. Russian ski troops on the Central Front are crowding the Nazis backward to the old Polish border. Moscow Radio says this morning that four more towns have been retaken in one sector alone in this continued drive westward from Moscow. On three sectors of this long front, the German dead number almost 3,000 in two days of bitter fighting. And now let's hear more about the fighting in the Pacific. For our next report, 
We take you to the newsroom in San Francisco. Now we span the vast expanse of the broad Pacific as we go directly to the Southwest Theater aboard to pick up Sidney Albright in Batavia, Java. This is Sidney Albright speaking in Batavia. The time is 8.36 on Sunday evening. Giving details of the attack on Palembang and the destruction of the oil wells and installations in that area, today's communique of the Netherlands Indies Fighting Forces says, as was stated yesterday, the Japanese, on Saturday morning, launched an attack over Palembang, dropping large numbers of parachuters. One Japanese bomber was shot down. At three different points, a total of 700 parachuters were dropped, armed with Tommy guns and light mortars. The attack was clearly directed against the oil refineries, but the enemy did not succeed in conquering them. Our troops did a good job and made short work of the invaders. Towards the evening, two of the points of attack were completely cleared of parachuters, while at the third point, we had the situation well in hand, with some tens of the enemy still alive. Expecting large-scale landing action, we proceeded the course of the night to carry out the thorough destruction of all vital points in the vicinity of Palembang. Bombers of the Royal Netherlands Indies Army this morning scored three direct hits on three Japanese transport ships near Muntok on the island of Bunker. The communique also states, it has been reported from South Celebes that the fight is still being continued in that area, especially in the vicinity of Makassar, where resistance is being maintained with great stubbornness. The Anambas Islands, east of Malaya, have been occupied by the Japanese. Furthermore, slight enemy air activity has been reported from various places in the outer provinces. End of the communique. As a prelude to the parachutist attack yesterday morning, enemy aircraft attacked the aerodrome the preceding day. The attack was made by six bombers and 24 Navy O's. Some bombs and many incendiaries were dropped, but the enemy formations were dispersed by Dutch anti-aircraft. Meanwhile, 11 hurricane fighters of the RAF went into the air and a bitter fight ensued. In the dog fight that followed, RAF pilots succeeded in shooting down three Japanese fighters and one bomber. One of the hurricanes is missing. One was destroyed on the ground and a third crashed, but the pilot of this plane is safe. The voluntary destruction of the Palembang oil fields is one of the most serious disasters suffered by the Allies since the war started. The limited oil supplies available on the island of Java are barely enough to take care of Dutch requirements. Oil for the Allied forces will now have to be carried over long distances to the field of operations. The loss of the oil at Paracan, Samarinda, and Balak Papan fades into insignificance compared to the losses at Palembang from a monetary point of view. And although the actual figures are not yet available, it is known that the value was even greater than all of the Borneo fields added together. Most of the American money invested in Netherlands Indies oil was concentrated in and around Palembang. The reference in the communique to expected large-scale landing action can be taken to mean that these operations are actually in progress. The three enemy transport ships, which were hit by Dutch bombers near Montauk, were most probably headed for the Meuse River, which is navigable by large ships right up to the city of Palembang. If this assumption is correct, it will be the first attempt to invade Sumatra, although various parts of the island have been subjected to frequent raids during the past month. I now return you to San Francisco. Now across the nation to Morgan Beatty, who speaks from the newsroom in Washington. A week of Axis gains on both sides of the world has raised a storm of criticism in Great Britain, as John McVeigh has told you. On our side of the Atlantic, the changing situation has brought numerous demands for a checkup of American war strategy and war production. The rubber situation is first on the list. Jesse Jones, war finance chief, and Donald Nelson, the war production czar, 
have issued a joint statement urging conservation of rubber. They admit we have barely enough to supply our armed forces for the next two years. The statement implies that Japanese advances in Malaya are responsible for the situation. But it is significant that neither Jones nor Nelson came forward until after Wendell Wilkie and Senator Ralph Brewster of the political opposition demanded the truth about rubber. The statement probably comes too late to block a Senate committee investigation of the rubber situation, an inquiry aimed at finding out why we did not step up synthetic production before Pearl Harbor. And the demand is growing for a Senate investigation of government agencies. Senator, Senator Millard E. Tidings of Maryland fired the opening barrage against the administration. His weekend charge in the Senate that governmental agencies present the problem of an overgrown monstrosity is still ringing in political ears in the Capitol. He also warns against the social reformatory bureaucracy at home in a critical hour of our history. The president had anticipated attacks of that kind earlier in the week. He ordered government agencies to check up their employees and find out how many could be released for war work. But the Senate Appropriations Committee has approved Tidings' demand for an investigation anyway. And the Navy inquiry into the Normandy fire is not satisfactory to some congressmen. They want an authority higher than a naval board to discover the facts about the strange fire aboard the former French liner. Sporadic labor troubles still plague the war production front. 600 men have walked out of the aluminum company plant in, De in Detroit, one of the most important defense plants in the Detroit area. The trouble had its beginning in the CIO demands for double time on Sunday. The argument has been underway since January the 8th. And out in Seattle, that strike by independent welders has not been cleared up. But hundreds of AF of L men have charged the welder's picket line to enter the shipbuilding plant. All of these domestic worries have been added to reversals in the Far East and in the Atlantic War Zone. They indicate a revision of war production upward and a drastic alteration of the strategic picture. The Navy is now confronted with a stronger axis in the Atlantic, a German fleet capable of breaking out into the North Sea and into the Atlantic itself and roaming the waters of the Western Hemisphere. If that Navy could also take over the French fleet, a maneuver the Axis powers obviously hope to carry out, then we actually will be confronted with a two-ocean war and only a one-ocean Navy to fight that war. There's simply no blinking the fact that Japanese advances in the Orient and German threats in the Atlantic actually do bring a two-ocean war within the range of probability, which means the United States has reached a crossroads in history requiring more courage, more sacrifice, and greater determination than any of our pioneer forebears had to put forth. And new reports filtering into Washington reflect our intention to meet this challenge. For example, the executive of, big, of a big steel company has just reported that one of the plant's workmen has developed a shortcut to save five seconds on each billet of steel turned out. That five seconds means 79,000 tons more steel in that plant by the end of this year. That's all for now. And the news from Washington ends this Sunday morning roundup of news. You have heard John McBain from London, Sidney Albright from Batavia, and Morgan Beatty from our own capital. For the latest news, keep tuned to this station. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Ladies and gentlemen, Saturday, February the 21st, and here now is a roundup of the latest news at home and abroad as reported by our foreign correspondents. Now, we take you first today to London. This is London. John McVeigh speaking. The British have no news from Timor and Bali today. There's no confirmation in London of Japanese landings in Java. The latest from Burma is that fierce fighting with heavy casualties on both sides is still going on around the Bilin River positions. In Libya, patrols on both sides are feeling out the strength of the massing forces. I had a long talk with General de Gaulle last night. As always, his comments on the development of the war were crystal clear, the product of a reflective mind that's sure of itself and sure of its conclusions. With his family and intimate friends, de Gaulle's conversation is lightened with a droll wit that doesn't appear in his public statements. The general expressed great interest in American war effort. He realizes the psychological value to the country of speedy organization of a la large mass army but he points out that battles are not won by masses. He believes, and the German army adopted his belief, 
that the only thing that really counts is how much mechanized material a country can actually put in use. He says, if a country has an army of 10 men, it must be able to use all 10. If it has an air force of 1,000 planes, it must be able to use 1,000 planes. De Gaulle says, for instance, that it's not how many men Britain and, Ameri and America can keep under arms in their own countries that will win the war. It's how big a striking force, fully equipped with tanks, planes, and guns, can be shifted quickly to any theater of war. The Free French leader has great admiration for General MacArthur, the admiration of one fighting man for another. And he thinks the Battle of Baton is a great moral victory, proving that Americans can face great odds and keep on fighting successfully. De Gaulle was talking about the number of men now in the American army, and he said, you see, if MacArthur had had three armored divisions, a relatively small number of men, he would still control the Philippines. He said that if America had been in a position to send one complete mechanized division to Libya a month or so ago, Rommel would probably have been decisively beaten. But to be mobile in this world war, an army must have ships. De Gaulle points out that without the ships to transport them, millions of men and quantities of material are locked up useless inside the United States and Britain. I asked the general whether he believed the Germans would try to invade England. He doesn't think that with the Russians pressing against them in the east, the Germans can spare enough men and material to try an invasion. The invasion of Britain would take thousands of planes and a huge quantity of ships. And de Gaulle doesn't think the Germans have enough to make invasion a probability this summer. But the Free French General does think the Germans will carry out an offensive in the east, probably a thrust and a comparatively small front toward the Caucasus oil. Britain is guarded against invasion by huge army, armies, but de Gaulle says there's no reason to think the Germans aren't worried by the possibility that the British may carry out an invasion of the continent. He thinks the offensive spirit is an important factor in war, that the Allies should be taking every opportunity to hit out at the enemy, to put them on the defensive. And the troops now guarding Britain might well be used to strike at the Germans. De Gaulle recalls that the actual German striking force that conquered France was a fairly small, mobile, powerfully armored force. And he thinks the democracy's tendency toward mass armies, the drafting of men from war industries, is a wrong line of thought. I got the impression that he believed there should be greater concentration on building the tanks, ships, and planes, the equipment that can give an army effective hitting power. What wins battles, he says, is the force you were able to exert at the right time in the right place, not the potential force that you can't put into the conflict. De Gaulle is sure that France will, after the war, again be an important factor in world civilization. He's quietly confident when he talks about France, for he's sure the free French represent the vast mute mass of the French people. The Vichy government, he thinks, no longer has any intrinsic importance. It serves Hitler well by making a certain percentage of the people in unoccupied France believe they are no longer in the war. This is a potentially dangerous feeling, for if Germany is beaten and the French people feel they had no part in the victory, that it wasn't their victory just as much as that of Britain, Russia, and America, there'll be a smoldering discontent in France. And de Gaulle believes that peace in Europe after the war depends on one thing, just how long the United States, Britain, Russia, and France will cooperate. Just before I left him, I asked de Gaulle what he thought of the Rion trial. His first words summed up the feeling of every Frenchman I've met here. He said, in the first place, it isn't a trial. This is John McVeigh in London, returning you to New York. Here in New York, we have two bulletins just been brought into the newsroom. The first is Dateline Batavia, a major naval battle from all accounts even bigger than the Battle of Macassar Straits is being fought in the waters off Bali, it was reported today, with four Japanese warships already damaged by combined United States and Dutch naval forces. The fighting, which apparently began shortly after midnight yesterday in a sharp sea engagement between Bali and Lombok Islands, apparently still is going on. And from Rangoon, Desperate attempts by Japanese invasion troops to penetrate the British held line west of the Berlin River have all been frustrated, officials declared today. Now we take you to the newsroom in San Francisco. From the west coast of the United States, we take you out across the Blue Pacific to the Hawaiian Islands. Go ahead, Honolulu. Go ahead, Honolulu. This is Jim Wall speaking from KGU in Honolulu. It is 2.36 Saturday morning in Hawaii. The islands of Hawaii, forming the westernmost American bastion, stick out into the turbulent Pacific to use common local parlance like a sore thumb. 
But here we use the word sore in the sense of angry determination. And this thumb is pointed at Japan and ready to crush any prowling Japanese gadflies beneath it. We in Hawaii, nearly halfway to the war-shattered Orient, are in a peculiar position. We have a grandstand seat, and we're watching hour by hour developments in the Pacific with intense interest. Our interest is not just curiosity. Every man and woman in Hawaii, soldier, sailor, marine, civilian war worker or office worker, realizes that the Pacific battle is rapidly approaching its gigantic climax, and that if the Japanese continue to make progress, as they have since the fall of Singapore, it is possible, if not probable, that they may turn their full attention toward us, rather than toward India or Russia. It was said by the complacent British that Singapore was invulnerable, but Singapore fell. We in Hawaii do not say that it can't happen here, but we're preparing to meet the showdown if it should happen here. Hawaii is the springboard from which the Army and Navy may take offensive action westward against the enemy. It is also the front-line defensive area in case of attack, particularly so now that the Japanese are overrunning the Philippines and Indies. As the threat draws closer, many developments in our daily existence may serve as indications of our preparedness. We've been living under strict martial law for nearly three months. That means, among other things, total blackout from dark to dawn, rigid curfew, and complete prohibition. Ours is no semi blackout, as in many West Coast cities. If you're guilty of so much as lighting a cigarette on the street after dark, you're likely to be picked up by the tin-hatted sentries, whisked before an all-night army court, and heavily fined. The curfew is real. No one moves about after it rings unless specially permitted to do so. And there hasn't been a legal sale of a drink in formerly easygoing Hawaii since the first bombs fell. We won't mention pineapple swipes and lemon extracts. We don't know what the future will bring, but we're getting ready. We realize that nowhere in this war-torn world are military regulations so rigidly enforced as here. Our blackout is blacker than London's. Our barbed wire fills every lonely beach. Every uniformed man and civilian carries a gas mask day and night. Many civilians also carry helmets. These regulations sometimes hurt, but there's no grumbling. We're too busy for that. We have rent control in Hawaii today to prevent profiteering. We have food price control for the same reason. We have a rigid rationing of gasoline. My home, for example, is on the other side of this island, 14 miles from Honolulu. But I haven't been able to live there since the war began because it's too difficult to travel over the winding roads in total blackout and because the gasoline rationing this month prohibits any idea of being able to move back. Everyone in Hawaii is making sacrifices such as these and thinking nothing of them. We expect to be inconvenienced by war, and many men who work hard six days a week go out on Sunday, their rest day, as volunteer workmen without pay to cut brush and trees and clear land which the Army wants to use. We used to have a three-day weekend in Lazy Honolulu. Today, we haven't got a half-day weekend. I tell you these things because we have reports here that mainland cities have approached the state of martial law with considerable trepidation. We don't have to be reminded to remember Pearl Harbor. There's just a short way down the beach here. We're working toward the day when the Japanese will have good cause to long remember Pearl Harbor, too. I'll return you to San Francisco. Now back across the continent to our newsroom in Washington. Good morning, folks. A great many of you interesting people write to me asking why someone does not rescue General MacArthur. I think the answer is that he would not be rescued if somebody even went after him. He could, they say, be taken away from there by an order from the commander-in-chief, the president. But his kind of men don't even obey orders like that because he has, I imagined, arranged so that if such an order came, he would never get it. That's possible. Lord Nelson signaled to withdraw from a naval engagement, put his telescope to his blind eye. I see nothing, he said, and went on fighting to victory. And in the log of the ship on which Nelson died, you'll find this. Victory having been reported, the admiral then died of his wounds, and Trafalgar remains as an inspiration to the United Nations in trouble. 
I take a chance on thus preaching rather than reporting today because spot news in Washington is not so hot. The Army, of course, is glad to have the President's order permitting the delineation of Jap-out areas on the West Coast. But Attorney General Biddle here cautions one and all that this is not martial law, such as you heard about from Jim Wall, was it, in Honolulu, wherein the right of habeas corpus is suspended and civil rights go glimmering. Of course, this is not an invitation to Japs and Nazis to try to beat the Army's evacuation orders with the courts. However, when the Dyes Committee yellow paper comes out next week, I think the public will get a glimpse in long detail of some of the Jap activities in spy work along the West Coast. Congress slows down to a balk. It doesn't like some of the legislation handed to the leaders. But from now on until, until Tuesday, the main activity in Congress will be hearing some orator read George Washington's farewell address and going back to the congressional offices to write to enraged constituents who are still boiling over mad about pensions for congressmen. A matter which will be attended to first thing, I think, after Washington's birthday, the repeal of that provision of the law. Congress didn't like, too, and I say they're balking. Congress didn't like, doesn't like, the superlative overall plan to provide endless public works after the war, and the House threw that down, not because of the public works, but Congress has no objection to forward-looking statesmanship at all. But somehow or others, the voters seem not to like the connotation of the word planning. Look out for fireworks on the highly controversial thing called the War Powers Bill. Only four hours have been allowed by the hard-boiled House Committee on Rules for debate on this dynamite, which is loaded with extra authority for a lot of these special agencies, which seem to be under fire. But this is war, and the leadership is ready to mow them down if they get in the way. There's a row expected over the proposal to permit banks to buy government bonds direct from the Treasury. Opponents say it will work in reverse, that the Treasury will cram the bonds down the bankers' throats. The Rogers bill providing for the Women's Army Corps will be considered and passed by the House next week, I believe. So many women seem to think this corps has been established, but not yet. A ship-a-day schedule of the Maritime Commission is filling the waters of the American cargoes. will step up to two-a-day by May, by May 1st. Bananas, one of nature's best slippers and more economical than petroleum grease, will be used today to launch the ship called the Cape Romano at Beaumont, Texas. 7,000 pounds of bananas to launch the ship. And that's all from Washington at this time. That's the news of the day, ladies and gentlemen. These have been reports by John McBain from London, Jim Wall from Honolulu, and Earl Godwin from Washington. For the latest news, keep tuned to this station. This is the National Broadcasting Company. The program originally scheduled at this time will be delayed in order that we may bring you a special broadcast from the Far East War Zone. The National Broadcasting Company presents Martin Nagronsky, noted NBC correspondent who has been heard in the past from Ankara, Turkey, Cairo, Athens, Singapore, and more recently from Batavia, Java. From these points, he's covered various phases of the war as it spread across Europe and into the Orient. Agronsky has just arrived in Australia and will now bring to NBC listeners his first report from Sydney. Go ahead, Martin Agronsky. This is Martin Agronsky calling from Sydney. Today I arrived here from the Dutch East Indies after a flight of a Dutch bomber through the Jap air patrols over Java and the Indian Ocean. In the area I left behind me, the Japs, for the capture of Singapore had already accomplished the first phase of their drive for empire in the Far East. On the day I left Java, they had successfully attacked and captured Palembang in southern Sumatra. As I flew over the Indian Ocean toward Australia, the Japs launched their attack on Bali. I picked off Java's southernmost tip. The outcome of the Allied defense of Bali is not yet completely known. It would take an incurable optimist to doubt the ultimate result. 
The Allied defenses there, as throughout the Far Eastern theater of war, are pitifully weak. With Bali in Japanese possession, Java will sit in a dangerous sandwich. From Sumatra across the narrow Sunda Straits to the north, from Bali to the south, from Borneo and the Celebes to the east, the Japs will be able to throw dangerously powerful forces at the Allied defenders of Java. The attack on Java, already begun from the war, is the last step in what can be described as the second phase of Japan's Asian offensive, that is, the capture of the Netherlands' East Indies. In Java, I spoke with the commanders of the American and Dutch forces. They did not conceal that the battle for Java would be a grim fight against tremendous odds. I spoke in Java, too, with American soldiers, sailors, and airmen, with the fighting men of Britain and Holland. They echoed the words of their commanders. On the tongues of every man were the words, against tremendous odds. You must realize at home exactly what your sons and husbands are fighting against in this part of the world. You must know that every time an American pilot takes off to meet the Japs, he knows, before his machine leaves the ground, that if he's lucky, he'll be outnumbered by at least five to one. If he runs into the usual Jap attacking formation, the odds against him will be 15 to one. You must know that when land fighting starts in Java, the odds will be equally great. That in the seas throughout this entire area, the sailors of the American and Allied forces to bow, and from the first day of a war, have to face equally overwhelming odds. I don't know whether Java can be held. With 1,000 American fighter pilots and machines and another 500 battle pilots and machines were to arrive there today, the Allies would have a good chance of holding Java. Failing that, only the most brilliant Allied generalship or the most bungling kind of Japanese generalship could make Java's fate uncertain. The Allies have yet to produce a brilliant general. The Japs have yet to make a misstep in a bold, expertly conceived and executed campaign. Java today means two things to the Allies. First, it provides, with the exception of Burma, where the Allied forces are steadily being pushed back, the only land base from which air and offensive operations on a large scale can be undertaken against the Jap land, sea, and air forces in this part of the world. If the Allied forces are pushed back to Australia, we'll be forced almost completely onto the defensive. Second, it provides the only defensive base from which the Allies can threaten or hamper the Japanese concentration of all available forces in the southwestern Pacific for an attack on Australia itself. The fight for Java has begun. If Java falls, the fight for Australia, what must be recognized as the third phase of the Jap drive for empire in Asia, lies in the immediate future. There's no point in speculating as to whether Java will or will not hold. The next couple of weeks, perhaps even the next few days, will decide that. What is vital is that for once, the democratic nations do everything in their power while there's still a lot of time to create in Australia, at least, a force that will have a fighting chance of holding the Japs' victorious promenade toward the complete possession of the Far East. The Japs aren't supermen. They can be stopped if the lessons of morale and, in fact, of the entire Far Eastern campaign are not only recognized but put to use. In Malaya, the British were not only outnumbered, but outsmarted, not generaled. Even admitting the original underestimation of the Jap's strength put the British forces at a fatal disadvantage, it still remains true that from the first days of the campaign, the Japs <clears throat> gained nearly as much through the enemy's bombing as through their own well-executed attacks. Time and again in the course of the British retreat, lack of organization gave the Japs intact air force, petrol stores, and ammunition depot. The record can be found in the British communiques themselves. Time after time, the official communique announced the evacuation of airfields with a customary addendum. Our forces destroyed petrol stores and hangars and rendered the airplane unusable. And then, two days later, again an official communique upon the announcement that British planes had successfully bombed the supposedly unusable hangars, runways, and petrol stores of the, I quote, successfully evacuated aerodrome. When I left Singapore some two weeks ago, it was on board an Australian warship. On the docks at the naval base were piled thousands of pounds worth of war materials, unprotected, undispersed, a perfect target for the Jap bombers. Out in the Indian Ocean, our warship picked up a large convoy that for weeks had been on the high seas en route to Singapore from England. On board one ship of the convoy 
with a large number of RAF ground personnel, accompanied by a large number of fighter pilots, veterans of the Battle of Britain, in another ship where the crater planes the pilots were to fly. Mine and other warships took the convoy safely through the Bank of Straits off Sumatra, and into Singapore in the face of continual jet bombing attacks. Three days later in Java, I met one of the pilots. From him I learned that due to some stupid, and for some men on board, fatal blunder, the ship's destination had been mistaken. On the way out from England, the pilot told me, the men on board had voluntarily organized their unit so that they would be ready to go into action immediately they landed in Singapore. They had gotten in England a detailed map of Singapore Island. Realizing that the airdromes might be unusable, they had laid out on the map streets from which they could take off their fighters. The ground crews had been on board ship until they were letter perfect in the use of the bofers and Bren guns they carried. Every detail of assembly of the crated planes had been worked out beforehand. They believed they could have their planes in the air and be functioning as an operational unit within 24 hours of landing. When these men arrived in Singapore, they found no one at the docks who even knew they were expected. After much searching, <clears throat> they reached an RAF headquarters officer and asked that they be allowed to go into action immediately. Instead, they were informed that as they were apparently not expected in Singapore, they could not operate there, but would have to go to Java and receive instructions from the high command. All this time, their ship was being heavily bombed at the dock. They finally got back to Java. I cannot reveal the number of their casualties. The pilot officer ended his story with a laconic remark. I quote, it didn't improve our morale, unquote. This is only one example of an innumerable series of similar incidents. If on the British side of the Allied High Command such things are allowed to happen in times like these, we can't expect to stop the Japs. It's not too late to profit from such lessons. The men responsible can be changed. And on the American side, there's an equally funny story. A few minutes after my plane landed at a certain small town, an American naval plane came in. An American naval lieutenant and his gunner were in the plane. The pilot told me he had flown to shore from an American warship, which I cannot name. The warship was convoying American troop ships to somewhere in Java. When the convoy was six hours at sea, the warship picked up a Jap broadcast from Tokyo accurately describing both the makeup of the convoy and its destination. Two hours later, 32 Jap bombers appeared overhead and bombed the convoy. The Japs hit one of the gun turrets of the warship. A 20-year-old machinist mate went into the gun turret, which was stacked with six-inch shells and filled with flames from burning powder bags. The shells were red-hot and could have exploded at any moment. The young machinist mate played water on the red-hot shell cases till a fire was put out. Being an American, I was proud of this story of courage. I told the lieutenant so and asked him if he'd shot one of those Japs. I answered it was pretty hard to hit the Japs with the ammunition on board. I asked why. He explained that the anti-aircraft ammunition was 1930-1931 issue, and that when it had been tested a year ago, it was found to be only 30% effective. The lieutenant told me that it was impossible to arrange with this type of ammunition as the bursts were too ununiform to enable the gunners to work out a fire pattern. The lieutenant added that he would like to have been able to title the foremast of that warship, the gentleman responsible for United States warships being equipped with this type of ammunition. He made me promise to tell this story to you people at home. If we hope to stop the Japs, the United States will have to do better than that. The men fighting in the Far Eastern countries for their defense and ultimately for the defense of the United States deserve better of their country than they're getting. On an isolated airfield somewhere in the Far East, I found an American pilot in charge. He was a fighter pilot who had been grounded following a crash. One finger of his right hand was paralyzed. Because it got in his way, he was no longer permitted to fly. He told me he wouldn't be on the ground much longer as he'd arranged to have the finger amputated so he could take a new medical examination he was sure he could pass. And against this spirit, to be put the pronouncement for various American spokesmen that it would be best to keep the majority of American forces at home to defend America. Almost every American soldier with whom I've spoken in the Far Eastern Theater of War has begged me to try to fight this kind of short-sighted view. 
It's a sincere belief of every American observer in this part of the world that first Singapore, then Java, and last Australia are the outer defenses of California. They feel equally that if we needed all our power immediately, we would have a fighting chance to stop the Japs in Australia, even if Java fails. No matter what courage the Allies show, they can't stop the Japs with 10 and 15 to 1 odds against them. Just before I left Java, I interviewed a Dutch officer. On his way, he affirmed the quotation. It read, I quote, It can scarcely be repeated too often that when a country is thrown on the defensive as regards its shoreline, the effectual function of the fleet is to take the offensive. Unquote. If you don't recognize that quotation that the Dutchman had framed, I'll tell you who wrote it. Admiral Mahan, the United States Naval Strategist. This is Martin McGrosky returning you now to San Francisco. You've just heard a special broadcast from Sydney, Australia. The speaker was Martin Agronsky, noted NBC correspondent, who has just arrived in Australia to cover the war in that sector. This program reached you through our newsroom in San Francisco. have presented melodic strings, the music of Carl Kalash and his string ensemble. The program came to you from San Francisco. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Anti-aircraft guns went into action against unidentified aircraft in the Los Angeles area shortly after 3 a.m. Pacific wartime this morning. The anti-aircraft guns began barking during a blackout ordered by the 4th Interceptor Command at 2.25 a.m. The unidentified object, which some sources thought might be a blimp, moved slowly down the Pacific coast from Santa Monica and disappeared south of Long Beach. Army officials declined to comment on the possibility that the object might have been a blimp. However, it required nearly 30 minutes to travel some 25 miles, far slower than an airplane. Watchers on the rooftop of the Columbia Broadcasting Building in the heart of Hollywood could plainly see the flashes of guns and searchlights sweeping the skies in a wide arc along the coastal area. Concussion of the shells could be felt in downtown Los Angeles, 15 miles away. Good morning, everyone. It's Sunday, March 1st, and the start of the 13th week of war for the United States. To report on the war, we're going to call in our reporters from abroad. So first, go ahead, London. This is London. John McBain speaking. About an hour ago, the Dutch government in London issued an official statement by the Dutch headquarters at Batavia. The statement announced that the Japanese have landed at three points in Java. Allied naval forces opposed one of the landing fleets, and Allied air forces attacked both the other landing fleets throughout the night. Dutch and American submarines came into action against the enemy naval forces and transports. Dutch army units are said to be offering fierce resistance at the three points where the enemy landed. The oil field and refineries near Japo were demolished last night to prevent them falling into the hands of the Japanese. Dispatches from Java reaching London estimate unofficially the number of Japanese actually landed 
is somewhere between a few thousand and four divisions. This report says a heavy, heavy Japanese cruiser was sunk, two cruisers seriously damaged, while three destroyers were left burning. The Allies lost three cruisers and one destroyer, all Dutch, which were sunk. The British parachute raid on the coast of German-occupied France has acted as a tonic to the British. It's being emphasized, of course, that the raid wasn't any tremendous operation. But it's pleased everyone to think that the services can organize and carry out successfully a raid against the German forces that are in the position that most threatens Britain itself. The Sunday Express says even if it isn't possible to answer Litvinov's appeal for a second front, Britain can surely use her commando force as it was meant to be used. The Sunday Express goes on, We can raid constantly at widely separated points of a long coastline. We can keep the Germans on the jump. We can give them both the jitters and the works. And the Express adds, we can thus draw off large German forces which would otherwise be at Russia's throat, follow Russia's grand example in total warfare, and give ourselves new heart. Let us have done with disheartened defense. Let us plunge wherever the smallest chance is offered to the attack. Another commentator in Reynolds News says Britain's need is for fearless, straightforward criticism in Parliament and Whitehall, the hard, realistic thinking that will produce a counter-strategy as daring and successful as Hitler's. The paper calls the parachutist's raid a pointer to effective action and says, as one of a series of simultaneous blows, the combined operations raid can pay rich dividends. A British eyewitness of part of the operation says the parachutist's faces were blackened even to the teeth. The parachutists themselves were Scotchmen, and the men who protected the landing craft in the operation were London Cockneys and men from an English county regiment. One of the parachute leaders was a 21-year-old ex-newspaper man. The commander of the men who landed by boat was a former copy reader on the London paper. Factory workers, shipyard workers, professional football players, artists, and stockbrokers took part in the raid. One of the parachutists said the Germans had a whole armored division 50 miles away, and just before they left, the parachutists had seen a column of headlights coming toward the beach. A couple of days ago, the British Labour Party issued a pamphlet that cost the equivalent of a nickel. It's called The Old World and the New Society. And it sums up British Labour's ideas on what kind of a world should come out of the war and what should be done now to achieve it. The report has been unanimously adopted by the Executive Council of the party. It's been issued at a time when the British working people are groping for concrete ideas, for some assurance that their lives will be fuller and more promising after this war than during the pre-war days. The workers of many factories have from time to time met and sent delegates to the Labor Ministry or some other government ministry or to Labor Party headquarters. They've complained not about wages and hours, but about inefficiency. They've said their effort wasn't being used at 100% efficiency because of management's failure to organize work on the most modern line. The workers have said, too, that they want to feel that the effort they're making now will be used for the good of the many, not the profits of the few. The Labor Report asserts that the basis of democracy must be planned production for community use. It says that to secure the fulfillment of the four freedoms, Britain must organize to provide things like full employment, better social services, and maintain wartime controls over industry and agriculture to avoid the same sort of scramble for profits as that which followed the last war. The significance of the report is that it's the first publicized attempt to chart the course of the post-war world the first attempt to give a concrete response to the worries of the ordinary English working man and the English Tommy when he wonders what kind of a life he'll have to look forward to when the war is ended. This is John McVeigh in London, returning you to New York. And from the New York newsroom, here's a brief news story. Cairo, Egypt. A small enemy column was successfully engaged by British artillery in the desert north or rather of North Africa, east of El Makili, according to the British. There was considerable patrol activity in which the Air Force gave support, according to the communique. Next now, news from our allies in the Pacific, brought to us through the newsroom in San Francisco. We are unable to contact Sydney, Australia this morning. However, from our San Francisco newsrooms, we bring you the headlines of the Pacific fighting. Sixteen Japanese bombers and fighters attacked Port Moresby yesterday and caused some damage, the high command reported today. RAAF planes attempted to attack a Jap convoy off Kopeng, but were intercepted by enemy fighters, the communique said. However, all planes returned safely to their bases. 
Planes of the RAAF bombed the runway of the airfield as Gasmata, New Britain, last night, the high command added. Now here are further details from the fighting in Batavia. The long-expected battle for Java raged bitterly today along the northern and western shores of that island stronghold, heart of the Netherlands' East Indies, after an historic sea battle in which Dutch warships sacrificed themselves in a vain attempt to keep the invaders from their precious land. The Dutch reported that at least ten Japanese warships and transports had been sunk or damaged in sea and air action since Friday, but acknowledged the loss of two cruisers and a destroyer. Reuters news agency even upped those figures. Fifteen Japanese transports have been sunk or set on fire, while six others have been seriously damaged in the last 24 hours in the battle for Java. The news agency reported the Japanese succeeded in getting something like 50 transports to Java. It was not known how many Japanese troops landed, but unofficial estimates varied between a few thousand and four divisions of between 60 and 100,000 men. The Dutch were said in previous reports to have 100,000 soldiers under arms in Java, plus the British, Australian, and United States soldiers who have reached the island since the Japanese threat grew acute. The fighting was in thunderous progress on land, at sea, and in the air, with the Dutch, United States, and British troops putting up an all-out defense of the Allied resistance in the southwest Pacific. The Netherlands East Indies High Command officially reported heavy losses were inflicted in the sea battle and on the landing parties, but the same report acknowledged Japanese landings at three key points. Allied warplanes, it was reported, had exacted the following toll of the invasion fleet up to late afternoon. One transport sunk, one warship blown up, one ship set on fire, and one ship damaged by a bomb hit. The terrific price the Allied fleet paid and levied in the gallant attempt to keep the Japanese transport from landing their troops on the Java beaches was told in a long NEI communique summing up that listed the following results. Japanese losses, one heavy cruiser sunk, one 8-inch gun cruiser badly damaged, one Mogami-class cruiser on fire or sinking, three destroyers left burning or sinking, and the Dutch losses as follows. Two cruisers sunk, apparently torpedoed in night fighting, one destroyer blown up, one cruiser damaged, and the communique said United States and Dutch submarines had gone into action against the Japanese invasion fleet, but that results of their attacks had not been ascertained at this time. Following the summation in a special communique, the regular Dutch communique outlined the invasion situation and said that a Dutch destroyer engaged in an uneven battle with two Japanese cruisers fought to an end when it was beached in a sinking condition. The destroyer had taken part in the defense by Dutch and United States naval forces against the main landing of the Japanese, while two other invasion fleets were attacked throughout the night by the air forces. Netherlands bombing attacks are still continuing, the communique said adding that Dutch and United States submarines also came into action against enemy naval forces and transports which are now attacking Java. Reports about the results have not yet been received. The action is being continued, said the regular communique. As for the battle in Burma, the last reports from London said that the Japanese are gathering strength in Burma for an onslaught against British troops west of the Sitang River, and the situation at this time is very serious. Now, news of the events from home, reported by the newsroom in Washington. The court-martial, which has been ordered for Rear Admiral Husband E. Kimmel and Major General Walter C. Short, is still the main topic of discussion in Washington. However, Capitol observers generally do not believe that the two officers who were in command at Pearl Harbor when the Japanese delivered their stab in the back will be brought to trial until after the war. Kimmel and Short, as you know are charged with dereliction of duty, the same charge which was leveled against them by the Pearl Harbor Investigating Commission under Supreme Court Justice Roberts. However, in ordering the officers held for court-martial proceedings yesterday, Secretaries Knox and Stimson both said that the trials would not be held until such time as the public interest and safety would permit. This is taken in Washington to mean after the conclusion of the war. In the meantime, both men will be retired on salaries of $6,000 a year each, pending the court's martial. This is three-quarters of their base pay while on the active list. Should the military courts which try them so decide, they may reduce both of the officers in rank and thereby cut their retirement pay accordingly. Should the trials be delayed until the war's end, 
the move will not be without precedent. In several cases of lesser nature during World War I, court-martial proceedings were delayed until after the conflict ended. On Capitol Hill, meanwhile, farm block senators have decided to change their strategy in the campaign to prevent the government from selling surplus stocks below parity. A special seven-man committee, headed by Alabama Senator John Bankhead, will call on the president tomorrow afternoon in an effort to heal the breach between the White House and the agricultural group. The chief executive has persistently opposed higher farm prices, and tomorrow's meeting is likely to be anything but calm. The seven-man committee, a special appointed group of the Senate Agriculture Committee, was named yesterday after some members of the farm bloc had urged that an effort be made to avoid a continuing fight with the White House. These members contend that such a battle will only promote disunity. At the same time, it's being predicted on Capitol Hill that Senator Thomas, Democrat of Oklahoma, will abandon his attempt to attach a parity price rider to the $32 billion war appropriation bill. Mr. Roosevelt has already denounced such omnibus legislation in vigorous terms. Elsewhere in Washington, William L. Batt, director of materials for the War Production Board, gives Lend-Lease the credit for keeping airplane engine and propeller production from lagging two years behind. Mr. Batt says that the $13 billion which has been appropriated under the Lend-Lease Act so far has expanded our capacity for making planes and tanks, munitions and ships. And he adds, these funds have also served to create new industries which are now making vital supplies both for our own forces and those of our allies. And the War Department has suggested a way in which the town fathers throughout the nation can make a real contribution to the war effort. The Department has made the suggestion that all the German cannon which were captured during the First World War and now grace most of the courthouse lawns in the nation should be turned over to junk dealers for scrap. The general idea seems to be to throw back at the Axis a bit of its own scrap. Sort of a retaliation for the American scrap, which was formerly sold to the Axis and is now being thrown back at us. Further, the War Department points out that the sale of the cannon to the junk dealers would mean more money to purchase defense bonds and stamps. And that's all from the nation's capital. And there, ladies and gentlemen, you have the news from at home and abroad. This morning you heard reports from the news from London by John McBean. And may we leave you now with this reminder that for the latest news, please keep tuned to this station. This is the National Broadcasting Company. News what it is news. Your friendly mobile gas and mobile oil dealer brings you latest news and a suggestion to help make your car last longer. The mobile gas news service is on the air. Big nine-inch guns have been pounding the Japanese tom-tom beat of hate on Corregidor tonight, and the Army communique leaves little doubt that the enemy is making a final effort to subdue that gallant fortress of democracy. These guns are mounted on the heights of Bataan, overlooking the Rocky Isle, and the Army admits that in a dawn-to-dusk bombardment, some casualties and damage resulted. Tokyo reports in a propaganda radiogram dated Tuesday, which it now is in Tokyo, that Jap troops have completed mopping up the defenders of the island of Sumatra. Five flights of Japanese bombers, according to Shung King, have raided air drones in China's Kiangsai province, evidently hunting for the American planes that bombed Tokyo on Saturday. However, the news from the Orient is not all negative. Chinese armies have plodded doggedly over the scorched earth of the devastated oil fields in Burma to an important victory. Shung King says they have retaken the key town of Yinanyang and freed several thousand British troops trapped there. Another Chinese column is counterattacking the Japs fiercely on the Satang front. On Burma sectors, a slow retreat by the United Nations is being maintained. From Australia comes reassuring news. General MacArthur and Australian Prime Minister Curtin have agreed a large striking power must be concentrated for offensive action. This is interpreted as meaning just one thing, an allied drive to take the initiative from Japan. Tokyo, by the way, seems jittery and confused over the first direct blow struck by allied air power at her homeland. From a mass of Nipponese rumors, little that is clear can be gained. But diplomatic reports to Chile 
established that there was a sizable raid. Ample excuse for the Japs to be hopping around like the proverbial hen on the hot griddle. Japan charges that the invading planes flew off toward China. Washington has nothing to say. The answer for the time being is, could be. The Jap radio, in one spurt of bland reassurance, declared the damage done was negligible and a little later told of a cabinet meeting to discuss damage and remedial measures. The propaganda spider tangled in its own web, so to speak, and well tangled, too. Japan has ordered a sensational shake-up in the important Military Affairs Bureau, sending Major General Sato to an unrevealed post at the front. His immediate subordinate steps into his shoes. The Tokyo press calls the move one toward reconstructing the military administration. But the post has nothing to do with strategy or military operations. Major General Sato is perhaps going to the front for a military lesson. The war in Europe and Africa centers about future possibilities. Although by way of timely interest, Hitler's 53rd birthday was duly observed insofar as the British RAF could beat a bad weather handicap. They managed a neat bombardment in the Cherbourg area. Centering the picture of future developments, is the French fleet built to fight Germans, but perhaps doomed to be taken over by them. Pierre Laval, newly installed head at Vichy, has announced he intends active collaboration with Germany. And Admiral Darlau, defense chief, will issue his first order of the day tomorrow. The atmosphere in France is one of suspense tonight. Thirty French hostages were executed at Rouen in reprisal for the recent bombing of a German troop train. A fascist party leader narrowly escaped being bombed to death in Paris last night. How French Navy men would regard serving under German command is still problematical. Meantime, Hitler spent his birthday on the Russian front in the midst of bad news. He received no presents by his own request. Marshal Timoshenko, Red Leader, is getting together a big army of recruits, freshly equipped with American planes to halt the belated Nazi drive. Russian figures on recent battles offer Hitler the following to ponder. Six German vessels sunk in northern waters recently. 1,500 Germans killed on the Central Front in two days. 31 German planes shot down Sunday with only 13 Soviet planes lost. 1,500 German planes all told destroyed during March and the first two weeks of April. Two qualities in sports make champions. Applied power and teamwork. Between fielders on double plays, between runner and interference for touchdowns, between pivot man and forward for baskets. True in sports and true in your car's engine, too. For it's the perfect teamwork between mobile gas and mobile oil that has made them America's favorite gasoline and motor oil team. It's the great teamwork of these two products that gives you flying horsepower. To begin with, they're both fast. Mobile gas starts fast and gives you fast acceleration when you want it. Mobile oil flows fast, is designed to slide in between engine parts before wear can get started. And both of them have plenty of staying power, too. Mobile gas is packed with power for long, thrifty mileage. Mobile oil stands up under terrific punishment and keeps on lubricating, fighting friction and wear. That's why, for flying horsepower... It's best to get both mobile gas and mobile oil at your next sign of the flying red horse. News from the nation's capital. Uncle Sam's coattails were whipping in the breeze today as he went after American industry again to keep it in line with the aims of victory. Three plants of the Brewster Aeronautical Corporation on Long Island were taken over by the Navy because, according to the government, they weren't turning out enough dive bombers and fighter planes and the administration was dissatisfied with their management. The Navy will relinquish control to private management again when Uncle Sam is satisfied the job is going to be done as the times demand. Two of the nation's biggest steelmakers came under the eagle eye of the Justice Department at the same time. Suits were filed against the Jones and Laughlin and the Carnegie, Illinois Steel Corporation on charges they were delivering low-rated orders or orders with no rating at all, quote, to the delay of orders with high preference ratings. The companies deny the charges. Proper use of the nation's manpower is another sizable item in the war program on which Chairman McNutt of the new War Manpower Commission outlined his policy today. 
He will try to get manpower spread around properly as needed under a volunteer system. But he hinted he will ask for drastic measures to line up the labor supply if the voluntary measures should fail. The commissioner lashed out at labor pirates who were robbing various plants of skilled workers without regard to the essential nature of the work they now have. He cited the example of an aircraft manufacturer hiring away workers from a firm making wings for his own planes, thus tripping over his own shoelaces. Looking toward the wage, tax, and profit situation, President Roosevelt will present his views in a special message to Congress within a week, then to the nation in a fireside chat. Meantime, no congressional action on pending labor regulation will be taken. It is probable that both messages will indicate the administration's plans for halting inflation, which Mr. Roosevelt has been pondering for some weeks. A freezing of all commodity prices, virtual elimination of installment buying, and the voluntary bond purchase plan are expected to emerge as concrete parts of the plans. Some control over wages and profits is also anticipated. It is said the president on the advice of Congress, will not seek new taxes beyond the pending seven and one-half billion dollar revenue bill. There is no official revelation yet as to what information Army Chief of Staff General Marshall and Lend-Lease Coordinator Harry Hopkins brought back from overseas. They conferred with the President for more than two hours today. A beginning has been made towards financial security for servicemen with dependents. A bill introduced by Senator Johnson of Colorado and claiming the approval of the War Department would give a soldier's, Marine's, or sailor's wife $20 monthly with $10 for each child. Smaller benefits would be allowed for parents and other dependent relatives. To help meet the cost, deductions would be made from the pay of the four highest grades of enlisted men, but none would be taken from Army privates, first-class privates and corporals, or similar grades in other services. From the Navy comes word that its great flying ace, Lieutenant Edward H. O'Hare, may get the Congressional Medal of Honor tomorrow from the President. This for his heroism in shooting down six Jap planes in a single dogfight. O'Hare and his buddies knocked down 17 of 18 enemy planes. Blame has been placed by a naval inquiry on the Robbins Dry Dock and Repair Company of New York for gross carelessness and a lack of common sense as responsible for the burning of the French liner Normandy. Suit against the firm was recommended. Also, Father Coughlin's magazine, Social Justice Remains Unmailable. The Postmaster General barred it tonight for utterances branded as seditious. Coughlin's parents, to whom he transferred nominal ownership in 1940, have been subpoenaed to appear before a special grand jury investigating Axis propaganda. And now... News of the nation at large, mostly from Chicago. The Republican National Committee, in session at the Hotel LaSalle in Chicago, has placed the Grand Old Party on record as favoring world cooperation after the war. Supporters of Wendell L. Wilkie, 1940 presidential candidate and titular party leader, consider the policy committee's decision as a victory for Wilkie's anti-isolationist beliefs. He telephoned a statement from New York to the meeting in which he declared that by adopting the Stand for World Cooperation, the committee had adopted principles necessary to survival of the Republican Party and of the nation itself. Senators Taft of Ohio and Brooks of Illinois, both pre-war isolationists, had attempted to get a resolution through endorsing the war effort, but non-committal as to post-war policy. GOP publicity chief Clarence Buddington Kelland, nationally known author, called the final resolution a compromise but Wilkie's followers claim he has strengthened his leadership and gained more than he asked for in the change of policy. The resolution also pledges preservation of the two-party form of government and threatens to oppose administration attempts to inaugurate what it calls unbound economic reforms at home. The Republicans demand that when the upper hand has been gained over our military enemies, the nation shall flatly refuse any peace proposal short of complete victory. Appeasement or compromise are completely ruled out in the policy committee statement. Lack of organization has been a weakness of the democratic war regime, according to the Republican committee, which recommended that the burden of the war be distributed equally to all classes and that excess profits from the war be eliminated. 
the committee will adjourn tomorrow. Again, Chicago. Ground has been broken here for another huge war production plant, one of the biggest ever to be built in this area. It will be operated by the Aluminum Company of America for the Defense Plant Corporation and will employ between six and 7,000 workers when construction begins. Mount Carroll, Illinois. First-degree murder charges are to be brought against 12-year-old Billy Geisman, who has admitted that he killed Mr. and Mrs. Clarence Krugjohan because they reproved him and spanked him seven months ago. Next time you're walking down the street and you see a soldier in uniform, try to imagine what you'd answer if he should stop you and say, I've given up my job, my family, my luxuries for the rest of the war. Are you doing everything you can to help me? Are you giving up luxuries to buy United States war bonds and stamps that'll give me what I need to fight? Remember, that soldier knows that even fighting is not enough. He's buying war bonds, too. Old Dobbin, back in the horse and buggy days, never got more loving care than most of us are giving our cars these days. There's a lot of satisfaction in stopping at the sign of the flying red horse and getting your car groomed for the long pull ahead. Dirty or faulty spark plugs, for instance, can waste more than one out of every ten gallons of gasoline. Spark plugs should be cleaned and recapped at least once every 5,000 miles. Better drive in this week and ask your friendly mobile gas or mobile oil dealer to inspect, clean, and regap your spark plugs or replace worn-out plugs. Properly adjusted spark plugs will make your car operate more smoothly, restore lagging power, and they'll actually help you save gasoline. Well, saving gasoline means saving money. So drive in today or tomorrow at the sign of the flying red horse. Tune in again at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning when your mobile gas and mobile oil dealers will bring you the latest news. Remember, as you drive your car or heat your home, oil is ammunition. Use it wisely. And for America's favorite team, mobile gas and mobile oil for your car, mobile heat for your home, stop at your mobile gas and mobile oil dealer's sign of the flying red horse, your sign of friendly service. The next news broadcast over this station will be presented in just 15 minutes. This is the WBBM Air Theater, Wrigley Building, Chicago. General Douglas MacArthur was ordered to Australia while Major General Jonathan Wainwright was given the task of delaying defeat for as long as possible. General Wainwright held Bataan until April 8, 1940, when he surrendered to an overwhelming force of 200,000 Japanese troops. But the island fortress of Corregidor held out until May 6th. Then, Army listening posts in Hawaii heard these last drama-packed radio code broadcasts. They're not near yet. We are waiting for God only knows what. How about a chocolate soda? Not many. Not near yet. Lots of heavy fighting going on. We've only got about one hour, 20 minutes before... We may have to give up by noon. We don't know yet. They are throwing men and shells at us, and we may not be able to stand it. They have been shelling us faster than you can count. We've got about 55 minutes, and I feel sick at my stomach. I am really low down. They are around now, smashing rifles. They bring in the wounded every minute. It is a horrible sight. We will be waiting for you guys to help. This is the only thing, I guess, that can be done. General Wainwright is a right guy, and we are willing to go on for him but shells were dropping all night, faster than hell. Damage terrific, too much for guys to take. 
enemy heavy cross-shelling and bombing. They have got us all around and from skies. From here, it looks like firing ceased on both sides. Men here all feeling bad because of terrific nervous strain of the siege. Corregidor used to be a nice place. It's haunted now. Withstood a terrific pounding. Just made broadcast to Manila to arrange meeting for surrender. Talk made by General Beebe. I can't say much. Can't think at all. I can hardly think. Say, I have 60 pesos you can have for this weekend. The white flag is up. Everyone is bawling like a baby. They're piling dead, wounded soldiers in our tunnel. I'm vomiting. Arms weak from pounding key, long hours. No rest. Short rations. Tired. I know now how a mouse feels. Caught in a trap waiting for guys to come along, finish it up. Got a treat, canned pineapple, opening it with signal corps knife. My name, Irving Strobing. Get this to my mother, Mrs. Minnie Strobing, 605 Barbie Street, Brooklyn, New York. They are to get along okay. Get in touch with them soon as possible. Message. My love to Pa, Joe, Sue, Matt, Carrie, Joy, and Paul. Also to all family and friends. God bless them all. Hope they be there when I come home. Tell Joe, wherever he is, give him hell for us. My love, you all. God bless you and keep you. Love. Sign my name and tell my mother how you heard from me. Stand by. The radio operator who sent those dots and those dashes and that fateful message was Corporal Irving Strobing. Now, miraculously, he survived the battle and many years as a Japanese prisoner of war. Very fortunately, he's with us now, and he is to tell us exclusively what happened after that last dot and that last dash were transmitted from Corregidor. Mr. Strobing, tell us exactly what did happen. Well, Mr. Knight, the transmission was terminated when I was told that a Japanese tank was approaching the mouth of the tunnel. I thought it would be better for me to get further back in. We remained in the tunnel until the Japanese entered and took charge... We were then lined up in Malenta Tunnel itself and in a kneeling position were tapped on the shoulder by a Japanese officer using a saber and thus formally became prisoners of the emperor. You mean even under such circumstances they went to that degree of protocol? It was unexpected, but it did happen. Now, did you ever realize, Mr. Strobing, that your radio message from Corregidor was broadcast all across the country? No, Mr. Knight, uh, I really didn't. I knew that certain portions of it had definitely been received, but had no idea of just what dissemination was being made. What were the conditions, and how did you manage to survive such an ordeal? 
Well, Mr. Knight, the term of imprisonment lasted 1,216 days. The first portion being spent in the Philippines in a camp at Cabana Tawan until November of 1942 when I was removed to Japan itself. A 27-day voyage in the bottom hold of a Japanese freighter. Upon our arrival in Japan on the 27th of November in 42, I was put to work on a construction project excavating by hand what was to be a dry dock and later pouring the concrete. After about a year and a half, I was transferred to another camp where we made little rocks out of big ones and also stoked the furnaces in a Japanese steel mill, and that lasted until September 5th, 1945, when we were liberated and returned to the United States. Mr. Strothing, if I remember correctly, while you were still on Corregidor, you tried very hard to get a message through to your mother. Tell us about that, will you? Well, the final transmission from Corregidor was a message to my mother and the other members of my family. It was received in Honolulu and relayed to Washington, and the Army was good enough to have a colonel deliver it at home. Mr. Strobing, you're a very lucky man, and we're ever so grateful to you for being with us today. This is Lieutenant General Wainwright. Subject, surrender. It became apparent that the garrison on that forces would be eventually destroyed by aerial and artillery bombardment and by infantry supported by tanks which have overwhelmed the regidor. After leaving General Homer, with no agreement between us, I decided to accept in the name of humanity, his proposal. You will therefore be guided accordingly. And will, I think will, surrender all troops under your command to the proper Japanese officer. This decision on my part, you will realize, will force upon me by means entirely beyond my control. CBS World News brings you the news of the world on Monday, June 1st. Once again, Columbia's correspondents are standing by in world capitals to bring you the latest report direct by shortwave radio. This morning, we shall call in Australia and London and will attempt to bring you a report from Moscow. But first, here are the highlights of this morning's news. In London, American Army Chief General Arnold said our bomber and fighter planes will soon attack Germany. Fighting on the Kharkov front has dwindled. Heavy action is reported around Kalinin, about 100 miles northwest of Moscow. The British announced the capture of German General Kruvel. He's second in command of the Axis forces in Libya. And now to bring you more news and to call in Columbia's correspondents abroad, here is Harry Marble. Before calling in Australia this morning, here are the latest reports on the underground fight against the Nazis in occupied Europe. 82 is now the number of Czech patriots who have fallen before the guns of Nazi firing squads in retaliation for the critical wounding of the number two Gestapo chief, Reinhard Heydrich. Twenty more persons were executed in Prague yesterday. Heydrich, meanwhile, is reported to be near death. Several blood transfusions have failed to alter his critical condition. And even if he does live, Czech quarters in London say that he will be paralyzed totally for life. One of the bullets severed his spinal cord. Our first report direct this morning comes from the Southwest Pacific. After a brief pause, we take you to Australia. CBS Australia. William J. Dunn reporting. The war came to the very doorsteps of Australia's largest city last night, exactly one week, less than six months, after the first Japanese blows fell in the Pacific. From the standpoint of damage done, the results of the first Japanese attack on Sydney had become negligible. But the fact that three enemy submarines actually did penetrate their famous harbor and damaged one small boat has had a marked effect on the people of Sydney. And the fact that all three of the most underwater raiders are believed to have been sunk 
proves that the enemy did not find the port unprepared. The attack came last night and was marked by a series of unheralded detonations, punctuated by machine gun rattling and the sharp bark of small guns. The force of the explosions caused the depth charges, took houses on the nearby shores, and excited considerable comment. But few guessed what actually had taken place in the brief space of a few moments. Several hours after the last explosion had died away, we were able to get a fairly complete story of the attack. But the public announcement didn't come until 2 o'clock this afternoon, and it literally stunned the Sydney public. Even the press seemed unprepared for the story when it first broke. The early edition of one paper consigned the official communique to a one-column space on page one, while another featured the fact that three enemy subs were believed destroyed and gave the news that Sydney itself had been attacked secondary position. In the following edition, however, the papers hit their stride and took it to New York style. Last type came into play and pictures of midget type shot some were used generously. Of the people themselves, probably the greatest reaction was stunned incredulity. Even those who heard the terrific confessions in the harbor had decided they were, that it was merely gun practice and found it hard to realize that the enemy had actually been within firing distance of their city. As the community stated, the attack was entirely unsuccessful. Military objectives, which undoubtedly had been selected as targets for the raid, were not put, and only one small harbor boat was damaged. It is assumed that the midget craft were similar to those used in the Pearl Harbor attack, just large enough for two men, a commander and a mechanic. Inasmuch as the submarine captured in Hawaii had a range of only 150, 200 miles, it's believed the craft which visited Sydney were operating from another ship somewhere off the east central Australian coast. There are no bases within range of the type of craft which aided the Pearl Harbor attack from which these boats could possibly have operated. Most Australians with whom I have talked today believe the Sydney attack will have, to some degree, the same effect on this country that the Pearl Harbor attack had on the United States. And it will awaken the people to the very real danger in front of this country and convince even the scientists of the cash cotton here group that in a war of this magnitude and ferocity, nothing is impossible and that relaxation, mental or physical, can be fatal. This is William J. Down in Australia, returning to CBS in New York. Next, across the Atlantic to the British capital, we take you now to London. CBS London, Charles Collingwood reporting. London is still jubilant this morning over Saturday night's mass air raid on Cologne. We still don't know the extent of the damage which was caused in Cologne, but the information that comes trickling in suggests that the thousand British bombers brought off the most destructive single raid in history. Last night, the RAF did not raid Germany. Another big raid was planned to follow the Cologne attack, but at the last moment it was called off. The RAF is now committed to a policy of large-scale attack, and last night's weather was not suitable for a mass operation. The Germans, however, carried out a vicious reprisal raid on Canterbury, the first cathedral town of Britain. The Germans didn't use a big force of bombers in this attack, but then Canterbury is not a very big town. Three waves of raiders attacked the cathedral town early this morning. Apparently, considerable damage was done, much of it by fire. The British say that two churches were destroyed, but there's no news of the cathedral itself. The British are assuming that the main German objective was Canterbury Cathedral. It would be, they say. But under the old plea of not giving information to the enemy, they're not saying whether the cathedral was damaged. Three of the German bombers that came over Britain last night were shot down. There have been a good many hints in London that American flyers and planes participated in the Cologne raid. There's no official confirmation of this, but General Arnold, commanding the United States Army Air Forces, did say in London this morning that United States planes and personnel would be operating with the British in the near future. General Arnold also sent a message to the British Bomber Command congratulating them on the Cologne raid. The British bomber chief, Air Marshal Harris, replied saying, We look forward to the time, now so near, when the United States Army Air Forces will commence operations at our side in this theater of war. In Libya, the Battle of Knightsbridge has ended, and it looks as though it's ended in a British victory. 
the Axis tank forces are withdrawing from the Knightsbridge area to the west. Yesterday, it was announced that the Germans had swept two channels through the British minefields for the purposes, purpose of bringing supplies up to the battlefront. Today, they are using those channels to extricate their armored forces. What seems to have happened is that the British have pinned or had pinned the Axis forces in the Knightsbridge area and were hammering them from all sides. The British had also succeeded in stopping the flow of Axis supplies. General Rommel's forces were in a precarious position. They had to get out or be overwhelmed. So they took the desperate chance of going through the two narrow gaps in the British minefields which extend down the desert from Gazala south to Bir Hakim. The Germans have set up anti-tank guns at these gaps to keep off British tanks, but the passages are under continuous artillery fire and air attack. Rommel must be losing heavily in his attempts to get through, but part of his forces have passed through the gaps to the west. But today's British communique says that a large proportion of the remaining enemy tanks and transport is still to the east. It's being attacked by British troops and air forces. Today's communique also reports the capture of General Rommel's second-in-command, General Ludwig Kruvel. General Kruvel commands the German Africa Corps under the supreme command of General Rommel. His reconnaissance plane was shot down behind the British lines. This is Charles Collingwood in London, returning you to Columbia in New York. For a report direct from the Soviet capital, we take you now to Moscow. Very good report. The German capital factory south of Kharkov appears to have been stopped. This morning, Soviet communiqués state that there are no essential changes on any front. Both Hitler's desire to extend the other side of his Crimean center through Russia to the Caucasus has been met. Although the operation may have been costly for Marshal Tomasenko's forces, it seems clear that after advancing so many miles into the heart of Russia, Hitler's forces are going to destruction, like Napoleon's Grand Army. Russia's great preponderance in manpower over Germany makes this mathematically clear. Chess is in the game of checkers. If you have one less checker than your opponent, and you exchange pieces, you are certain to lose that. Therefore, Hitler must avoid exchanging checkers or armies. Because of the number of German armies are exchanged for Soviet armies, Russia's military strength eventually will be many times stronger than the German field forces. The most painting we have used in Moscow today was a titanic British air raid on Cologne. This history making raid was announced for the first time this morning. It was the news on a Soviet internal radio system, which has loudspeakers on street corners and outlets in many houses. The newspaper Pauza, the only one published in Moscow on Monday, gave Monday's description of the raid under two tiny heads on the back page where the foreign news is always printed. And for the first time that I recall, a little map also was printed showing Britain's geographical relation to Germany. An army of war workers have entered the war factories of Russia. Many war factories have been built and existing ones extended. Skilled workers have been called up to join the Red Army. The result is a drive to turn inexperienced housewives entering factories for the first time. Study Russia today is not only an arms camp, but a vast training school. In 10 months of war, 700,000 school children from 14 years up have been trained in safe schools and factories to make the arms necessary to drive the drones out this year. And not only have these training men to become experienced factory hands, but the task is even far from small factories. They make weapons while the boys and girls learn the trade. Here are some items from the Soviet home tank. The men who worked with the Germans during the month when the home tank was in German hands have been tried by the war tribunal. Eight were sentenced to be shot. It's a commentary on the Germans. But whenever they are driven from the city, they never take these betrayers with them. Stamp collectors may be interested in a new series of stamps issued in the Soviet Union. These are dedicated to the Patriotic War. The Red Army series shows artillery, infantry, and a charge of cavalrymen. Another series is devoted to war heroes. Eighty million of these stamps will be printed. This is Larry to say, returning now to Columbia in New York. And that was Moscow. Fighting on the China front today is centered in Anhui province, 200 miles east of Shanghai, where the Chinese are developing a counteroffensive aimed at major Japanese bases in central China. The drive opened last week 
while an enemy force of 100,000 men forced the evacuation of the capital of Chekyang province on China's east coast. Fighting in Anhui is now raging chiefly in the outer defenses of Anqing and Hofei, the two major cities of the province. The Japs are said to be suffering heavy casualties in these battles. The Chinese offensive included the destruction of Japanese-held railroads and highways in the region of Anqing. And to the south of the city, other Chinese units are said to be attacking Japanese supply centers and communication lines. In a dispatch from North China, the Chinese Central News Agency reports that 9,000 Japs have been killed or wounded in a violent 11-day battle with Chinese guerrillas. The battle area covered portions of Hopei, Honan, and Shantung provinces. In Mexico City today, the stage is set for President Avila Camacho to sign formally the measure proclaiming the existence of a state of war between his nation and the Axis powers. The declaration itself will be little more than a formality, for Mexico has unofficially been at war since May 22nd, when the cabinet voted to summon a special session of Congress to hear the president's war message. Today is the 25th anniversary of Mexico's Navy, and special ceremonies are being arranged to link the observance with the war declaration. Meanwhile, Mexican military police have a new problem on their hands as the result of a series of unexplained explosions which occurred yesterday aboard an American tanker at Tampico, killing four men and wounding at least 20. Once again, Columbia has brought you the latest news direct by shortwave radio. This morning, you've heard from William J. Dunn in Australia, Charles Collingwood in London, and Larry Lasseur in Moscow. Harry Marble reporting for CBS World News. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. It was only a few short hours ago that we docked our battered ship at the Philadelphia Navy Yard and were honored by a visit from Admiral King. I'm still trying to get myself adjusted to the unaccustomed feeling of peace and security which comes after such a battle. We licked the Japs in a major slugging match between surface ships, and though it would be almost impossible for me to give a complete description of the battle, these are a few of the impressions which I'll never forget. I remember the Tensons preceding action, waiting for the range to close, the captain in huddle with other officers... And then saying, ready, Bill, ready, John, let her go. I remember the sheets of flame which came up and almost blinded us from our guns. Filled the sky before our eyes. And then the shells as they started on their way. Fireworks more spectacular than any 4th of July. Pinpoints of red winging their way toward the target in a cluster. Then to burst on the target in geysers of flame and smoke. The first target left a distinct impression. As the salvo hit the cruiser, she seemed to disintegrate on the spot in a sheet of flame and go down by the bow with her screws still turning. There was only a pall of smoke where she had been before. The other targets went almost the same. In those crowded minutes, we shifted fire rapidly from one target to another with hardly a pause between salvos. I can remember the captain standing there in that indescribable noise and confusion, always the complete master of the situation, coolly shifting fire to engage each target as it appeared. The first touch of realism for myself occurred when a direct hit on the captain's cabin below sent up a sheet of flame before my eyes. Other reports from all over the ship indicated that misses were falling both short of us and over. It was a ghostly feeling to realize those shells would probably soon find their mark. It was a moment of doubt for all of us, most of us anyhow, fearing the magazines would blow up. And then the captain stepped up and looked down and said, Hell, we're all right. That was the turning point for most of us. The confidence returned again. At the sound of the V-4 victory, the correct Eastern War Time, 2 o'clock. The WIP Special Events Department, in conjunction with the Coast to Coast Mutual Network, presents the exclusive story of the Battle of Midway Island. This broadcast by three captains of the United States Marines is presented as shortwave from Honolulu, Hawaii, and transcribed here from the Mutual Line. Aloha, fellow Americans. This is Owen Cunningham in Hawaii. From the Midway Islands have come three young officers of the United States Marine Corps, ready to tell you of the valiant job done by that service, whose motto of Semper Fidelis never rang truer than during those hectic days last week. Two of them are aviators who were shot down in combat, but not until they had scored against the enemy. The third commanded an anti-aircraft battery. Now, history is waiting to be reported. You know the framework of this epic. How Captain Buckner, you had the best close aboard view of the Midway area during the Japanese bombing attack. Will you set the stage for us? As the Japs approached, we saw our fighters begin to engage them. Several enemy bombers went down in flames. About this time, we replenished ammunition, took a deep breath, and now we're ready again. It all began pretty early. Word was passed by telephone at 4 a.m., 
and those not already on station manned their stations. Mine was at the observation post of my anti-aircraft battery. It was still dark, but we could hear the big bombers warming up. We waited. We'd been waiting for seven months, but this was the real McCoy. In about two hours, we got word that the Japs were on their way, advancing in three waves. They passed north of the island, swung around, and came in. The enemy had come within range of our anti-aircraft. All batteries went into action. Between our fighters and our guns, we had reduced the enemy bomber force to 20 planes by the time they hit Midway. After unloading their first bombs, the Japs changed tactics. They started dive bombing both islands, peeling off and coming in steep. They seemed pretty methodical about it, but missed their main targets. Personnel casualties were light, too. We think our heavy ground fire was too hot for them. All in all, the attack lasted about a half hour. It didn't seem that long. It was like watching a six-ring circus through a keyhole. But finally, the Japs had had enough. They went out low, strafing a bit as they went, and rendezvoused out of gun range. Then, I guess, they lit out for those carriers that our flyers were attacking at that very moment. Meanwhile, our flyers were hitting the enemy. Let's hear from Captain Merrill. We got up long before dawn and went to work. We knew our heavy stuff, the bombers that were to have the sky cleared for their takeoff. So we went out to screen their departure and then skipped back to Midway for the next phase of the operation. Which was? Which was doing a bit of attacking ourselves. About dawn, word came in that our pilots out there had engaged the Jap. Off we went. We had just one order, to intercept their bombardment squadrons before they hit Midway. My division found them only 10 miles out. And when I say found them, I'm putting it mildly. They were pretty well protected by fighters. I saw about 16 Jap bombers with fixed landing gear, winging straight for our base. They were the same kind that raided Pearl Harbor six months ago. I made one pass of the Jap squadron, and I sprayed a few bullets into them. Then suddenly I caught them from above and behind. At 8,000 feet, I lost partial control of my ship. On the way down, I was struck twice more, and the gasoline tank blew up in my face. When I saw I couldn't make the Midway Reef, I bailed out. I had heard that the Japs liked to strafe parachutists so I didn't pull my ripcord for 3,000 feet. As they came down, I could see enemy bombs falling around the base. Lots of them missed. One whole row of high explosives made a sort of white dotted line along the beach. Then I was swimming. I had disengaged my chute and inflated my life jacket. And boy, the shore seemed a long way off. I finally made the reef and rested up for 10 or 15 minutes. Then the boat picked me up. Meanwhile, your comrades in the air were pushing home their attack, too. People like, like Captain Blaine here. I'm a dive bomber, Pilot Owen. Our assignment was to take off shortly after Herbie's fighters and hit the Jap carriers that launched the planes that our fighters were then engaging. It was just breaking into one of those clear midway mornings when we took off. We had all, almost 200 mile flight ahead of us, so we poured the coal to them. What sort of orders did your commanding officer give you, Captain Blaine? Concise ones, intercept and destroy. We found our objective while passing above a fleecy patch of clouds at 8,000 feet. Through holes in this stuff, we caught a glimpse of the sweetest bunch of targets I'd ever imagined seeing. Three carriers strung out in a five-mile column, screened by cruisers and destroyers. Our squadron leader radioed our assignment, and I drew a keg attack care. One of the big babies. Had the enemy spotted you? Yes, indeed. We saw our fighters taking off and rising to meet us. Then their anti-aircraft opened up. It began to explode all around us, great puffs of it. We were tossed around like toy balloons, but weren't hit. We had to smack those carriers because they were bent on smacking midway. We peeled off in steep dives. I was well in the rear of the formation, so I got a bird's eye view. One of our bombers burst directly one of our bombs burst directly on the superstructure of the Jap carrier and rocketed it like a hobby horse. Several hit alongside and probably stole in her plates. Enemy planes on deck took a lacing too. Boy, this begins to sound like an episode in an old-time movie thriller, Captain. What With, next? With the carrier smoking behind us, we started for home. Three of our fighters, of their fighters, clung to our tail. I went down to 25 feet to escape any aircraft fire and shot from the Jap destroyers. 
the fighters would make a stab at us, wheel overhead, and then serve comfort. A stray shot carried away part of my fuel line. I managed to start to keep the engine flowing, the gas flowing to the engine, by working the wobble pump. From then on, it was a nightmare. Pumping, controlling, watching, and praying. When I caught a glimpse of our wings, I added another word. They looked like Swiss cheese. Oh, boy. I judge your machine gunner was keeping occupied, eh, Captain? He was working like a fiend. Then he told me he had been hit twice. About this time, I became aware that my evasive tactics weren't shaking to zeros. So above us, there was a white cloud, maybe a thousand feet up. Pumping gas like mad, I gave her the gun, and we made it. You did, eh? Yes. Swell. And you finally lost the enemy? Finally, none too soon. Either because I had pumped all the fuel out trying to stay aloft as long as I did, or from some other trouble, the engine quit cold. So I made my first water landing. We looked like a ton of scrap metal, but the dive bomber took it nobly and floated long enough for the gunner to climb out and for us to free our two-man rubber boat, emergency rations, and some float lights. Captain, you, uh, you mentioned your gunner. Will you tell us who he is? I'm delighted to, Owen. He's Private First Class Gordon McFeely, United States Marine Corps, and a swell companion for a flight like that. Take it from me. He's 27 years old and comes from Youngsville, California. Right now, he's recovering from his wounds, which weren't serious, in the Naval Hospital at Pearl Harbor. Captain, uh, what happened after you got into the rubber boat? Well, our main source of satisfaction came from the fact that Jap strafers lay 100 miles behind us and midway only 60 ahead. We figured our patrols would find us. We drifted. Our little boat had a leak caused by a Jap bullet. So every 15 minutes, we had to give her 50 licks with the hand pump. We floated for two days and two nights, pumping. And uh, how did your comrades finally pick you up? Twice we had bitter disappointment when patrol planes passed fairly near us, but missed. Then on the morning of the 6th, we saw a flying boat. I fired a last float light, which sent out a long column of smoke. Eight miles away, the plane swung around and glided back towards us. She looked heavy and was because her fuel tanks were chock full. Her pilot made a magnific magnificent landing. We got on board. He made an even more brilliant takeoff. And that was that. So you just went home, eh, Captain? No, not quite. This particular plane was heading out on a, on a daily patrol. She couldn't go back till it was finished. So McFeely and I spent most of the day as observers, hunting the enemy again. Dick, in the final accounting, I hope that the fullest credit will go to such officers as Captain Sal T. Samad, a splendid Navy flyer himself, and senior in command at Midway, and to Colonel Harold D. Shannon, whose Marine Defense Battalion put up the mighty barge that chased away the enemy, and also to Lieutenant Colonel Ira Kimes, commanding our Marine Air Group. Credit should go to the Army Bottoming Squadrons under Brigadier General Willis Hale, too. Coming into Midway and accepting our operating conditions, they put on an excellent combat performance in completing coordination with the Navy and Marine Air Corps. Yes, that's true. We fellows on the ground know that things would not have turned out as well if our Air Forces, Army, Navy, and Marine, hadn't hit the jab so hard before and after they appeared at Midway. Japanese neared Midway on June 3rd, hoping to launch an all-out knockout blow on that pair of coral atolls shortly after dawn on June 4th. They were roundly defeated during the ensuing three days. Combined forces of the Army, Navy, and Marine Corps dispersed the Japanese with heavy losses. All of them contributed much to smashing what appears to have been a major enemy threat at our vital island outpost, an invasion attempt. You will be prouder than ever to call yourselves Americans after you have heard from Captain Herbert Merrill, 28 years of age, of Arlington, Massachusetts. Captain Richard Blaine, 26, of Miami, Florida. And Captain Gene Buckner, 28, of Hanford, California. First, I shall introduce Captain Merrill, who informed me shortly before we went on the air that he became the father of twins a month ago. Would you like to say hello to Mrs. Merrill? Yes, I would. Hello, Lois. I only wish that you were broadcasting, too, so this wouldn't be a one-way affair. Give my love to the twins and save lots for yourself. That greeting was sent to this marine pilot's wife in faraway Nashua, New Hampshire. Now we have Captain Blaine of Miami, the second flyer. Hello, Mother and Dad. 
I'm delighted to have this chance to tell you I'm fit as a fiddle and not at all worse from my experience. And here is Captain Buckner, commanding an anti-aircraft battery, who wants to say a few words to his wife and son back in Chicago. Thank you, Owen. Come here, dear. The last snapshots of David are the best yet. Please send along some more. I am okay, and I will stay that way. And that is a Sega of the Sea. You have just heard Captain Gene Buckner, Captain Richard Blaine, and Captain Herbert Merrill of the United States Marine Corps describe the initial stages of the Battle of Midway. They played a part in the making of history. This was their story. They'd been talking to you from the studios of KGMB, Honolulu, Hawaii, USA. We return you now to Mutual. And for word on events on this side of the Atlantic, we take you now to Washington. The showdown on minimum pay for men in the service may come in Congress tomorrow. At that time, the Senate is scheduled to take up the conference compromise of $46 a month, and many congressional observers are freely predicting that the upper house will readily agree to the new figure. At the same time, supporters of the $50 a month minimum are standing firm, and they claim they have enough votes to win out when the measure reaches the floor of both houses. Ever since the House of Representatives instructed its members of the conference committee to stand firm on the $50 a month minimum, a little heralded but well-supported movement to force final agreement on that figure has been taking place. And its supporters now believe that they have sufficient strength to force final adoption of the pay bill on their terms. In the original measure, the Senate boosted the pay for buck privates and apprentice seamen from $21 to $42 a month. The House upped the ante to $50 and refused to back down when its conferees came back with a recommendation to accept the Senate figure. The new $46 figure is the result of the latest attempt to reconcile the differences of the two houses. Another congressional fight is likely to take place this week on the move to abolish the CCC. The House has already voted against a $75 million appropriation for the once popular New Deal agency, and there is a definite move in the Senate to follow suit. However, Senate insistence on restoring the appropriation would not necessarily save the CCC. Should the upper chamber vote to continue the agency, its action would throw the measure into a conference. The report of this conference would still have to be approved by the House. And by its vote last week, the lower chamber has shown its insistence on ending the CCC's life. Some members are predicting, however, that the House might be forced to rescind its action if the Senate should insist on killing the National Youth Administration as well as the CCC. When these two agencies were up for discussion in the House, it was voted to continue funds for the former, but to withhold them from the Civilian Conservation Corps. There is a genuine belief that while the House might be willing to abolish the CCC, it will not do so if it means at the same time putting an end to the NYA. And the Silver Bloc in Congress is talking about forcing another 29 cent rise in the price the Treasury pays for domestic silver. The government already is paying more than double the world price. But Senator McCarran of Nevada plans to introduce a bill raising it to $1 an ounce. This would stimulate greater production, which McCarran claims is needed by war plans as a copper substitute. The latest suggestion in the movement to save rubber through gasoline restriction is that of curtailing the operation of taxicabs. It is understood that several methods of restricting taxi operations are under consideration. One would involve a flat order to make a certain reduction in mileage. Another would limit the use to which taxicabs could be put. And a third would bar intercity taxi operations and limit the distance a cab could travel from its garage. It is said that sightseeing trips by cabs will also be prohibited. In areas where gasoline is rationed, taxis will be allowed only enough gasoline to carry out the operations permitted under their mileage allowances. Draft headquarters may soon examine the cases of 1,000 government workers who are deferred because they are supposedly indispensable. All of them are under 25 years of age. Senator Tidings of Maryland called the cases to the attention of Selective Service officials after his committee uncovered 5,000 other government deferments. The tall Maryland senator said that these abuses in the Selective Service system stick out like a sore thumb among government agencies, and he has demanded that draft officials make a thorough inquiry. Just two days ago, a Washington newspaper published a story about the 28-year-old son of an Ohio representative who was deferred because his job as his father's secretary is termed indispensable. Army men no longer need heap wrath on the head of the unfortunate bugler because the Army has officially announced that it doesn't have a single one. The soldier whose musical blasts arouse troops in the morning is officially called a trumpeter. He blows a trumpet rather than a bugle. That explanation was made enlisting the Army's 41 regulation trumpet calls, 
Less than a score of them are in daily use on military reservations. And so, for the moment, that's all from Washington. Our final report comes from Mid-Pacific. Here is Jim Wall speaking from Honolulu. And it's now 3.41 Sunday morning, Hawaiian World Time. The Commander-in-Chief of the Pacific Fleet, Admiral Nimitz, issued a brief communique from Pearl Harbor yesterday afternoon announcing the defeat of a large and formidable Japanese invasion fleet near Midway Island, and since then no further details of the naval battle had been divulged. What actually occurred in the vicinity of that small mid-Pacific atoll is known only to officers in blue jackets and flyers, soldiers and marines who participated in it. But the Admiral's statement was enough to make this a Saturday night of sober rejoicing in Honolulu. All Hawaii has been jubilant over what is obviously but a major naval victory, a victory in, what, in which a heavy enemy fleet has been smashed, with many of their aircraft carriers and battleships, cruisers and troop transports sunk or damaged, their aircraft destroyed, and a presumably large invasion attempt shattered. What are left after the three-day engagement are fleeing toward their island bases in the Western Pacific, pursued relentlessly by our own ships and planes. The tales of all this are not being made public because the battle itself is obviously not yet completely finished. And until it is, the Navy doesn't wish to crow about it. But Admiral Nimitz has already briefly reported the results and has indicated that it was no minor sea fight. He has stated that we have partially avenged Pearl Harbor. Admiral Nimitz is a tall, lean, hard, gray Texan, usually grim, not given to wasting words. He's a man of action, and when he speaks, he means what he says. Honolulu, which has come to know him during the past six months of warfare, realizes that he is no, he is so sparing of words that often he means much more than he says. If the Admiral says that we've scored a victory, there can be no doubt of it. Though little has been said about it, the islands have been under a constant military alert for a long while, and everyone here realized that trouble was brewing. Volunteers, both men and women, stood ready for any emergency. The fact that the tales cannot be issued now about this and other battles should be no cause for grumbling by Americans here in Hawaii or on the mainland. The Army and Navy know their jobs and are doing their best. They want no information to leak out that might be of any possible aid to the enemy. Their censors are as anxious as anyone else to learn what is happening, but they're watchdogs to the press and radio and postal service, and they know as well as anyone that this war is not yet won by any means. We're on our way to winning it in the Pacific against Japan, as the Admiral said. But we haven't done it yet. There's still a long road ahead. Hawaii is ready to travel it, no matter how long it takes. So are the hard-fighting Army and Navy, who are grimly marking this morning of June 7th, a Sunday just like that Sunday six months ago today, when the Japs hit us unaware at Pearl Harbor. I return you to San Francisco. And there you have a roundup of war news from vital world centers. John McVeigh reported from London, David Anderson from Stockholm, our staff announcer in Washington, D.C., and finally, Jim Wall spoke to you from Honolulu. This is the newsroom in San Francisco. For latest news, keep tuned to this station. Good morning, everyone. Saturday, June 13th, and here's the news as reported by our staff correspondents at home and overseas. We turn first to Britain, where John McVeigh is ready to report. Go ahead, London. This is London. Military quarters in London today believe Rommel is aiming at Tobruk as the fighting becomes fiercer in the Libyan desert. It's thought here the Germans are trying to do what they started to do on the first day of the battle, advance to El Adam and strike north. Military information in London is that the British positions are intact and the positions at Knightsbridge and Gazala are still held. London today had the official report that severe fighting lasted all day yesterday south of El Adam. The enemy attacks on El Adam were repulsed, but Axis armored forces maneuvered around the point and struck at Akroma. British armored forces engaged them heavily and inflicted considerable damage. A couple of hours ago, it was announced here that thousands more American troops have arrived in Northern Ireland. They came with armored fighting vehicles and mechanized artillery. The combat troops are armed with Tommy guns and other automatic weapons. The convoy made the crossing without the loss of one American. 
The units are reported to have worn the new type of American steel helmet. Troops were whisked away to their camps by the smooth-running transport organization as soon as they landed. Today, the wartime derby was run at Newmarket. The big race has just finished. The favorite, the big game, owned by the king, was an also ran. The winner was Watling Street, owned by Lord Derby. Yesterday, the king's filly, Sun Chariot, won another famous English race, the Oaks. People who watched yesterday's race were counted in hundreds instead of the peacetime thousands. Only one train left London for Newmarket, and hundreds of people had to stay behind on the station platform. A few people hired London taxis to make the trip at a price of about $40 for the 140-mile round trip. Tomorrow, every city and town in Britain is taking part in the Flag Day celebrations of the United Nations. London is to have a big procession of men and women representing Britain at war. Marches will include factory workers, fishermen, Welsh miners, farmers, all the services and the home guard. At most of the celebrations, a proclamation from Mr. Churchill will be read. American troops are going to attend the church service in London. And at St. Martin's in the Field, the famous church near Trafalgar Square, Ambassador Wynant will read the lesson. President Roosevelt's speech is being broadcast by the BBC. News of the heavy losses inflicted on the Japanese fleet got most of the headlines in London this morning. But some interesting sidelights on the Anglo-Russian pact and Mr. Molotov's trip are still appearing. The fact that at least up to this morning, the German press and radio had mentioned the pact to the German people in only one discreet statement is a pretty good indication of how surprised the Nazis were at the news. You can imagine the hurried conferences between Dr. Goebbels and other Nazi leaders as they tried to solve the problem of how to break it gently to the Germans. One regular German radio political commentary was cancelled yesterday. Instead, an announcer said to German listeners, Achtung, we shall play you music instead. The Germans haven't yet made any mention of the Second Front statements in Washington and London. Germans in Norway, however, got the assurance from their country's radio that the Anglo-Russian pact would never have any practical significance. They were told the pact came at a time when the Axis were preparing military operations which will lead to what they called a final result. The Russian air crew who flew the big Russian bomber that brought Molotov made a fine impression on the RAF men they met. As soon as the bomber landed, the crew got out and went to work servicing the machine. They explained that in the Russian Air Force, each flying crew, as soon as they land, get the craft ready for action at a moment's notice. Both the bomber and the men's equipment are said to have been first class by the men who saw them. The Russians were made members of the Society of Short Snorters, restricted to people who have flown the Atlantic or are about to do so. They were given signed dollar bills as badges of membership, and a British flyer explained that they must always show the bill at another member's challenge or pay a fine. The Russians are reported to have been brought from their beds by a fake message, but every man had his dollar bill with him. This is John McVeigh in London, returning you to New York. And now, in just a moment, we will take you to neutral Sweden for a report of David Anderson. We turn across the Atlantic again as we take you to Stockholm. Hello, New York. This is David Anderson speaking from Stockholm. It may be significant that just two days after the signing of the pact between London and Moscow, the Finnish communique today merely states that there is nothing to report on land, sea, or in the air. You will recall the recent German and Russian announcements of attacks on the Leningrad front, in which Finnish troops were reported to be involved, and the German announcement several days ago of a combined German-Finnish drive in the region of Murmansk. From the Finnish communicator day, are we to assume that these separate drives were of little significance? Well-informed sources here in Stockholm believe that we can. They point out that the late ice in the northern region prevented the Germans from sending in their supplies until very late. In fact, their supply situation as yet is far from being satisfactory. These sources go on to say that it is very doubtful if we will witness any major operations on the Leningrad front before late summer. Meanwhile, I learn that further German reinforcements have been sent into the Norwegian port of Trondheim. It is still uncertain whether these troops are meant to reinforce the Germans in Norway or if they are to be sent on to the northern front. From the rest of the eastern front, only sparse reports are available today. The Germans still seem to maintain the reserve in speaking of their offensive on the Kharkov front. However, they do admit that Timoshenko still has large forces at his disposal, and that any German advance in this sector will come only after hard fighting. They now seem to exclude the possibility of any quick advances, such as they registered in the first phases of the Russian campaign. It is generally believed here that Hitler will not venture any large-scale operations into the Caucasus before he has taken Sevastopol and liquidated large portions of Timoshenko's army. That, 
even according to German admissions, will take time, one of the most important features in the whole of the Eastern Campaign. This is David Anderson, returning you now to New York. From our New York newsroom, 43 years ago, General Douglas MacArthur entered West Point. His countrymen are celebrating that anniversary today to show their appreciation for the magnificent job the general has done in his campaign against the Japanese. At his headquarters in Australia, he has asked his fellow Americans to rededicate themselves today to duty, honor, and country. He has asked them to say a simple, silent prayer that the merciful God may guide our steps. Prime Minister John Curtin and other Australian leaders have offered the Allied Commander-in-Chief in the Southwest Pacific high tribute. In a broadcast last night, Curtin recalled that General MacArthur has said he will one day return to the Philippines. And the Prime Minister said the General's word was a solemn pledge Australians are going to help him keep. From Moscow, Russian troops are counterattacking on both important sectors of the Eastern Front. But the damage to the invading Nazi troops has been greater at Sevastopol than at Kharkov. The Soviet Information Bureau says heavy toll has been levied on German manpower and materiel in the battle in the Crimean port. 62 German tanks have been knocked out and damaged, and 10 artillery and mortar batteries have been leveled. The nine-day-old battle also has meant death for three regiments of German infantry and a squadron of cavalry, representing from 3,500 to 7,000 men. Meanwhile, Marshal Simeon Timoshenko has turned the 48-hour Kharkov defensive into something of a Russian advance, although the upper hand is not claimed yet by the Red Army in the Ukraine sector either. Events here at home are reported by Earl Godwin, speaking from the newsroom in Washington. And uh, good morning, folks. Everyone here is in the government, that is, in the military and naval and in the commentating business is wondering about that Japanese landing on the very tip end of those stepping stones called the Aleutian Islands. I may be wrong, it's easily easily ascertained, but they tell me there are 1,400 or more of those islands, some vast ones, some just little points of rocks that stick up there in that cold green sea, gray sea sometimes, full of fog and moss and very few people. Japanese vessels have been reported now in Kiska Harbor, which is 80 miles away from Attu Island, which is the very tip end of the Aleutians. Our Navy thinks the invaders have been forced out of all populated areas. Of course, there's not very much population there anyhow. Naval authorities and the rest of us have really been expecting the Japanese to land somewhere up in that maze of islands because they, they're protected by fog and everything else. You can't keep them out all the time. Ever since The Jap airmen raided uh, Dutch Harbor on June 3rd. We've expected they'd try it again. Now, the Japs have set foot in the Western Hemisphere for the first time. But the invasion is not on a very large scale. Just a tiny rock and some Japs have climbed up on it. Navy men believe that this Japanese adventure may be a face-saving gesture more than anything else, so that... uh, Yammering Yamamoto, the Jap admiral, can tell his people that he's landed on the North American continent. The island of Attu has a little radio station and a very small native village, and that's about all. We consider it has very little of military value at all. But from the way the Army and the Navy have been battering Yamamoto's forces, it appears that some to some folks that the Japanese offensive power in the Pacific has been really crippled. The Jap lines of communication have been spoiled considerably. Now, see what occurred. The Japs got a tremendous licking at the Coral Sea fight, the details of which have just been given out by the Navy, and rather conservatively of that. That Coral Sea fight hurt the Japs so badly that they thought they had run into practically all of our forces. They didn't see how just a little force could do them up as badly as it did, so... They got the the wrong impression that we had left Hawaii unprotected. So they tried to sneak around and tried to come down on Hawaii like the wolf on the fold, and they got caught without mercy at Midway. Now you see the, the, the connection between those two fights. Now if the Japanese had seized Midway Island, it would have been a powerful base against Pearl Harbor, where we might expect another invasion. That would put the Hawaiians in the Jap hands, and we 
could have expected a West Coast invasion or an attempt by Jap forces sooner or later based on Hawaii. So that seems to be all off, and that shows the American people what the Navy has been up to. Japan's humiliated Admiral Yamamoto saw 51 of his vessels lost or knocked out, all by American air power. Japan has lost half of her fleet's aviation arm. That is, we've knocked out four and possibly five airplane, car airplane carriers. One of the Lexington survivors tells this story. He says he was standing by a seaman gunner feeding shells into the anti-aircraft gun. When the first torpedo struck the old Lexington, another crew member asked him, what was that, a torpedo? No, said the gunner, we probably hit a reef. Just then, wham, another torpedo struck. And the second seaman looked up. Dryly, he drawled out, make that a big reef. You know, that's the American for you. You can't beat them. And I think by now the Japanese know it and are considerably worried. Probably you know by now, if you don't, it's been bulletinized that the uh, that another unit of American troops, including Negro troops, have landed in Northern Ireland, and Northern Ireland, and there's a great time going on over there. They're going to make it a part of uh, Flag Day all around the world. Closer to home, the things that that uh, will will affect every one of us have to do with the great big rubber drive, the nationwide rubber drive that the president has inaugurated. It's the all-firedest, biggest nationwide hunt you ever saw. The president commands us all to search high and low for every bit of scrap rubber that the nation is hiding, from bathing caps to tires, hot water bottles, sink stoppers, rubber heels, raincoats, everything that's got any, any kind of rubber in it anywhere and turn them into the filling stations of the country, beginning at one minute past midnight tomorrow. That's Monday morning, when Monday morning is a minute old. Start it, and the treasure hunt will run for two weeks. You know how you really have no idea how important it is or how badly your country needs that rubber. The way these army fellows talk, actually, we may lose or win a major battle. On the amount of rubber we collect because... Rubber puts speed into the Mobile Army. It puts 25 more speed in the American tanks than the Germans have with their lack of rubber. And one of the things that was lost in the shuffle yesterday was the inaugurating of what we shall call the V-Mail, V for victory. That's a post office service for getting more mail across the seas for the boys overseas. It is a micro-photographic scheme. Your letter taken to a post office is photographed and reduced in size so that much more mail can be sent abroad than ordinarily. Just now, 20 large post offices are equipped with this micro-photographic device. It's planned to put the whole service into the whole 44,000 post offices, and that's all from Washington at this time. These have been reports by John McVeigh from London, David Anderson from Stockholm, and Earl Godwin from Washington. For the latest news, keep tuned to this station. This is the National Broadcasting Company. There was a sort of joyous and nautical abandon about life in Singapore during those last days. For one thing, possessions didn't count anymore. Money didn't matter either. The most you hoped for was to preserve your life and, if possible, your freedom. And the old saying, drink and be merry for tomorrow ye die, was fully translated into a gloriously irresponsible reality. I remember that after I threw my wife off to Java about a fortnight before the fall of Singapore, I came away feeling naturally rather depressed to find that my car had been requisitioned or stolen. And so in desperation, I asked a complete stranger for a lift who was going the same way as I was. I told him what had happened, and he said quite casually, Oh, well, would you like this car? I've got two, so I don't really need it. I thanked him very much, and he gave me the keys, and that was that. Well, you see, that's an illustration of the whole atmosphere in Singapore during those last days. This nation at war. Once 
once again you are going to hear the living documentary story of the 130 millions of Americans who are making history. You are going to hear them at work amid authentic backgrounds in a series of direct on-the-spot broadcasts that will take us to Portland, Oregon, Long Island, New York, San Francisco, South Chicago, and Washington, D.C. This Nation at War is a regular feature of the Blue Network presented in cooperation with the National Association of Manufacturers. This is Jim Backus talking from New York City. Tonight, as our Russian ally battles the full strength of the Nazi war machine and speculation increases over a second Allied front, the eyes of the whole world fall upon America. Can we continue to transport men and material to the places needed, in the quantities needed, when it is needed? Do that means a bridge of ships. And so tonight, the fate of mankind for generations to come may well depend on the performance of one section of American industry, the shipbuilders. For the next 30 minutes, you are going to hear the story of this most critical of all jobs in this nation at war. You're going to hear it straight from the mouths of naval officers, plant managers, steel workers, welders, shipwrights, and sailors, the men who are doing the job. First to Washington, where Rear Admiral Emory S. Land, chairman of the Maritime Commission, will tell us something of the size of the job. As chairman of the Maritime Commission, Admiral Land, we look to you for some straight, cold facts in the gigantic task our country faces in merchant shipbuilding. The first straight, cold fact, Mr. Rice, is that we must build better than 800 ships this year and 1,500 next year. This is the biggest job American industry ever tackled. <clears throat> How in the world is it being done, Admiral? Several months ago, I testified before congressional committees to the effect that if productivity of labor could be increased 12.5% in 42, 25% in 43, the Maritime Commission would readily meet the President's Merchant Marine Shipbuilding Program in 42 and 43. There was, of course, our standard proviso, namely that the necessary steel be furnished to the Maritime Commission. It gives me the greatest pleasure to say that not only has the productivity of labor increased to the percentages indicated, but as far as the past them. In the phraseology of the shipbuilding boys, we are going to town. Going to town all up and down the Atlantic coast, the Pacific coast, and the Gulf, right? More than that, Mr. Rice. The job is being done in practically every state in the Union. The actual shipyards are only a part of the building of a ship. American industrial management has done a remarkable job converting peacetime manufacturing into parts for our merchant fleet. Into the shipyards from all over the country roll trade loads of parts. And in the yards themselves, the time required to build a ship grows less and less. You emphasize speed, Admiral Land. We have to. Now, this year, next year, is when we need ships. Ships to carry troops, military equipment, heavy cargoes of tanks and artillery, millions of rounds of ammunition, heavy construction steel for railways and bridges. We must carry food, unnumbered tons of it, to our troops, to our allies. You see, Mr. Rice, why, we of the Maritime Commission think and act and talk. Speed. Indeed I do, Admiral Land, which makes me wonder just how long it takes to build a ship these days. The answer to that question is proof that American ingenuity, American workers, and American management can do anything we ask when challenged the way this country is challenged today. In World War I, 10,000 ton ship required from 10 to 12 months to build. Last spring, with mass production methods, we were building 10,000 ton Liberty ships on an average of 156 days. Why, that's less than one half the time taken in World War I. At the present rate of progress, we expect to reach the average of 105 days by September. Only 105 days from the laying of the keel to the launching? No, from the laying of the keel to delivery, which is quite a different thing. Uh, could you tell us the speed record, Admiral Land, in the building of a Liberty ship? 46 days. You mean... 46 days, a month and a half after the keel was laid, a ship was all fitted and ready to go places? With 9,146 tons of cargo, yes, sir. Could you tell us where that record ship was built? It was built by the Oregon Shipbuilding Corporation, one of Mr. Henry Kaiser's yards. The owner of this yard and some of the other shipbuilders are now out to beat this record. They are predicting that they are going to build Liberty Ship in 30 days. Honest now, Admiral, you don't really believe that, do you? Indeed I do. Why not? We are reaching the point where the members of the Maritime Commission will refuse to be surprised when some yard does build a Liberty ship for us 
In 30 days. Well, here is hoping. Oh, by the way, Admiral, can you tell us how many ships were completed in July? 71 ships of 790,300 deadweight tons. 52 of these were Liberty ships, I am happy to say. Thank you, Admiral Land. This nation at war. And now, out on the West Coast, thousands and thousands of men and women are at work on these ships that Admiral Land told us about. The ingenuity of American management, coupled with the skill of American workers, is breaking all-time world records for speed and ship construction. Our next jump is to the shipbuilding yard Admiral Land mentioned, the Portland works of the Oregon Shipbuilding Corporation. Phil Irwin of station KEX is standing by in the yard of the Oregon Shipbuilding Corporation at Portland. By the time you count ten seconds, you will hear his voice. Under the far-seeing leadership of Henry J. Kaiser, over 35,000 employees of the Oregon Shipbuilding Corporation have combined skill, sweat, and high morale to establish a record for delivery of more Liberty ships than any other shipyard. When the keel for the very first ship was laid on May 19, 1941, Mr. Kaiser had never built a ship before, and over 90% of the employees had never worked in a shipyard before. That first Liberty ship, the Star of Oregon, was delivered to the government December 31st, 1941, 226 days after the keel was laid. In sharp contrast was the Thomas Bailey Aldrich, which, on June 1st, 1942, required only 46 days from keel laying to delivery to set a new all-time high in wartime ship construction. But there was a definite need for trained workers before a world's record could be established. And the Oregon Shipbuilding Corporation answered this need with intensified vocational training and conducted in the yard itself. Classes covering every phase of ship construction were held for all employees desiring training to provide the fundamentals which are further developed by actual experience. Just what kind of people work in a shipyard? All kinds, men and women from every walk of life. And they are all here to do the job at hand the job which counts right now. As we move about the yard, we see these contrasting personalities all around us. For example, here's the pipe-fitting shop and the husky-looking gentleman hard at work. Uh, your name, sir? Louis Zanon. I'm lead man pipe-fitter for the yard. And what did you do before you came here, Mr. Zanon? Well, among other things, I was a member of Barnum and Bailey Circus. I doubled as strongman and fire eater. Uh, did you say fire eater? That's right. I entertained the circus fans by eating electric light globes, razor blades, and assorted hardware. But when war priorities came along, I had to change my diet. And your job, I see. Well, how do you like it here? It's a great privilege. This kind of work is right up my alley. And I feel really important in doing something for my country and those small lads across the water. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Zanon. Now, moving along to the plate shop, uh, we find another big fellow swinging a 32-pound sledge. If he'll lay it down for just a moment, perhaps he'll tell us his name. Gladly. I'm Jonathan D. Heaton, better known around here as Brother Jonathan. Brother Jonathan? Yes. I'm a member of the Mormon Church, and I spent four years in the mission field in Australia and New Zealand. And after that? Well, from religion to wrestling is quite a jump, but that's where I landed. Well, I've seen you wrestle in Portland... And I understand you help sell war bonds by taking part in wrestling matches between local shipyards here. That's right. It's a lot of fun, and I'm glad to be doing my part in every way I can. Keep up the good work, Brother Jonathan. Now over here is pipe fitter number 13,505. But to the world, he's better known as Alexander Umansky, internationally famous ballet master. You were born in Russia, Mr. Umansky. Yes, 47 years ago. I came to America at the age of 13, and I've been in Bali work for 35 years, except for the time I served in World War No. 1. Well, aren't you rather out of your element working here? Some people may, might think so, but I love it here. And then I still teach ballet in my spare time, and I have a 15-year-old daughter, Valentina, 
who's a coming Bali star. And I can see you swell with pride when you say that, and justly so. Tell me, wasn't it pretty much of a sacrifice to give up the work you love and to become a pipe fitter? America has been very good to me. I owe it more than I can repay. I'm quite happy here doing all I can to help. I feel inspired and useful because, in the end, all this will mean liberty and freedom for the people. Freedom, too, for not just one art form, but for all the cultural and artistic forms which make for a better world in which to live. I can add no more to that, Mr. Romansky. And now, what of women workers? For information on that score, let's turn to one of the first women welders, Mrs. Mary Carroll. How long have you been working at the Oregon shipyards, Mrs. Carroll? Since April. I was formerly employed as a stenographer. However, the first of last year, I began to notice the urgent need for war workers, and I wanted to do my part. And why did you select welding, Mrs. Carroll? Because welders seemed to be first in demand. I took a 200-hour course and went to work at once. A very patriotic gesture, Mrs. Carroll, helping out in the war effort like that. The women have a very important job to do in this war, perhaps as important as the men. However, I hasten to add that the women with families to care for are doing just as big a job by standing by and keeping the American home. And have you a family, Mrs. Carroll? Yes, four children, one girl and three boys. What are their ages? Uh, the girl is 18, the boys are 14 and 12. Well, now, that's only two sons. Uh, what are the other ones? The oldest son, Richard, was in the Philippines at the outbreak of the war and was one of the men who saw service with MacArthur on Bataan. And if I might ask, when was the last time you heard from him, Mrs. Carroll? His last letter reached me in March. That is just one of the reasons I prefer to do my part here in the shipyard. By working and learning, by helping in every way I can to build these ships, by contributing my own work to this all-out effort, I feel that I am doing, at least to some degree, what the boys over there are doing so wholeheartedly. And it is a satisfaction, a truly proud feeling deep down inside, to know that I'm helping to speed the day when they'll all come back home. Thank you, Mrs. Carroll. From Portland, Oregon, you've heard the men and women who are breaking world records to send our merchant fleet to sea in time for victory. But you must remember the job doesn't begin here. The construction of these ships really begins in factories and mills hundreds and thousands of miles from the coast. The big engines that drive these ships come from many different factories. And unless the supply of these power plants keeps the pace with the speed of the shipbuilders, we'd have ships that couldn't move. Well, we're getting these engines, and we're getting them on time. So let's find out how they're doing that part of the job. Bill Baldwin of the Blue Network Station in San Francisco is standing by at the Joshua Hendy Iron Works in Sunnyvale, California, waiting to tell us that part of our story. Come in, Bill Baldwin. Hello, America. This is Bill Baldwin of Station KGO in San Francisco reporting the story of a miracle of American war production. Our Blue Network microphones are set up at the end of the long final assembly line of the Joshua Hendy Iron Works near Sunnyvale, California, where most 274,000 pound steam engines, two stories in height, are being assembled and tested before being placed in the engine room of Liberty ships of America's great new Merchant Marine. To give you some idea of what is going on here at the Hendy Works, let me tell you that this plant has been in operation since 1856, but that in 1942, three times the manufactured material would be turned out here as in all of the other 86 years combined. A little over a year ago, this plant was an antiquated, obsolete factory, employing about 60 men in receivership and with little more than goodwill and a pear orchard owned by the company to recommend it. Today, the pear orchard is gone. Its crop sold for $1,100 and the first profit entry on the books of this new company, incidentally. But the goodwill has increased many, many times. Today, Hendy covers a 60-acre tract employs over 3,000 men, and is turning out marine engines at a rate which has already earned the coveted Maritime Commission M for outstanding production. In another 60 days, there will be 4,200 men and women on the payroll, and by the end of next year, 8 million tons of Allied shipping will be propelled by handy-made engines, just like the one towering over our heads at this moment. The factors which have made this production possible may be boiled down to two. American mass production method, plus American will to tackle the impossible and lick it. And now, let's find out something firsthand about this plant and the men who are turning out these engines. Here's a gentleman working in the machine right here. Uh, what is your name, sir, and your job here at Hendy? Bert Veal, and I'm a machine specialist. And how long have you been doing this work? 
I was a tool man in shipyards during the last war, but I've been a professional musician since then, until I came to Handy in June 1941, when the call went out for skilled machinists. Well, you mean that you played in orchestras, Mr. Beale? Yes, I played trumpet in many well-known bands. Well, I don't suppose you find much use for your music around here. Oh, yes, indeed I do. You see, we have a 42-piece band here at the plant, which plays for the men during lunch hours and at special gatherings. I lead the band. Oh, I see. Well, that's a long jump from band work to shipbuilding. Oh, not so much. The Hummer machinery here at Henny turning out these great engines is real music. It certainly is, and thank you, Bert Beal. And now over here is another gentleman who looks as if he might be able to tell us something. Your name, sir? Peter McCain. And how old are you, Mr. McCain? 75 years young and still going strong. Ah, <laughs> fine. How long have you been a machinist, Mr. McCain? 56 years. 19 of them here at Henders. Well, you must have worked on a lot of ships in that time. I sure have. And one of them was mighty famous, too. The old battleship Oregon. A great ship. Uh, you're right about that, Mr. McCain. What is your job here now? Lathe machinists, making crankshafts for the engines. Well, I understand that you're not only the oldest man on the job here, but also one of the most respected because of your skill, Mr. McCain. You are training younger men, too, aren't you? That's right. And I am proud to say that right now, I have three young fellas who have become full-fledged machinists working right alongside me. Well, how long does it take on the average to train these new men? It all depends on the lad's willingness and the machine he's working on. But I'd say about a year on the average. When I was a boy, it took about five years because most of the work was done by hand. And thank you, Peter McCain, 75 years young. Keep up the good work. And now here's another gentleman. What is your name, sir? Charles E. Moore. And your job here at Handy, Mr. Moore? President and general manager. Well, I certainly came to the right man for information. How long have you been building engines, Mr. Moore? Just since we took over this plant and put it into operation on a production line basis a little over a year ago. Well, that's a new way to build these monster engines, isn't it? It has never been done before, but the demand for such a huge number of engines had never existed before either. We saw that enough engines were going to be turned out to power our shipping fleet. They would have to be built on a mass production method basis instead of one by one. And that's what we're doing now. Well, what's your secret of your success here at Hendy in doing that job? There's no secret to it. It's simply a matter of getting the men and the equipment to do the job, putting them into fast operation and making decisions quickly. Well, you make it sound pretty simple, Mr. Moore. Is all your equipment new? No, some of our equipment was worn out over 50 years ago, but these machines have been rebuilt and are giving a splendid account of themselves. We work on the principle that every machine and every man can do a job for victory. You can tell the world for us, Mr. Baldwin, that the Iron Men of Hendy will turn out the engines to drive the ships to beat the axis faster and faster until victory is ours. And since this great new plant of yours is already turning out half the marine steam engines being built in the United States, we know that you and the Iron Men will do it too, Mr. Moore. Thank you and keep them coming off the assembly line. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been a brief story of American protection in this nation at war from the huge new plant of the Hendy Iron Works near Sunnyvale, California, where modern mass production methods have revolutionized the building of the giant marine engines for our Liberty Fleet. Bill Baldwin speaking. We return you now to New York. W-O-L, in the nation's capital, Washington, D.C. Well, to begin with this evening, the President's War Labor Board handed down a very important decision today in connection with that seething question of stabilizing wages. And it happened to be the first incident in which the stabilizing part of the policy has come to light. Heretofore, they've stated the policy as a policy in the course of granting wage increases, first to the little steel industry, then to a large group of office and apartment house workers, service workers in New York City. 
The board explained on those two occasions that the reason they were granting the increases was that the workers, in those cases, had not received any increase in pay since before January 1st of last year, and the board felt they were entitled to an increase to make up for the 15% rise in the cost of living since that time. The implication of the policy was that the rulings was that if the workers had received enough of an increase to counteract that increase in the cost of living since January 1st, 1941, they were not entitled to anything more. But it was only an implication. That is, it was only an implication until this afternoon when the board ruled on a wage increase demand by some 2,750 workers of the General Cable Company at Bayonne and Perth Amboy, New, New Jersey. The finding was that those workers have received adequate pay increases during that period and that, therefore, the workers are not entitled to anything more, which, of course, finishes the official establishment of this policy on the record by means of decision. There was one vitally important and interesting sidelight of that decision, too. A sentence that was sort of tossed in, apparently by way of an answer to the argument of Mr. Leon Henderson, who, as you know, has been uh, disapproving, frowning on any of these wage increases, regardless of whether the workers have or have not received a boost in pay in the last year and a half. I told you about that point of view by Mr. Henderson on Monday evening. This one little sentence that was tossed into the decision today said that the total cost of this policy of the board, if it is carried out for all workers of the nation alike, will be only one and one-half percent of the total payroll of the nation. The tacit suggestion being that that is not going to do much damage in the way of causing inflation. Mr. Henderson says, you know, that any increase tends to cause an increase in the cost of living. The only two members of the War Labor Board who voted against this decision today were the CIO representatives. The CIO having been none too friendly to the whole policy from the beginning. The American Federation of Labor representative on the War Labor Board who was present today voted in favor of the ruling. About the synthetic rubber bill, which is on President Roosevelt's desk awaiting his veto, there are reports in very reliable schools tonight that what the President is planning to do is send the bill back to Congress with that veto and to announce at the same time that he is having an exhaustive scientific investigation of the whole synthetic rubber mess made by some outstanding unbiased scientist or perhaps by a small committee of outstanding unbiased scientists. My information is that the investigation is to be conducted just as quickly as possible with a view to finding out whether any changes should be made in the rubber program as it's now set up in the interest of getting actual production of synthetic rubber more quickly. I don't know what better solution there is than that. The tragedy is that it wasn't done months ago when there was still time to get some real results. I don't know whether you realize it or not, but it's been almost two months now since you and I began going into this synthetic rubber picture, a sacrosanct forbidden picture it was then. And if they had made the changes and gotten rid of the inertia and taken a little action then, we'd be far, far ahead now. As it is, all this time is lost because... Little men in big places couldn't bring themselves to admit that their past decisions were anything but 100% perfect. Two months of rubber production lost in a race against the dwindling stockpile. It may be that the president will announce his veto and the appointment of this scientific research committee or individual by the end of this week. Now about Mr. Henry J. Kaiser and his program to use his shipbuilding facilities on the Pacific coast for the production of huge new cargo airplanes. A great deal has happened today. As I told you last week, there was a great deal of skepticism about that program when Mr. Kaiser came to Washington last Thursday. There were those, and many of them, who said that it would be impossible to get engines for the planes. It would be impossible to get aluminum or the necessary steel. There was definite sales resistance, if you will, in many, many, almost all quarters. Since that time, Mr. Kaiser has been taking those points in a calm, quiet way. He's a most mild-mannered individual, for one who has done all that he has done. Uh, he answered them one at a time with facts and figures, quietly. And to those of us who have been watching the proceedings, it's been almost fascinating to see the weakening of that sales resistance, first here, then in some other quarter. The War Production Board experts, the Navy Department experts under Secretary of War Patterson, 
where they started with an ag- antagonistic a- attitude. They said they melted a bit first, then they said they'd look into it. Now most of those attitudes are definitely on the favorable side, as you'll see by some very important and exclusive news, which I'll give you in just a moment. The fact is that Mr. Kaiser has deeply impressed Washington by the very simple medium of having all the answers to all the problems before he ever set foot here. You may have heard him last night on this program say that if we haven't enough steel, we'll make steel. If we haven't enough nickel or chrome, we'll get that somehow. The problems ought to be solved, and the side that does solve them is the side that wins the war. On the other hand, it certainly is to the undying credit of those Navy and Maritime Commission and Army and War Production Board officials who started in with their sales resistance that they did not allow stubborn, hide-bound tradition to warp their judgment. It takes honest thinking, believe me, to toss overboard in three or four days the ingrained training and teaching and theories of old-line officers and old-line Navy training that has been ingrained for 30 years and to accept just willy-nilly in three or four days a brand new totally revolutionary idea. I think the reason for Mr. Kaiser's success here is that while he might be listed as all that all that claim about we would make steel if we didn't have it, we'd produce the nickel and chrome, that might be listed as mere empty talk for most people. But Mr. Kaiser has a record that proves that he has solved that sort of problem time and time again in the past. There's one incident I think you'd be interested in, in the construction of the huge Shasta Dam on the West Coast when he had the problem of providing 10 million tons of sand and gravel for the concrete work on that dam, and the only available sand and gravel deposit for him with, with which he could do the job uh, was a deposit 10 miles away from the dam site across a range of mountains. The railroad from the gravel pits went only as far as the town of Redding, which was still a mile and a half from the dam site, and the railroad refused to build the additional mile and a half of track because... They said that the river frequently went on a rampage and was likely to tear up the track as fast as they put it down. The way Mr. Kaiser solved that apparently insolvable problem was to build a conveyor belt. That is one of those endless rubber belts that carries material along on it from the gravel deposit over over the mountains and direct to the dam site. He had it in operation in 60 days, and the cost of moving the gravel, including the total original cost of the conveyor belt itself, as well as the cost of operating it, amounted to about half what the transportation would have cost by rail. Now the news that I have for you on this question tonight is just this. There is one man in this government who really has the final supreme say-so as to whether the program of giant cargo ships by Mr. Kaiser is to go ahead or whether it's not. That man is none other than Mr. Donald Nelson, the head of the War Production Board. Mr. Kaiser talked to him today at considerable length. It was quite a long conference. They went over details and plans and every possible consideration. I talked to Mr. Nelson later this afternoon after that meeting with Mr. Kaiser was over, and Mr. Nelson told me that he is confident that he is going to be able to work out this program and let Mr. Kaiser go ahead with his giant cargo ship construction plan. He said that there are three problems. First of all, the question of whether these huge ships actually will fly and whether they'll carry the necessary payload to make them worthwhile. On that score, the aeronautic experts of the War Production Board insist that they will, particularly Mr. Grover Loning, who is one of the outstanding aircraft engineers of the nation and who's on the staff of the War Production Board. He guarantees it. Problem number two, Mr. Nelson told me, is how and where to get the necessary critical materials such as aluminum and steel and other things. And problem number three is how to get the necessary equipment and machine tools to accomplish the actual production itself. Mr. Nelson told me that he believes that he has a solution for both of those problems. He may have to do some shifting here and there, and he may have to adopt some alternative ideas in one place or another. But the long and short of it is that Mr. Donald M. Nelson is determined to go ahead with his super plane production program as proposed by the amazing Mr. Henry J. Kaiser. Mr. Nelson told me that he's convinced that Mr. Kaiser can and will produce these planes. By way of corroboration, Mr. Nelson told regular news reporters later this afternoon that a special uh, war production board committee, which he had named to investigate the the cargo uh, plane program, has recommended to him that the cargo plane program be at least doubled and that he, Mr. Nelson, has placed responsibility uh, for achieving that 
in the hands of the Army and the Navy. So we're on our way. Nazi submarines are helpless against flying freight cars 10,000 feet above them. The president kept his appointment pat almost blank today and spent most of his time reviewing the verdict of the military commission that tried the Nazi saboteurs, or to put it another way, deciding whether any or all of the eight men must pay the death penalty. So it looks as though it won't be long now before we know the final outcome of that vitally interesting case. Incidentally, the case of the saboteurs has resulted in a mighty interesting little sequel. Uh, the United States Coast Guard is now in the market for horses as a result of their capture. Uh, not sea horses, mind you, but the honest to goodness equine uh, variety. The, the saboteurs, you remember, were landed on our beaches from, Ger Americans, uh, from uh, German submarines. Now the Coast Guard is going to mount a goodly number of its men on horses so that they can patrol all the beaches more effectively than they possibly could do on foot. Uh, quite a number of expert horsemen have already been recruited to carry on the work, so let's hope that this latest development will turn out to be a horse on Hitler. And that's the top of the news as it looks from here, ladies and gentlemen. Until tomorrow evening, good night. broadcasting system. On August the 19th at 4.50 a.m., the South Saskatchewan Regiment landed on the beach at Pruerville, two miles west of Dieppe. We were proud to be the first Canadian troops to step on German held ground, and every man was raring to go. As our small boats crept into the shore, we could see light shining from some windows and smoke curling from a few chimneys. We thought how peaceful it was and how soon we would disturb this quiet seaside town by rifle and gunfire. Except for the grim and determined look on these prairie lads' faces, one would think it was just another exercise. And a white-armed umpire was going to appear and tell us to make it look real. But this was a real thing, and we knew it. In a few seconds... We would be tearing into those juries with all the pent-up feelings we had saved in two and a half years of hard training. With a sudden increase of speed, and then the scrape of gravel, the ramps of the craft fell down. Out we ran on the German soil. In no time, the skies were flashing with trace of bullets and flares. One chap was heard to remark, Gee, this is better than the 1st of July. Over the seawall and into the town we went, each company going full out to their planned objective. It was soon apparent that the German posts were fully manned, and we were going to have a grand fight in our hands. All hell seemed to be letting loose. Not for a second did anyone hesitate. In they went, with yells and many a wisecrack. Like, God, those hinders are using live bullets. And, hey, where's the Empire? I shot that guy, and he won't let me back. Go ahead. Nice place for a 48-hour leave, eh? A nice hidden four-inch mortar and the light artillery gun were making the town echo with their continuous explosions. The road and bridge over the river was under constant machine gun fire, which threatened to hold up the show, and also cut some of the boys off across the river. The husky CO saw the situation. He took off his tin hat and twirling it for all the world like a boy with his school book. Sauntered across that bridge calling back, Come on, boys, they can't hit a thing. Come on, let's go and get them. And they did. And again later at another place, 
A pillbox was causing trouble. And the CO walked brazenly up to it and put it out of action with bombs. And again on the withdrawal when two cherry machine gun posts were hitting the boys on the beach. This one-man army of ours, accompanied by Major Orm of Weyburn and Private Kitchen of Regina, climbed the cliff and ended the war for those Nazis. All day long, the CO of ours was inspirational to the boys with his daring and leadership. And his name will always be honored in this regiment. On the other side of the bridge, Private Charlie Sodden of Consul Saskatchewan saw his section being in danger of complete extermination from the pillbox. He took his grenades and stood up in the road and walked right up to the strong point and tossed in his bomb. He killed seven heinies in that post. At another spot, a platoon of Germans with four machine guns and a mortar were holding a hill, which Private Berthelot, GB of Regina's platoon, were trying to take. Berthelot took the war into his own hands, and with a burn gun firing from the hip, he advanced across the open ground under covering fire from his platoon. He went up that hill and wiped out that post single-handed. I'm broadcasting now about the Dieppe raid at a time when details are just becoming available. I'd like to say this to you in Canada. We've suffered heavy losses, and I saw our men die, but never have I seen men die more bravely or fight with such great heart as our Canadian troops. The word Dieppe may rank with Vimy Ridge in our history, and our hats are off to the Royal Canadian Engineers and the Royal Canadian Army Medical Corps and the South Saskatchewan Regiment and the Queen's own Cameron Highlanders of Winnipeg and the Royal Regiment from Toronto and the Essex Scottish from Windsor and the Royal Hamilton Light Infantry and a Fusilier de Montréal. A lot of those men will never return to Canada. I believe a lot more will return after the war if the German announcement of 1,500 prisoners is correct. And added to the above, the officers and men of the Calgary tanks, whose story is one of the greatest that can be told about our Canadian part in this action. This was a combined operation, and I've spoken about the Army. Playing an equal part with our troops were the Air Force, the Marines, Commandos, and the Navy. I'm trying to find out now what percentage of the Air Force was Canadian, because I feel sure it was a great percentage. At least nine aircraft fell to Canadian guns, and many more were damaged. What a marvelous job they did in the face of intense fire from accurate and powerful German shore and ak, -Ak batteries. Our losses haven't been sustained without reason. We've learned a most valuable lesson which may enable us to free the continent of Europe and end the war. We know now how the German system of coastal defenses operates and how best to attack. We know the tremendous weight of artillery the enemy can bring to bear on the beach. That was the purpose of the raid, as set out officially and told how we set sail to defenses and all Germans and to obtain information. We did all those things, things which the Germans have never been able to do to us. We moved large forces across the channel unnoticed by the enemy. We landed men on all six beaches and we landed tanks in our new tank-carrying vessels, and one of which I was a passenger. Costly as it has been to Canada, the raid was definitely a success. Without this experience, a second front would have been suicide. <clears throat> now let me start from the beginning. The plan, of course, was a closely guarded secret, and the men weren't briefed until they were on board the ships. Although I didn't travel with the Royal Hamilton Light Infantry, I was present when their colonel, a fine figure of a man from London, Ontario, came on board and told them, men, we're going into action. We're going to do what we came over to do, get a crack at Jerry. And then he told them the nature of the operation and what was expected of each man. There were no heroics, no delighted yells of whoopee. The men were quiet and asked questions. It struck me that the questions were those that a general might ask when being told of an operation for the first time. What were the coast defenses likely to be? What aircraft protection would they get? I liked the spirit. We set sail in craft of all types under the cover of darkness. I was with the Calgary tanks in one of the new tank-carrying craft. It was a lovely night and reminded me of home. 
Hardly had we set sail than our padre collected all the men together in the bow of the ship, standing in front of a new type of tank they were using, and he read from the sixth chapter of Ephesians with the aid of a flashlight. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. In a few words, he told us that in a few hours we would be striking our first blow to bring a sign of deliverance to the people of Europe, and the reason for this service was because we would need God's help. The men were quiet as we slid out into the darkness under the lovely stars. I could read my watch in the light of the half moon, and soon we said goodbye to the dark shores of Britain. I had a chat with the officer commanding our particular troop of tanks, and he told me about the hard work they'd put in for weeks to get them ready for this action. He was confident in them, and in his men, to whom he said all credit must go. And now I'm just going to quote from the notes I took as we went along, some written in the darkness and some written in heavy gunfire, so they are now smeared and dirty from the cordite. And all the time I kept wishing I had a microphone in my hand. So taking notes in this way was my only substitute. On the way over, I went to sleep for a while, lying in my trench coat on a coil of rope on the deck, and then I went up on the open bridge with the young captain, a sub-lieutenant in the RNVR. And now for my notes, just as they were written. AA tracers, like red sparks, and there's a heavy red glow extending down the coast. Our bombers are at work. More heavy flash of coastal guns and bombs. Our aircraft are flying in close to the water and over us. And now dawn is breaking, also like a heavy barrage to the east. There are puffs of smoke in the sky, evidently from heavy German ack-ack batteries. And the ships are weaving in. Our lads are calm, and the tank men, wearing black berets and sitting comfortably anywhere, are watching the action. The sky is becoming full of aircraft, and the bombardment is becoming intense. Heavy thuds are shaking us, even this far out to sea. The captain is calmly steering us along. Port tent, midships. One bright fire is burning on the port horizon. Our medical men have put on their steel helmets, and the guns are quieter. Perhaps the commandos have landed and are fixing them. The destroyers are holding their fire and sinking along beside us. The ships are spread out behind us in long lines with gun crews mounted, each flying a black flag and a white ensign. There are fighter patrols like flocks of geese high up, and the bombers are scurrying home in the low haze over the water. The fighters look like swallows, but in geese formation. It's now 5.50 in the morning. Fast troop-carrying ships are starting to pass us now. And there's a French chasseur carrying French commandos. The coast has suddenly loomed up in front of us with its white hills and its cliffs. And it looks like a race to see who'll get in first, get into action first. The sky is streaked with fighting pools, and so is the ocean. The destroyers are laying a smoke screen to windward, and now they're turning broadside and they're plastering the town with their guns. The smoke screen is lifting, and I can see ships everywhere. The small troop-carrying landing craft are moving in in lines under the artillery barrage. A spitfire has just crashed off our starboard bow and into the sea like a stone. We could see the pilot trying to get out, but he couldn't. The troops are heading for the beaches on either side of the town, the Royal Regiment to the left and the South Saskatchewan and Queen's Own Camerons to the right. The Hamiltons and the Essex Scottish are going in the center, and we're following. Two Messerschmitts have just tried to attack us, and the ship behind us has just shot one of them into the sea. 
Our top troop captain has come up to the bridge to warn the captain that it's only a few minutes until our zero time. He wants to get going. So we're hoisting our signal now, meaning we're shore bound. And in we go. It's now 6.45. Planes are everywhere overhead, but the shore guns are firing at us and at the small troop-carrying craft ahead of us. I can see casualties. Men are in the water. Our tanks are warming up and they're starting to climb the ramp, which will be lowered like a drawbridge when we reach the beach. Machine gun bullets are winding around us, but our guns are cracking, too, at the aircraft over us. A tank landing craft is getting its tanks off behind the troops storming the beach, and heavy bombs have just dropped astern of us. It's a heavy Junkers, and she's trying to stagger into shore. She's full of lead from our guns. The tank landing craft ahead of us got its tanks ashore, but she's sinking now, trying to get out. And we're being stopped by orders from going in. And destroyers are laying a smoke screen around us. There's a heavy German gunfire from a tobacco factory. I can see it sweeping the beach. Another Messerschmitt is down. The Ack Ack fire is wonderful, and a heavy bomber has just been driven off. He was trying to sneak in on our right, but a destroyer's guns got that, Jerry. Our tank men are disappointed, but now comes an order to try to go in again, and they're delighted. The German shore batteries are still active. They're firing at us. Four Focke Wolf bombers have just dived on us, and two of them disappeared in flame. Our, our barrage is unbelievable, and I'm covered in black suit. Shells are falling on all sides of us. We can't get into the beach, and we're ordered again to retire. Three pilots are coming down by parachute. Another tank landing craft has managed to get in, but has been hit. Some casualties have just been brought out to our ship, and the padre of the Fusiliers de Montreal told me about trying to get on shore. Men were killed all around him, and one lieutenant had a bullet in his arm while he was trying to push the padre down. It's now 9.25. The Germans on the cliffs are even throwing hand grenades in our ships below. Nine Heinkel bombers just passed overhead, and I saw their bombs leave the aircraft, but I was too interested to watch the gunfire and to care where the bombs landed. They were aimed at the destroyers ahead of us, but they missed them. We were heavily attacked again, and the convoy guns have just brought down two more Junkers. There's just a sort of flash of flame, and the bombers come down like leaves in the wind. And now dive bombers are attacking us. One of them has just been shot into the sea. Strong reinforcements of our fighters are arriving, and they're flying low around us to protect us from the dive bombers. We can't get into the beach. We've tried again, but bombs and gunfire are driving us out. I've just been knocked down by a heavy bomb. In fact, a stick of four bombs have very near missed to starboard. Some of our men are wounded. One of them is dead. Our fighters are wonderful, and they're fearless, and they're trying to protect our men on the beaches who are being re-embarked. Our aircraft are suffering heavily, and I've seen several come down in flames over Dieppe. The wounded are being brought off, but we hear that we have landed on every beach. Evidently, the engineers have suffered heavily, and were unable to blast away for the tanks for about an hour. And the tanks formed a square on the beach, and they're protecting our men from being re-embarked. The colonel of our tanks has attacked a machine gun post on foot. The South Saskatchewan's got in safely, but the Queen's own Camerons following them have been hit by six-inch howitzers, and there are casualties. I'm listening to our tank shortwave equipment, and I know they're fighting like fools on shore. I can hear one of our tank captains saying, come on over, boys, we're killing lots of Heinrichs. We're ordered to maneuver out of the harbor. It's afternoon now, but the destroyers are remaining behind just a few hundred yards off the shore, and they're sending in small boats to bring out our men who can get away. They're wonderful. We've been here eight hours now, and small craft are streaming out under bombs and gunfire. Well, those are just quotations from my notes as I wrote them down. I wish I could continue, but my time's up. I wish I could tell you about the journey home and the hundreds of stories I know about personal acts of bravery. 
I wish I could tell you now how we feel as we wait for final news. But I'm going to be broadcasting again later tonight with several other war correspondents who will be with me. And we may be able to give you the full picture then between us. It seems reasonably certain that our losses are as heavy as they were at Hong Kong. I hope you in Canada, despite those losses, will feel very proud that our men have been able to play at last the part they've wanted to play. I do know that they've fought well and that everything, things which seem to have exceeded the limits of human courage and endurance, have been done to protect our troops during the fight and to get them off after it was over. Those of us who have managed to get back, even wounded, feel very lucky indeed. It's been a bitter, hard fight. The Yorktown joined up with other carriers in attacking Jap forces. Our air group immediately hit one carrier with torpedoes and bombs. Later, it was reported this carrier sank. About this time, our fighters intercepted a large group of enemy dive bombers and fighters. All the sky was filled with falling Japanese bombers. The anti-aircraft fire of the supporting ships and the Yorktown was magnificent. Our gunners literally chopped the enemy planes apart. Every single dive bomber that came towards us was blown to bits, but three managed to make hits on us before being destroyed. By this time, our engines had stopped, but through superhuman efforts, our engineers got our boilers operating. But a swarm of enemy torpedo planes appeared. We avoided several torpedoes, but two dropped close aboard. We could not escape. The ship listed heavily. Soon it was impossible to stand on deck. I felt that the ship would capsize very soon. Reluctantly, I gave the order, abandon ship. The courage displayed by the officers and crew throughout the engagement is beyond my powers of expression. When I got aboard one of the rescue vest ships, I believed the Yorktown was stricken beyond repair. Later, however, I returned with a small salvage party. With the help of the destroyer Hammond, we were able to right the ship two degrees. We felt sure she would live. Then suddenly, four torpedoes fired from an enemy submarine outside our destroyer screen were sighted. We were heavily hit, and the destroyer Hammond alongside was sunk. As our destroyers were attacking the enemy submarine, our crew was transferred to a small tug to await the arrival of salvage tugs at daybreak. However, next day, from a companion ship, I saw the Yorktown slowly sink beneath the waves. Yes, the Yorktown went down. But the Japanese lost four aircraft carriers in that engagement and many of their best aviators. In the Yorktown's four short years, she destroyed more Japanese planes and ships than any other single United States ship. Tonight, the Yorktown rests on the bottom of the Pacific, but our name will be remembered as long as America continues to breed generations of freedom-loving, fighting men forever. The story behind the headlines. In cooperation with the American Historical Association, we again present Caesar Searchinger, noted foreign correspondent and writer, in an informal analysis of the news. Mr. Searchinger retraces the events of the past to help you in arriving at a fuller understanding of what is happening today. Mr. Searchinger's subject tonight is what's happening on Guadalcanal. Mr. Good Searchinger. Good evening. It looks as though Guadalcanal were to become a historic name. Ever since the U.S. Marines landed on this jungle-clad island in the Southern Solomons Group early last August, it has been singled out for special attention by our enemies. It now promises to become the center of a major operation which may determine the course of the Pacific War. 
After weeks of preliminary attempts and setbacks on land, on sea, and in the air, the Japanese sent a fleet to the north of Guadalcanal, which heavily bombarded our airfield and marine installations during the night from Tuesday to Wednesday this week. On Thursday, they were landing fairly large contingents of troops under the cover of their guns to the west of the territory held by our men. It now looks as though this is part of a full-scale offensive with the purpose of driving us out. During a previous attempt to land troops last Sunday night and Monday, the Japanese are said to have lost a heavy cruiser, four destroyers, and a transport. Three further cruisers and several other vessels hit tonight by U.S. Army bombers may also be lost. This brings their losses in this area up to well over 40 ships in the last two months, an investment which the Japs have evidently not made just for the sake of saving face. The landing of the U.S. Marines on the Solomon Islands on August 7 to 8 was the first offensive action of the United Nations in the Pacific and the first reconquest of enemy-held territory. The importance of this southern outpost of Japanese power is only beginning now to be generally understood. By the capture of Tulagi, parts of Guadalcanal and other islands, we have established an outpost well in advance of our defense line running all the way from Alaska to Australia. The cost of this outpost to us in terms of naval losses was high as the Navy disclosed early only this week, over two months after the event. For in the, pro in the operations covering our landings, we lost no less than four U.S. cruisers, besides the cruiser Canberra, pride of the Australian Navy, the loss of which was announced at the time. These ships were standing by, screening the landing operations of the U.S. Marines on Guadalcanal, Tulagi, and five other tiny islands. They were attacked by a swift-moving column of Japanese ships sweeping round Savo Island, eight miles offshore, firing as they went. But it was a hit-and-run affair. The Jap ships disappeared as quickly as they came and never really got within range of our transports and landing barges. The landing operations were completed within 48 hours, and by the fourth day, August 10th, the Marines had overcome all opposition on Tulagi and the small neighboring islands. On Guadalcanal, a much larger island, about the size of Long Island, lying some 20-odd miles further south, the problem was more complicated. The Marines took possession of a small grassy plain on the north coast, where the Japs had been building an airfield. It would be about the only possible airfield in the southern Solomons, which are steeply mountainous. Together with Tulagi Harbor, across only 22 miles of water, it would make a strong naval and air base, dominating the whole region. It would have been the terminal stronghold of the Japanese conquest at its farthest south. What we did was to go in and take that stronghold before the airfield was finished. The airfield then became the key to our position in the Solomons. But our men occupied no more than a strip of coastal territory about five miles long and running back to the wooded hills. Somewhere in those hills, in the jungle-clad plains to the east, were the remnants of the Japanese occupying force, living off coconuts. And they weren't left alone for long. While Japanese surface vessels, submarines, and aircraft continued to raid our positions, small parties managed to land and melt into the jungle to join their comrades at concealed bases. On August 20th, 700 Japs suddenly rushed up to the coast in speedboats. All but 30 were killed, the rest captured. All through September, the attacks continued. During the day, our bombers would range far and wide looking for Japanese ships and blasting Jap installations in the whole Solomon's area. But during the night, fast Japanese destroyers would close in, strike, land reinforcements, and sneak away. The Marines were kept busy hunting down these reinforcements as well as stalking the patrols sent out from the Japanese bases at night. In the night of September 12th to 13th, the reinforced Japs though devoid of heavy equipment, attacked, while large fleets of Jap bombers and fighters bombed our positions. The Japs were defeated and driven back into the jungle. But their patrols kept coming back, and pretty soon our flyers spotted Japanese transports duly escorted in the surrounding seas. The engagement last Sunday night, when the Japs lost six ships, was the result. 
Despite these losses, other Jap ships came back, indicating that a large fleet concentration was supporting the action from somewhere nearby. This time, they were able to land strong reinforcements, as well as guns, within shelling distance to the west of our camp, while our Navy was evidently not there to intercept. However, no full-scale fighting has yet taken place up to the Navy's communique issued, issued last night. Our Marines, we are told, have been reinforced from Army bases in New Caledonia, the New Hebrides, and the Fiji Islands, presumably by air. Their position is not easy, I mean the position of the Marines, for they are liable to attack from at least two sides as well as from the sea, unless we have naval forces in the neighborhood strong enough to beat off the Japanese ships. In the end, the mastery of the Solomon's Islands will be decided by the relative strength of opposing naval and air forces, which may even now be gathering for a clash. Seen in the perspective of the whole Pacific War, this Battle of the Solomons, like the struggle in the mountains of New Guinea and the air attacks in the fog-bound Aleutians, is a phase of what Hanson Baldwin calls the Battle of the Outposts. After the turbulent months of the great Japanese offensive, and the long drawn out effort of building up our supply lines to New Zealand and Australia, the two opposing sides have settled down behind something like two enormous lines of defense. The Japanese line reaches from Kamchatka in the icy north to New Guinea way below the equator in the south. The American line runs from Nome, Alaska, through Dutch Harbor, Hawaii, Samoa, and New Caledonia to the Australian coast. Each side has pushed forward its steely tentacles to certain advanced points. The Japanese to Kiska, to Wake, the Marshall, Gilbert, and Solomon Islands. The Americans to the Adrianoff Islands in the Aleutians, to Midway, and to the southeastern Solomons, to Lagi and Guadalcanal. These are the points of contact whenever there is fighting, which is usually swift and fierce. The forces engaged are relatively not large but they represent the spearheads of two opposing fronts stretching over thousands of miles through the vast Pacific space. So great are the distances, so far are the points of contact from any home base that the vast majority of ships and planes and men are employed, employed in maintaining and protecting the lines of supply. Besides, the island battlefields are so small, so difficult in terrain, and so scattered that only few soldiers are likely to get into action at any one time. But they nevertheless represent the enormous naval and military powers which make it possible to project the spearheads so far from home. To all intents and purposes, then, the tiny Solomon Plains and the New Guinea mountain trails today are the main focal points of the Great Pacific Front. The events of this week indicate that the Japanese are making this the ma a main theater of war. In New Guinea, it is true, they have been forced to retreat across the Owen Stanley Range, probably because Allied air power has destroyed their communications and their base. But this is not the first time the Japanese have been forced to give up their advance towards Port Mosby, only to reappear on another trail. The Japanese positions on New Guinea support the right flank of their action in the Solomons. They cannot afford to give up either. For if they lost New Guinea and the Solomons, they would open the way to a two-pronged offensive by the United Nations from the east and eventually from the west. On the other hand, the capture of Port Moresby and the recapture of the Southern Solomons are indispensable to the Japanese if they wish to consolidate their vast conquests to the north and east. For after all, the Japanese now have an enormous new empire to defend. This conquered area, if we include Thailand, stretches from Indochina to the borders of India and from the Philippines to New Guinea. It is a continental and island area of over two million square miles, more than half the size of the United States, with a population roughly equal to that of the United States. This does not include any part of China. By the conquest of the Chinese maritime regions, Japan has linked that empire to her earlier conquests of Manchuria and Korea and to the Japanese islands. This is, after all, the so-called co-prosperity sphere for which Japan claims to have gone to war. She holds it together very largely by means of her naval supremacy in the Western Pacific, a supremacy which is bound to be challenged sooner or later by ourselves and our allies. 
However, this challenge is not likely to materialize for some time. Aside from this, the Japanese Empire is vulnerable from three directions. From Vladivostok and Siberian bases in the north, from the Indo-Burmese frontier in the west, and from Australia in the south. Let's see which is the most imminent of these threats. The first, from Siberia, will not become an actuality unless war breaks out between Russia and Japan. Some time ago, when Japan was moving troops from southwestern China to the north, it looked as though she might have been getting ready for the long-discussed stab in the back. But the heroic stand of the Red Army at Stalingrad and on the Volga has probably not increased the Japanese zest for the job. The second threat from India is certainly on the cards, for sooner or later the Japs will have to be expelled from Burma if China is to be freed from her semi-isolation. Allied land and air power in India are steadily growing. But the mountains between India and Burma present appalling difficulties to the British as well as to the Japs. So the threat from that direction will probably not be serious until Anglo-American naval strengths are overwhelming in the Bay of Bengal. By the process of elimination, we come to the fourth threat against the Japanese from the Southwest Pacific. Here the tension has been rising ever since the aforesaid invasion of the Solomon Islands by the United States. It is the most immediate threat the Japanese have to face from any direction at the present time. That is what gives the action on Guadalcanal its importance in the global war. The events in the Solomons, in New Guinea, the situation on the Indian border and in the Siberian Far East, and the brutal struggle in the streets of Stalingrad are all part of the same pattern. Whatever may be the final outcome of that historic battle of Stalingrad, this much can already be said. Russia is not beaten to earth this year any more than she was beaten to earth last year when Hitler and his propaganda chief solemnly announced that she was. Last year, when he failed to take Moscow, Hitler was able to minimize his failure by pulling a large rabbit out of his hat, the entry of Japan into the war. This time the magician's hat is empty and the Japanese rabbit is running around on his own. Instead of the one totalitarian war of the Axis, we still have two separate and distinct wars. What the Japanese are concerned with, apparently, is, not, is the problem of holding what they have in the Pacific while Hitler prepares to hold what he has in the West. Both Hitler and his partner appear to be entering a war of position, whether they like it or not. That does not mean that they are on the defensive and that the offensive has passed to us. But Japan at least has lost one of the large strategic advantages she had ten months ago. She is forced to fight, not in order to advance, but in order to be able to stay where she is. She is using her forces not to conquer, but to hold. Even if she succeeds on Guadalcanal, she has lost time, men, ships, and resources to keep what she already had six months ago. And she can less afford to lose ships and resources than we. To grasp the offensive <coughs> against incalculable odds is the job of the United Nations in 1943. Our action in the Solomons is a modest indication of what is to come. Good night. You've been listening to Caesar Searchinger, whom we've presented in cooperation with the American Historical Association. This program came to you from New York. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Here we will stand and fight. There will be no further withdrawal. I have ordered that all plans and instructions dealing with further withdrawal are to be burnt. And at once, we will stand and fight here. If we can't stay here alive, then let us stay here dead. I want to impress on everyone that the bad times are over. They are finished. Our mandate from the Prime Minister is to destroy the Axis forces in North Africa. I have seen it, written on half a sheet of notepaper. It can be done, and it will be done, beyond any possibility of doubt. What I have done is to get over to you the atmosphere in which we will now work and fight. You must see to it that this new atmosphere permeates right down through the Eighth Army, right down to the most junior private soldier. 
Great point to remember is that we are going to finish with this chap, Rommel, once and for all. Now, my forecast of this battle is that there will be three definite stages. First, the break-in to the enemy's positions, then the dogfight, and then the break-out. We will do the break-in on the night of the 23rd of October. The dogfight battle will then begin and it will involve hard and continuous fighting. I believe that the dogfight battle will become a hard killing match and will last for 10 or 12 days. The enemy will crack, then will come the breakout, and that will lead to the end of Rommel in Africa. Make no mistake about that. In conclusion, our bombers, your bombers, functioned magnificently. The crews operated them with consummate skill and conspicuous bravery. The B-25 was selected for this mission because it was the best airplane in America for the particular job. That means the best in the world. Past wars... Past wars have been won on the battlefield. This war is being fought not only on the battlefield, but in the shop and at the desk. That country, or those countries, that can produce and man the greatest number of the best war planes, the quickest, will win. And remember, it doesn't make a bit of difference whether you're in the cockpit of an airplane or at the bench. If you do your job the best you can, your contribution toward the winning of the war is the same. Thanks for some swell airplanes. That's what General Doolittle and his men think of the B-25. Now, by means of KMBC's portable transcription facilities, let's see what the men and women who build these bombers have to say. Here we are at the North American plant, birthplace of the B-25, standing in a location known as the Final Assembly Line. From this place, we can see all kinds of airplanes in the various stages of completion. And just ahead of us, the giant door that swings open and sends these planes on into the air and into the battle zones, wherever they may be. Picking up in the microphone, I imagine the various effects of the industrial activity here as these planes are being completed, ready to be taken by our flyers into all of the battle zones all over the world. And standing around us now are some of the workers, the people who are putting these B-25s together, people who, whose lives now are dedicated to the purpose of keeping them flying. Next to us now is Mr. George Oakes, who is a carpenter here, uh, about how long have you been a carpenter, Mr. Oakes? Twenty-five years. Twenty-five years. That's a long time. How old are you? Sixty. And how long have you been working here for North American? Eighth and eighth. Mr. Oakes, eighth and eighth. That'd be about two and a half months. Two and a half months. <laughs> and uh, can you remember the first time you ever saw an airplane in your life? That's about twenty-five years ago. About twenty-five years ago. It doesn't look much like the ones we got nowadays, does it? No, indeed. Did you ever think you'd see the day when you'd be building them? I never did. How was it? A little strange to begin with? It sure was. What kind of work do you, uh, wood do you work with here at North American building these B-25s? Balsam. Balsam wood. That's a very light wood, isn't it? Yes. Did you ever work with it before you came here? Never did. Getting along all right now, though, aren't you? Fine. Well, here's something I'd like to know, and I know our listeners would, too. How do you feel when you know that the planes that you're building are being used by our flyers to bomb the enemies? Well, I uh, hope to see how soon they'll... Complete it and get it over with. Bomb them right off the earth, is that yeah, it? That's it. Thank you very much, Mr. Oakes. Good luck to you and your work, and believe you me, every one of us are with you. Over here, underneath the tail assembly of one of these huge uh, planes, it's in an incompleted stage, is a young lady who works here at North American on these B-25s. What is your name? Maureen Rule. And how long have you been building these planes? Three months. What kind of work do you do here? Engine assembly. Engine assembly. How'd you ever get started in that kind of work? I've always liked mechanical work. Uh-huh. Did you know anything about mechanics before you came to North American? Yes. I helped my stepfather work on cars at home, and then I'd taken a mechanical course before I came to North American. Mechanically inclined, in other words. Well, do you mind getting all greasy and dirty? Does that bother Not you Not a all? bit. I think it's a pleasure. You really do? Well, that's right. Say, uh, Maureen, what do you think when you see one of these finished planes head off for battle? I wish they'd forget I was a woman and let me fly them. Oh, you want to be a flyer. Have you ever flown a plane? Yes, sir. And you have a pilot's license? Private. Well, I see. How did you happen to start working for North America? Well, I've always loved airplanes, and I built models when I was a little tot. 
And then after I got big enough and thought they wouldn't let me build them, or wouldn't let me fly them, so I'd have to be content and help them build them. In other words, you want to build the planes that the men are flying to bomb the enemy. That's right. I understand that you have uh, several service stripes uh, that you've gotten while you've been working here. Yes, sir, I have 12. 12 service stripes. I wonder if you'll tell our listeners how these North American B-25 builders get service stripes and what the service stripes are. With a pleasure. Our service stripes are calluses that we get on our hands from handling our wrenches and our tools and from working hard to build a B-25 so we can get rid of our enemies. That's fine. The more service stripes, the less enemies we have. That's right. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to talk with you. you. Over here is Harold Groover, who is another of these B-25 builders. Uh, Mr. Groover, how long have you been working for North American Aviation? A little over five months. Uh, what was your occupation or profession before you started building planes? I'm an ordained minister of the gospel. You're a minister. And how did you ever happen to start working for North American? I was pastor of a church in Buffalo, South Dakota, and some of my men were being drafted, and others were leaving for defense work. And so I thought it would be a good idea for me to get into defense work, too, and at the same time continue preaching and thus do my part in the war. You want to build planes during the weekdays and spread the gospel on Sunday. That's right. Well, did you ever have any aircraft mechanical experience before you started to build these B-25? No, I never did have. I've been mechanically inclined, but that's as far as it went. Well, Reverend Gruber, I understand that every time the big back doors of this plant are open, it means another B-25 is to have a shot at Hitler. How does it make you feel to see these finished planes leave the plant and head for the battle zones? I like to see them roll out. It gives me a rather peculiar feeling to think of the death and destruction it's going to bring to people. But that's the only way we can win this war, so the faster we can get them out, the better it pleases me. Well, there's your answer, Mr. and Mrs. America. Those are the thoughts and the feelings of the people who are turning out the planes that are being flown by our brothers, our sons in the Army, men who in the days to come will make these planes ring bombs down on every enemy of democracy. Yes, a big step is being taken towards victory with each bomber that rolls off the assembly lines of North American. B-25 bombers whose cargoes of destruction for Hitler, Hirohito, and the like are necessary to win this war. But where do you come in? Let's join the crew of a B-25, possibly just after the takeoff, from Shangri-La. Well, boys, it won't be long now till we'll be laying these eggs on Tokyo. And if we do a good job on Tokyo, maybe we'll get a crack at Berlin. That'd sure be swell. Not but recording in the desert. The sound you can hear now is the noise of British tanks moving into battle. It's the night of Sunday, Monday, November 1st, 2nd. And it's the early hours of the morning. And here on this desert, with the sand clouds whirling up behind each vehicle, British tanks in large numbers are moving into battle. Shells by the thousands are being pumped into the enemy. And now here we are, at the side of one of these desert tracks, watching the armed might of the 8th Army go forward to engage the enemy. The moon, just half a moon, is shining down here. The starry night, and overhead, there's not only the moon, but the flares which have been dropped, which are shining down on the desert and illuminating this battleground. Tank after tank is going past, just a few yards from the microphone as I speak now. One can't see very clearly. It's rather like being in a fog. It is indeed a fog, but the fog is a fog of sand because the sand's very soft here, and each tank as it goes past turns up a great cloud. This is the BBC Home and Forces programme. This is Bruce Belfridge. Here's some excellent news which has come during the past hour in the form of a communique from GHQ Cardo. It says, the Axis forces in the Western Desert, after 12 days and nights of ceaseless attacks by our land and air forces, are now in full retreat. 
it's known that the enemy's losses in killed and wounded have been exceptionally high. Up to date, we've destroyed more than 260 German and Italian tanks and captured or destroyed at least 270 guns. World News Today, brought to you by Continental Radio and Television Corporation, makers of Admiral Radio, America's smart set. By shortwave broadcast, direct from world capitals, as well as the leading news centers of our own country, CBS correspondents are waiting to bring you a complete report from the world's political and battle front. But first, here's John Daly with a summary of headline news as received in New York. The American invasion force has made landings at Oran and Algiers on the north coast of French North Africa and somewhere on the west coast. These first official details came in a War Department communique released about an hour ago, which listed the generals commanding the American units under Commander-in-Chief Lieutenant General Ike Eisenhower. Among the commands are Brigadier General Jimmy Doolittle for air and one of America's foremost tank experts, Major General George S. Patton, commanding the forces landing on the west coast an indication that formidable armored units spearhead our attacks. The Vichy radio supplied some details of the landings on the west coast. They say that bridgeheads have been established both north and south of Casablanca, at Rabat in the north, and at Safi in the south. And from the French reports, it's apparent that landing operations of a major scale are going on. Vichy also confirmed the landings on the north coast at Oran and Algiers. The German radio, quoting Spanish sources, reports that additional Allied fleet and transport units left Gibraltar today. There can be little doubt that our invasion forces are large. The Vichy Radio estimates that we have thrown 140,000 men into the operation and adds that British divisions are already on the way to reinforce us. An earlier War Department communique made it clear that this operation has been carefully planned over a period of months and nothing has been left out. Vichy reports already admit that some French troops revolted against the Vichy command and there were broadcasts over the Casablanca radio reportedly asking Frenchmen to cooperate with the American invasion forces. We also have learned to use the fifth column. In Berlin, Adolf Hitler is right now making a speech on the eve of the 19th anniversary of the Munich Putsch. There can be little doubt that the German people are stunned by the invasion of Vichy North Africa by our troops. But so far in the speech, the best he has offered them is that he will prepare for all blows. CBS correspondent Charles Cullingwood is with the invasion forces, but as yet there are no communication facilities which he may use for a report. However, we can contact our correspondent in the other North African theater. For Cairo's reaction and the news there, we take you now to CBS Cairo, Winston Burdett reporting. It's all over but the shouting on this side of Libya. In the battle that knocked him out of Egypt, Rommel is believed to have lost at least three-fifths of his troops. The Axis armies crumbled as they fled, dropping huge pieces all the way to the border, jettisoning arms and men, abandoning whole units, especially Italian units, leaving hundreds of guns and tanks behind them and thousands of trucks and half a dozen valuable headquarters and many, many thousand dead. Somewhere between Matru and a place called Bagouche, German armor made its last hopeless stand. They had 28 tanks and three 88 millimeter guns in that fight. This was probably most of what they had left in tanks at that time. My own guess is that Rommel today has salvaged enough tanks to form a football team with possibly a few subs for the last quarter. Yesterday, British armored cars were still herding in the stragglers. Around Fuca, many German troops fell out and let themselves be captured. West of Matru, we were still picking up Italians by the thousands. I think this hall just about finished off the Italian armies in Egypt. Today, the British are tumbling west so fast that they have not been able to list the booty. We know now why the Luftwaffe has not been around for the past three days. Most of it is a blitz shambles lying around on captured airfields. Some of it is still intact. At one base, we found five Messerschmitt 109 ready to take off with gas tanks full and bomb racks loaded. Somebody left in an awful hurry, and why they didn't fly away, I don't know. We also found dozens of American trucks, which came over here in least Len days and were then captured by the Germans and used by them throughout the summer. One parking lot alone produced 60 vehicles, all with their ignition keys in place, and packed with the belongings of officers and men, who also were in a hurry to decamp, but then something happened and they found they were too late. Rommel now is falling back toward bases where he can pick up personnel and some extra supplies. But I can't see how he can make much of a stand in Libya. 
Rommel personally may make his next stop, Benghazi or Berlin. But the fight on this side of Africa is going to be pure desert chase for several weeks to come. And now you will hear Larry Lasser, who has just come here from Moscow. I've come to Cairo from another world. I came into a world of bright tropical sunshine, well-dressed people, and food aplenty. I left behind a world of drab gray monotone, of people in old clothes with set faces, a cold land of rain and snow squalls, the world that is called Moscow and Russia. Moscow and Cairo have at least one thing in common. They both believe that their war is the war. When they hear I come from Russia, everyone I meet, from officials to taxi drivers, asks me how the war in Russia is going. Then as soon as I start to tell them, they break in to tell me about the war which is nearest to them, the war in the desert. Today's new war, the American landing in French North Africa, was such a well-kept secret here that it came as a great surprise, and the ordinary man on the Cairo streets hasn't begun to grasp its implications yet. Up in Moscow, the Russian people probably haven't learned about the American landing. When they do, which will no doubt be tomorrow morning on their internal radio system with its loudspeaker in every house, They'll be pleased in a mild way. They'll be pleased to know the American war preparations have reached such a stage that we are able to take the offensive somewhere fairly near Europe. But there'll be no dancing in the streets of Moscow because nothing will really please the Russian people except an actual Allied offensive in Egypt, rather in Europe. Something they can really feel is taking the main burden of the German army off their backs. When I left Moscow after a year in Russia, I could see some bitterness. They really thought there was going to be a second front this year. The Soviet newspapers hinted at it constantly, and undoubtedly the average Russian feels let down. But there's still a good deal of sympathy for America's position. But underlying this feeling of disappointment, there's a fierce pride, a burning pride, which has much to do with the incredible Russian resistance at Stalingrad. That pride is going to go a long way toward holding up the morale of Russian civilians this winter. And it's going to be a tough winter. They're going to be short of food. Some people are going to go hungry. A lot of people are going to be cold. I left Moscow in a driving wet snow squall. But the heat hadn't yet been turned on in any Moscow apartment house. The people are going to be short of clothes. But by patching up their coats, they'll make them last another winter. They're going to be very short of shoes. More and more often, I heard the clack clacking of wooden soled shoes on the Moscow pavement. Everything is going to the Red Army. Prices of ration food are strictly controlled in Moscow. But in the public markets, governed only by the laws of supply and demand, prices of unrationed food have soared. A day's pay for a couple of pounds of potatoes. Almost a month's pay for a couple of pounds of butter. But of course, this gives the workers something to spend their rubles on. You see, every factory in Russia is turned to war production. There's very little a civilian can buy, except in the second-hand stores. Yet a few things are being done to make the Russian capital more cheerful this winter. Moscow has been dolled up with a new set of street lights that go far to dissipate the gloom of the long winter nights. There'll be more entertainments and shows this year because Moscow is now considered safe. The military situation is good. The Russian armies are intact all the way from Leningrad to Stalingrad. The main reserves of the Red Army were not used this summer in the small diversion offenses. Russia will have another opportunity this winter to train more reserves. More women will enter the war factories to relieve men for the front. But there's no getting away from the fact that Russia has lost an appreciable part of its ability to produce war machines with the loss of the Don Basin and the destruction of the huge factories at Stalingrad. Unless they can get a lot more tanks from America and England, it will be very difficult for them to launch a major offensive next year. But the Red Army has not lost its ability to engage a lot of German troops. The Battle of Stalingrad will reach a precarious point for both sides in about two or three weeks when the Volga freezes up and the fight in the Caucasus has a long time to go on. But the Russians have a saying. Russia and summer don't get along well together. But the Red Army will be in action this winter, because winter belongs to Russia. And now to CBS in London. Bob Trout reporting. 
London spent this Sunday trying to fit together the pieces of information always so teasingly meager at the start of an operation. Allied headquarter announcements are released in Washington at the same time as here, but London is still getting most of the news of definite place names from Vichy Radio. And Vichy tells us the harbor and town of Algiers have been attacked, landings made and a foothold gained, and the situation is serious. 200 miles and more to the west, about halfway between Algiers and Gibraltar, the port of Oran has been attacked. Two places, a few miles on either side of Oran, have been occupied. That's the Mediterranean front. Around on the Atlantic coast, says Vichy, the airfield at the capital, Rabat, has been attacked from the air. Next most important port in Morocco, Casablanca, has been attacked from both air and sea. Vichy also reports landings at two places along the 60-mile stretch of coast between these two cities of Rabat and Casablanca. And some 140 miles farther down the Atlantic coast, an important force has been landed at Safi. Vichy Radio, heard in London, makes it clear that the Vichy government is still helping Germany. And Vichy complains that radio is being used as a weapon. They claim that secret radio stations are using the wavelengths of French North African stations. And they insist that General Giraud's spectacular broadcast was a fake. There is no reason at all to think it was a fake. And that's a very brief sketch of what London knows about the African operations so far. London also knows that these long-planned operations on the northwest corner of the African continent have been timed to fit into the British Eighth Army's victory over the Axis nearer the northeast corner of Africa. Royal Air Force attacks from this island, like those of the last two nights on Genoa, are part of the battle of North Africa and the Mediterranean Sea. Next to CBS New York and John Daly. And here is a message from our sponsor. Picture yourself inside a submarine of the United States Navy. A critical moment is at hand. Stand by, torpedo room. Ready, sound room. Give me a bearing. One, five, six. One, five, seven, eight. Range 1700. Stand by, torpedo tube. Set gyro at 120 degrees. Fire on 160. Oh. 159 160 Fire A torpedo cuts through the water, speeds toward a Jap warship, rips a jagged hole through the hull. Yet not one member of the American submarine crew has seen the enemy ship. Many of the wonders of the radio equipment used by Uncle Sam's fighting men in locating enemy targets and directing attacks against them. Admiral workers in both great admiral plants are proud to be building as much of this equipment as they can. The same workers whose skill earned Admiral Radio the reputation of being America's smart set. Admiral will continue to work 100% for the war effort until we've won the victory. This means no more Admiral Radios can be built for civilian use. But most Admiral dealers still have a limited supply of the famous Admiral Victory Line. The latest model Admiral Radios and Admiral Radio phonograph combinations with automatic record changes. Ask your Admiral dealer to demonstrate them for you. Now, here again is John Daly. We have heard the latest developments from the newly opened and the old war theaters in North Africa. Now to another war zone, the Southwest Pacific. Admiral Radio takes you to CBS Honolulu, Webley Edwards reporting. News of the great British drive and of the American Expeditionary Force in Africa hit these Hawaiian Islands with an enthusiastic reception. But let this be one voice to shout that there still is a bitter war in the Pacific against a powerful foe. To highlight the fight in the Southwest Pacific, let me introduce Lieutenant Chester Buds of Housatonic, Massachusetts, who has been both co-pilot and pilot of a flying fortress. He has just arrived in Hawaii after more than 60 missions in the Southwest Pacific. The kind of fighting our flying men are doing in the New Guinea area makes veterans of men in a few months. Lieutenant Bud, in all your flights, what is most memorable? We took off one dawn in a fortress looking for Japanese ships. Off the coast of New Guinea, we started a Jap convoy. They cut loose with an anti-aircraft, and then we came face to face with ten Jap Zero. Well, what did they do? They spread and came in from all directions. Our top gunner, Sergeant Ben Hale, blew up one of them. We fought them for ten minutes more. Then our tail gunner, Sergeant Bob Forsyth, blew a Jap pilot right out of his plane. Both he and the plane dropped to a crash. Well, Lieutenant, uh, any of your men wounded? 
Our side gunner, Sergeant Gradle, was wounded, but he kept shooting. In about two minutes, our bottom gunner, Sergeant Bob Curtis, smashed another zero. Got wounded, but kept on shooting. How long did you fight them? We fought them for an hour. Heading for Port Moresby. Fifty minutes of fighting, and our radio operator, Sergeant Jim Clark, blew up a fourth zero. And then the rest of them peeled off and turned back. What was your damage? They put about 300 bullet holes in us, and about 15 cannon holes. They knocked out two of our four engines, shot away the oil pressure, one of the aileron cables, and flattened one tire. We came over the Owen Stanley Mountains on two motors and into Port Moresby in the midst of an air raid. With only two motors, all we could do was to go in, and we did. We were plenty glad to be back on land. Our wounded men were both okay, and that's the way the fighting is in the southwest Pacific. And plenty right in it. Lieutenant Leonard Hummerson, Lieutenant Buds, Lieutenant Ernest Reed, and the Sergeants Hale, Clark, Freeman, Forsyth, Gradle, and Curtis were decorated with a silver star for gallantry in this action. Yes, America, there's still a tough war to be won in the Pacific. Robert Edwards in Honolulu returning you to Columbia in New York. Much of our news of the North African situation is coming from Washington, where the War Department has issued several communiques, and the Navy has given out more news of the fighting of, on Guadalcanal since we've been on the air. For the latest developments, Admiral Radio turns now to CBS Washington, Lee White reporting. The War Department has just announced that American forces are now landing at Oran and Algiers on the Mediterranean coast of Africa and at another unannounced spot on the Atlantic coast. The same communique also reveals that Major General Mark W. Clark is the Deputy Commander-in-Chief of the current operations in North Africa. Also, that Brigadier General James H. Doolittle of Tokyo fame is the Commander of American Air Forces in the operations. Major Clark is a relatively young man to hold the rank of Major General. He is only 46 years old. He has, however, seen service in France during the last war when, as a captain, he was wounded in action. At the same time, the War Department makes public a message sent to General Eisenhower by General George C. Marshall, Chief of Staff of the United States Army. The message was dispatched to Eisenhower before his departure for England for the North, uh, for the North African Theater. It reads, You and your command sail with the hopes and prayers of America. For months you have planned, trained, and conditioned yourselves for the great task ahead. Godspeed to your success. I have complete confidence in your leadership and in the aggressive fighting quality of your troops. And here's a communique that's just been handed to me, a, a, a communique on naval operations in the Solomons. American forces on Guadalcanal have advanced four miles beyond Coley Point, east of Henderson Field, to the Metatono River without meeting any Jap opposition. The communique also reveals that one Japanese destroyer was believed to have been sunk in action off Guadalcanal and that one cruiser and another destroyer were badly damaged. The cruiser may have been sunk. Last night in the White House, as we listened to the President's Secretary, Stephen A. Early, read off to us the proclamation of the American invasion of Africa, most of, most of the reporters present were inclined almost to shout for joy. To say it was the best news since the beginning of the war would be a gross understatement. To most of us, it was the best news in several years. I make no pretense of having suspected what was coming. I, frankly, was probably just as surprised at what we'd done as Adolf Hitler probably is today. And I think most other observers here in Washington would agree with me. It's not so much that we were joyfully surprised at learning American forces had invaded French Africa. We had suspected for several days that something of the sort would happen. But what really surprised us was that everything had been so obviously well-conceived and well-coordinated. The American people owe our Army and our Navy a debt of gratitude today. They've shown us that they know far better how to fight a war than most typewriter strategists. But if many of us underestimated the strategical ability of our military leaders, an overwhelming majority of us underestimated the common sense, I'm afraid, of our State Department. Since the bombshell burst last night at 9 o'clock, the picture of America's part in the war has become increasingly clear. It's like a cool, bright morning with the sunlight driving away the fog and mist of the preceding night. There's much, of course, that still can't be revealed. But it can be revealed that our policy in connection with Vichy has had the following aims. One, to obtain reliable information from week to week of the political situation in France. Two, to maintain close relations with the French people and to spur resistance. Three, to keep alive the French faith in America and our common democratic traditions. Four, to gather all military information available. Five, to prevent the French fleet and French military and naval establishments from falling into the hands of the Germans. And six, and finally, to pave the way for a military campaign to drive the Germans out of the Mediterranean. 
In other words, from the evidence first available today, it seems that our government was counting on a Mediterranean campaign from the very day of the Franco-German German armistice two summers ago. That campaign began at 9 o'clock last night. It's the real second front. I now return you to CBS New York and John Daly. Next, an analysis of the North African military moves by Columbia's military expert, Major George Fielding Elliott. A great plan of United Nations offensive grand strategy unrolls slowly before our eyes. Its first phase has been virtually completed in Egypt with the smashing of Marshal Rommel's Axis armies. The second phase is in progress at the other corner of North Africa as American troops land on the Mediterranean and Atlantic coasts of the French possessions there. At or near Casablanca, Rabat, Oran, and Algiers. So far as our present information goes, perhaps at other places yet to be announced. Marshal Pétain has ordered the troops in French North Africa to resist our forces. It remains to be seen whether they will or can. Vichy reports that some fighting has already taken place, but calls the situation serious. There are indications that a revolt is in progress in French North Africa, with some military elements participating. Vichy claims that a rising at Casablanca has, put, has been put down, but admits that one battalion is still holding out. A broadcast on the Algiers radio calling on all Frenchmen to join hands with the Americans is credited to General Henri Giraud, formerly a prisoner in Germany, who escaped from German hands last summer. The military significance of these reports may be very considerable, for if the French troops are divided in their allegiance to Vichy, it will be almost out of the question for anything like prolonged resistance to be offered to the powerful American forces now landing on the coast of French North Africa. There is no immediate indication of any attempt by Axis forces to interfere with our operations, though the heavy British raids on Genoa may be interpreted as interference with any such possible move. The French fleet is reported from Berlin to be at Toulon with steam raised. This may be Nazi wishful thinking. In any case, there appear to be ample British and American naval forces present in the Mediterranean to deal with the French fleet, should it, unhappily, attempt to cover the movement of any Vichy or Axis troops toward the African coast. The seizure of the principal seaports in Algiers and Morocco will also prevent any reinforcements from arriving for this purpose. No further report has been received of the Allied convoy, reported yesterday from Vichy as steaming eastward beyond Algiers and nearing the Strait of Sicily. This may be the force which has now attacked Algiers itself, or it may represent either a descent on the Tunisian naval port of Deserta or even a direct assault on the great Axis supply base at Tripoli itself. Here's Warren Sweeney with a word from Admiral Radio. In the war between the states, the Shenandoah fought an engagement two months after the war. Such an event couldn't happen today. Radio keeps troops and units in constant communication. Radio serves many military purposes, and Uncle Sam needs every radio device which can be manufactured, so take care of the radio set you now own. Most Admiral dealers still have a limited supply of new Admiral radios and Admiral radio phonograph combinations. But when this supply is exhausted, no more will be available until after we've won the war. Ask your Admiral dealer to help make your present radio last for the duration, whether it bears the Admiral name or not. Admiral dealers have every facility to give you service, whether your set needs a new tube or a damaged cabinet rebuilt. In peacetime, Admiral became the world's largest manufacturer of radio phonograph combinations with automatic record changers, partly because Admiral dealers were men upon whom the public could rely. In wartime, that confidence may be doubled, for Admiral dealers realize the importance of radio here at home. World News Today is brought to you each Sunday at this hour by Continental Radio and Television Corporation, makers of Admiral Radio, America's smart set. Be sure to listen next Sunday when Admiral again will give you World News Today by shortwave, direct from the leading news centers of the world. Americans, this war is a matter of life or death. Don't pull your punches. If you've not already signed up for 10% in war bonds on the payroll savings plan, sign up now. Let that be your fighting answer to the enemy. Warren Sweeney speaking for Admiral Radio. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. The WBBM Air Theater, Wrigley Building, Chicago. CBS World News takes you now to London for a special broadcast by Mrs. Franklin D. Roosevelt, who will be interviewed by CBS correspondent Bob Trout 
at the opening ceremonies of a new club for merchant seamen somewhere in Great Britain. <laughs> this is Scotland. It's 8.30 in the evening, a dark night in Glasgow, Scotland's great fort on the River Clyde. Here tonight, in a building that was a hotel just a week ago, there's opening a club for American merchant seamen. The first American merchant sailors club in any foreign port, but not the last. Glasgow's club is the beginning. It's the first of several to be established in British ports, and there will be other clubs in other countries for the men who sail the seas under the American flag. Since early morning, American seamen have been coming into the club to register for the 150 beds which were being used by hotel guests just a week ago. In a week, the building has been transformed by British workmen rushing the job for the United Seamen Service under the auspices of the War Shipping Administration. And now tonight for the opening, the guests are gathered in what, beginning tomorrow, will be the club dining room. A picture of the President of the United States is on the cream-colored wall, and the American flag hangs behind the speaker's platform. And here on that platform are the guest of honor, Mrs. Franklin D. Roosevelt, who has just come over to Scotland after her trip to Northern Ireland, Mr. P.J. Noel Baker, Parliamentary Secretary to the Ministry of War Transport, the Lord Provost of the City of Glasgow, Mr. John M. Bigger, wearing his chain of office, and Mr. Charles Hogan, the War Shipping Administration's representative in the United Kingdom. First, here is the Lord Provost. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I have pleasure in introducing to you Mr. Newell Baker, who is the Parliamentary Secretary of the Ministry of War Transport. Mr. Baker. I've come to Glasgow to represent the British government tonight. The officers and men of our Merchant Navy have been shown amazing kindness in the United States. Kindness which neither they nor this nation will ever forget. It would make us very happy if we could do as much for your seamen here. It would make me very happy if this club and hostel were the gift of the ministry from which I come. But your government, through Mr. Hogan, is making such magnificent provision for your seamen in every port to which they go, that there's nothing left for us but the small acts of administrative and personal friendship by which we try to show the gratitude we feel. Any help that we can give you, Mr. Hogan, official or personal, is yours to command. Apart from saying that, my task tonight is very simple. It is first to bring to your guest and opener the greetings of her multitudinous British friends. <laughs> Mrs. Roosevelt, our people have made you welcome, not only because you're the first lady of the United States, not only because you're the partner of a man to whom we owe so much, They've made you welcome for yourself because you've touched their minds and hearts, because they've recognized in you a great woman citizen of the world. And here in this northern port where the people live by shipping, where day by day our great armadas come and go, they make you welcome also because before all else you are a Roosevelt. All the Roosevelt. All the Roosevelts have always been happiest on the sea. The first President Roosevelt loved ships and sailors. The present President Roosevelt so loves the sea that he even chose a warship on the ocean as the place to sign the Atlantic Charter, the greatest instrument of human freedom in the history of mankind. Second, in the name of my ministry, of the British government and of the British people, I have to greet and thank the American seamen who are here. We know now that the United Nations are already stronger in every way than the Axis can ever hope to be. But we know also that our strength will not avail us if we lose our lines across the sea. And we know all too well the risks which merchant seamen run. At sea, this war is far more terrible than the last. 
and its dangers the American merchant seamen must daily face. Not long ago, I came here to Glasgow to meet survivors from the summer convoys to northern Russia. Those men had faced scores of U-boats. They were attacked by torpedo-carrying aircraft flying almost wing to wing. They were bombed. Always they had the nightmare of frostbite from immersion in the Arctic Sea. Many of them had had their vessels sunk, had been bombed on shore in Russia. Some on their voyage back, back had been sunk again. Yet my memory of them is only of their courage, their laughter, their desire to get to sea again. Only yesterday there came into my ministry some stories of their gallant deeds. I'll give you two, in the plain, unvarnished, official language in which they came to me. A second officer showed good seamanship and courage in severe conditions by keeping 21 survivors alive and in good heart on rafts for 13 days in the Arctic seas. An engineer displayed outstanding courage and devotion to duty in the engine room with water pouring down the ventilator. Mrs. Roosevelt, already the United States have played a mighty part in winning the victory which lies ahead. Patan, the battles of Midway Island and the Coral Sea, the fortresses over France, the American Air Force in Egypt, the President's brilliant new triumph in French North Africa, none of these things do we forget. But we know that it's on the sea that the greatest American contribution has been made. American shipbuilders, American ships, American seamen have saved the cause of freedom from defeat. Twenty-four years ago today, the armistice was signed which silenced the drum fire along the front in France. What will happen this time? Shall we have to fight again a quarter of a century from now? No. We are resolved with your president, your congress, and your people that this shall be the last war for human freedom. We are resolved that at long last it shall bring to us and to all men freedom from fear and oppression and ignorance and want. And when the fighting's over, I hope that none of our governments will forget the debt they owe to the merchant seamen in whose hands, above all others, the cause of freedom lay. Ladies and gentlemen, I have the pleasure of introducing to you Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt, wife of the President of the United States of America. The success of our allied arms has been and is dependent upon the production and increasing production of the, work, of the workers in America and in Britain. In this, the most important industrial area of Scotland, we have great responsibilities for the production of munitions of war. And we are pleased to receive Mrs. Roosevelt here in order that may, she may be informed of the intensity of the efforts of the workers on the Clyde to do their duty as they expect the men in the field to do theirs. Tonight, we are opening a hostel for those members of the American Merchant Navy who, in the prosecution of their duties, have become beleaguered on the high seas. This place will be to these men a center of comfort and friendship and give to them a sense of homeliness and the home comforts to which they can look forward when the catastrophe is overcome. A great pleasure in calling on Mistress Roosevelt to address you.
Ladies and gentlemen, it's a very pleasant thing to be in Scotland and in Glasgow. And I hardly could fail to realize that the workers here who know what it means to serve on the sea will work as hard as they can to make it really safe to be on the sea again and have those seas free for the world to sail. I am very happy to be able to dedicate on this side of the water the first club for American merchant marine seamen in the British Isles. In a way, this is just a continuation of the ceremony, which I attended on the other side of the Atlantic when Major and Mrs. Kermit Roosevelt donated their home for the duration of the war to be used as a recuperation center for torpedoed seamen. It seems to me that no men have more courage than the men serving in our merchant marine. Yes, yes, yes. Many of them have lost their lives in getting goods across the water in these dangerous times. And yet, they go on manning these ships, which carry the supplies across the seas, and without which the war could not be successfully waged. They have little public recognition, and yet among them, there are many heroes. They know what it is like, not only to be torpedoed and thrown into the sea, but to be machine gunned and to be picked up after having spent hours in the icy waters of the North Atlantic. They know what it is like to suffer from thirst under equatorial suns. They have seen their friends suffer and die beside them. And yet, they go back to do the job that needs to be done. I'm glad that this first club is only a beginning and that more are planned in every great port in the world so that men will be able to find beds and food and cigarettes and papers wherever they land. They will hear American voices and be made welcome by American people. And they will have the companionship of other seamen who have known the same dangers and shown the same courage. Let us hope that the day is not long distant when the men who sail the seven seas may find it an adventure to see new countries, but not look constantly for an enemy lurking beneath the water or in the air. I believe that we are seeing now the beginning of the end of Axis domination in the Mediterranean. And this in itself is vastly important, for it means more supplies sent to Russia to aid her in her magnificent defense of our country. Easy access from the Atlantic on to India and the possibility of bringing to play against our enemies, the Japanese, certain forces which they thought were safely stopped by Axis domination of the Mediterranean. The island of Malta, which has been so heroic, may at last have relief. Greece may be fed, and the war may march forward to its inevitably successful end. I congratulate the United Seamen Service on the beginning which they have made in meeting the needs of our valiant merchant seamen. And I wish them all good luck now and in the future. CBS World News has brought you Mrs. Franklin D. Roosevelt speaking from Glasgow, Scotland. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. World News Today, brought to you by Continental Radio and Television Corporation, makers of Admiral Radio, America's smart set. CBS correspondents are waiting to bring you a complete report from the world's political and battlefronts. But first, here's John Daly. Admiral Radio takes you at once to CBS Algiers, Charles Collingwood reporting. 
Algiers is a beautiful city. To the thousands of British and American troops here, it is a vast show place with everything in it fascinating and exciting and different. It's not like any city these boys have ever known. In the central section of the town, the buildings are modern. They're big white buildings, half European, half Muslim in architecture with minarets and lattice works and gay colored tiles. Through the streets, there walks a constant colorful procession. Arabs in their red feathers and baggy native dress, barefoot Muslim women with only their eyes showing above their white veils. And through it all stroll American soldiers, hundreds of them, their eyes wide open, taking it all in. I stopped on a street corner this afternoon to talk to a couple of them. One of them shook his head. I've never seen anything like this except in pictures, he said. And the other one looked at him and said, I've never seen anything like this, period. And then both of them stopped talking to shake hands with some young Frenchmen who just wanted to come up and let them know that they were glad that the Americans were here. Up in the native quarter, the Casbah, as they call it, piled up on the hill, house above house, the scene is even stranger. The Casbah is another city, a city within a city, full of little houses and twisting narrow streets that run steeply up the hill. By day, it is crowded and picturesque. By night, it is silent and mysterious. I got lost up there last night. There was no soul to be seen, only the green eyes of cats gleaming in the night and the feeling that behind the closed doors and shuttered windows, there were, there were eyes watching you pass. This, then, is the Algiers that American troops are sightseeing in and working in today. It's a friendly city. In the week that we have been here, we've turned the civil administration back to the French. The French are running the city now. We are their guests. That is the way we try to act, and that is the way they treat us. We are honored guests. The French are doing everything they can to help us. You can't even ask your way in Algiers without three or four people jumping on the running board of your car and taking you there themselves. And this broadcast, this broadcast, if it hadn't been for the heroic efforts of the French officials who operate Radio Algiers, it would never have got out and we don't even know now whether it is going out. I'm broadcasting tonight from a tiny, bare little hotel room. It's the only place we could find. There's a French engineer here who presides over a portable outfit that he brought in here yesterday. He's doing four things at once, and he's been doing it for hours. If we get on the air, and I say again, I don't know whether we are, it's because of these Frenchmen of Radio Algiers who have surmounted a thousand difficulties to help us. So today, Algiers lies white and gleaming under the African sun. It's a happy city. A good deal happier, I think, than before we came. But this is a military operation we're engaged in here, and there are a lot of soldiers in Algiers who don't have time to look at the sights. When the Americans took Algiers, they laid a stepping stone. Now the British First Army is here, and the First Army is beginning to step. General Anderson said yesterday that the job of his first army was to kick Rommel in the pants, and he means to do it. It's going to be a hard job. General Anderson knows it, and the first army knows it too. They have vast distances to cover, and they've got to cover them fast. The Germans are trying to consolidate in Tunisia, and they're trying to throw up a barrier between this first army of General Anderson and the eighth army of General Montgomery. So far, the Germans have landed what they call here a considerable air force in Tunisia. They've also landed some ground troops, and they're pouring in more both ground and air just as fast as they can. It's the job of the First Army to get there before the Germans can be strong, and the First Army is racing just as fast as it can. So far, the advance is a matter of seizing ports and airfields like the one at Bone and leapfrogging from them toward the enemy. Any day now, the main body of the First Army will begin to roll, and when it does, its advance will be rapid and spectacular. This is Charles Collingwood in Algiers, returning you to CBS in New York.
And now for more news of the whole North African and Mediterranean area, Admiral Radio takes you to CBS London, Bob Trout reporting. In London, just as in the United States, everyone is trying to keep up with the swiftly moving military and political events in the Mediterranean theater. In the rush, it's hard to fit the details into their places in the right perspective, and meanwhile, other news events, which would usually be big news, are lost in the shuffle. Here in London, we've been listening constantly to Radio Morocco and to Algiers. The political situation down that way is obviously still very, very difficult. In London, the strange case of Darwan looks not one bit less strange tonight. On the military side, all seems to be well, but of course, the hardest times are still ahead. The statement from number 10 Downing Street this evening says that 13 U-boats have been destroyed in the fighting off French North Africa, while Rommel's total losses by casualties and captured to date are now estimated by General Alexander as 75,000 Germans and Italians. We heard Radio Morocco, in American hands, say today that American troops crossed the Tunisian frontier last night and that they are making rapid progress toward the cities of Bizerta and Tunis. We've heard since then from Algiers that British and American reconnaissance parties have penetrated across the border into Tunisia, seeking the best way through the passes for the First Army, which is advancing as fast as possible. Apparently, most of General Anderson's British First Army is still on the Algerian side of that frontier, moving ahead on land, sea, and air as one unit. The British Broadcasting Corporation's observer with the First Army says that General Anderson describes the capture of the Bone Airfield as a good example of British-American cooperation. This Bone Airfield was taken by British parachute troops with a few Americans, all carried by American pilots, in American planes. Simultaneously, the Royal Navy landed a mixed body of commandos. General Anderson said to this BBC observer, a long period of strain, very hard living and hard fighting faces us. This is no picnic. Some of the American parachute troops in action in this theater are the ones who flew direct from Britain, led by their Colonel Edson Raff. Not very long before these parachute troops left, I flew with Colonel Raff and his men over the English countryside, but not very high over it. And they were all eager, very eager, to get over the training period and to start jumping into a real battle. One thing they told me fits in perfectly with General Anderson's words. They said, the serious work of parachute troops begins after they have hit the ground. The capture of Bone Airfield has provided a first-class base for the Royal Air Force. Many of the British pilots flying from Bone got their experience flying from Britain in sweeps over northern France, and now they're knocking down the Axis planes on another front. On the other side of Tunisia, Britain's Malta-based aircraft are taking part in the battle by attacking the enemy-held airfield at Tunis. And the Royal Air Force twin-engine fighters from Malta have made another successful low-level attack on this Tunis field. In a moment or two, we shall hear from General Alexander's zone of the Mediterranean, where the British 8th Army is scarcely more than 200 miles along the coastal road from the Axis base of Benghazi. But in the few moments remaining to me in London, let me see if I can explain a little bit more in this period about the political situation which I was telling you about. Last night, CBS was able to bring you the first American broadcast from French North Africa since the landings. In it, Columbia's correspondent, Charles Collingwood, told us that the political situation is indeed still difficult. There's great allegiance to the established doctrine of Marshal Pétain. That is why, said Mr. Collingwood, Darlan's appointment as head of the government has been so well received in French North Africa because Darlan is so closely connected with Pétain. I've reported to you before on how the mystery of Darlan looks from London. Now, Radio Algiers in American hands is broadcasting French language announcements in the name of the Marshal, head of the French state. At the same time, the Jun-controlled French news agency on the continent is telling us that the French admiral commanding the French fleet at Toulon, on the wrong side of the Mediterranean, has just taken the oath of allegiance to the marshal, head of the state, meaning, in this case, that the French fleet will not try to escape from the Germans. And now the time is up in London, so next to CBS Cairo and the report of Winston Burdett. وكان يخطب مؤتمرا دوليا فقال 
ينبغي أن نطرح كيف يصيغ هتلر في وجه العالم regret that technical difficulties have made it impossible for us to get the report of Winston Burdett from Cairo, but here in the CBS World News headquarters, we have the latest press dispatches which say that RAF fighters shot down at least seven Axis planes and damaged many more between Tunis and Sicily yesterday, raising their bag to 20 in three days of assaults on the enemy's North African transport shuttle route, and meanwhile, the British land forces in Libya drove within 180 miles of Benghazi in pursuit of the shattered Africa Corps. An official announcement said that most of the latest Axis ferry planes, which of course are headed for Tunis, have been knocked down. And there is a report that these transports, when attacked, give off a great concentration of fire, indicating that they are carrying German troops packing Tommy guns. The first attack was made at 10.15 a.m. yesterday when RAF fighters caught up with a flight of 35 of these transports, covered by 12 Nazi Messerschmitt fighters off Cap Bon in Tunisia. At 12.45, they pounced on another formation, and they have been attacking these formations all day long. Pursuit of Marshal Erwin Rommel's hapless desert troops, meanwhile, reached the eastern side of the Libyan hump at Tamimi, some 180 airline miles from Benghazi. The British 8th Army is pounding its way on to one of the greatest victories of this war. Some hundreds of miles to the north in Russia, the latest German attempts to break through to the Volga in northern Stalingrad met with some initial successes, but the Red Army, in some of the heaviest fighting in recent weeks, cut off a Nazi wedge in the factory district and went on to smash attack after attack. The Germans threw masses of infantry heavily supported by tanks at a narrow sector which was only about 700 to 800 feet in width. After hours of fighting, this force broke through on one street, but Soviet counterattacks closed the gap before the Nazis could pour through. The Nazis are making what may well be their last try before winter forces them to retire. In the central Caucasus near Nalchik and on the Black Sea coast front above Tuapsa, the Russians are improving their positions generally. If Hitler hoped to cover Nazi reverses in North Africa with successes in Russia, he has failed once again. Even the German High Command communique today obliquely admits that the Red Army is holding its own all over Russia. And now, here is a message from our sponsor. Only a few months ago, a flying fortress flown by Captain Parcell and his crew of United States Army Air Force men was over the Philippines. Inside the plane, these commands were heard. Bombardier. Bombardier reporting, sir. Bearing target. Take over. One degree to left. Hold on course. Bomb bays open. Bomb bays open. Bombs away. Captain Parcell and his crew, in the air 32 hours, stopped two Jap invasion forces sunk loaded Jap transports, and knocked down Jap Zero fighters. Such men deserve the best possible equipment, as much of it as they can use. For them, for others like them, Admiral workers in both great Admiral plants are working, building the finest, most dependable radio equipment they know how. And while Admiral workers build equipment, Admiral dealers act to keep civilian radio sets in perfect condition. Admiral dealers are specialists in radio servicing. Regardless of the brand name your present radio carries, let your Admiral dealer help you make it last for the duration. Or, if you need a new radio, ask him to show you the new Admiral Victory line. Most dealers still have a limited number of both Admiral radios and Admiral radio phonograph combinations with automatic record changes. Once you've seen and heard an Admiral you'll know why it's considered America's smart set. And here again is John Daly. We turn next to the Pacific, where the past few days have produced important developments. Admiral Radio takes you now to CBS Honolulu, Webley Edwards reporting. On the night of November 12th, last Friday night, East Longitude Time, a series of naval engagements began between forces of the United States Navy and the Japs. These actions continued through Saturday, with our Navy's communique saying that both American and Japanese forces suffered losses. 
It was obvious at once that no details concerning the battle would be forthcoming while the battle was in progress. For to release such details would provide the enemy with information of great value to him. Thus, there's no statement this morning from the Pearl Harbor headquarters of Admiral Chester W. Nimitz, Commander-in-Chief of the United States Pacific Fleet. The Admiral and his staff are calm, confident, and very busy. This sea battle is continuing. And while it is more of a series of encounters rather than a full-dress single battle, it is of major importance. The Japs would like to drive our land forces from Guadalcanal Island and its precious airfield. To do this, they must protect their men and supplies with their naval forces. Our Navy is seeking the sea forces wherever they can be found. There's plenty of rugged action in the South Pacific. To give you an idea of what goes on in this vast sweep of ocean and island-dotted area, it must be remembered that there have been, since the Coral Sea battle last May, more major naval actions out here in six months than there have been in all the previous history of modern navies combined. And considering long lines of supply and the vastness of the area, there have never been any naval battles quite like these in the Pacific. We have to win them the hard way. Successes in New Guinea give our Army planes a clearer area from which to strike at enemy supply bases, transports, and their escorts. As with all America, Hawaii was electrified at the great news of the rescue of Captain Eddie Rickenbacker and his crew in the Pacific somewhere between here and Samoa by a flying board of the United States Navy. It is not known whether these hardy survivors will be brought here to Hawaii. The good news from North Africa continues to cheer our fighters out here in the Pacific. Don't forget them. There's a big fight going on out here against a tough enemy. This is Wobbly Edwards in Honolulu returning you to CBS in New York. Here at home, there has been considerable confusion over the political implications of the occupation of French North Africa, as there has been in London, particularly in regard to the status of Admiral Dallon, former French commander-in-chief. Washington has further news on that. So Admiral Radio takes you now to CBS Washington, Lee White reporting. There's been no War Department communique so far on developments in North Africa, but it's reasonably certain that American forces are now attacking are about to attack the German-held airdromes and other strong points in the vicinity of Bizet and Tunis. There's reason to believe there are about 10,000 German troops in Tunisia and that more are coming in as fast as they can be ferried across the Mediterranean from Sicily. Only the position of the naval commanders at Bizet seems doubtful, and they may well have decided to side with the Allies following Admiral Darlon's recognition as chief of government in all North Africa. As Charles Collingwood told you last night, in the first broadcast received from Algiers, pro-Vichy sentiment was much stronger throughout North Africa than we at first anticipated. Bob Trout has just told you how the Darlan situation looks in London. Here's how it looks in Washington. Whatever Americans may think of Marshal Pétain, it's obvious that the old man was respected to the point of reverence by large numbers of influential political, military, and naval leaders throughout Morocco and Algiers. And all these people remained loyal to Admiral Darlan as Petain's right-hand man. It's becoming increasingly evident that General Eisenhower was faced with a dilemma either of signing an immediate armistice with Darlan or facing the prospects of continued Vichy resistance. He seems to have chosen the former alternative for two reasons. First, in order to avoid useless bloodshed and the necessity of wasting 50 or 60,000 American fighting men in policing unfriendly territory, and second, in order to be able to enter Tunisia as soon as possible. Morocco and Algiers were pacified several days ahead of schedule, and now, thanks to our agreement with Darlan, complete order reigns, and it's possible for our army to go ahead with the investment of Tunisia without wasting a single moment of very valuable time. Tunisia is the keystone to our occupation of the African coast of the Mediterranean. And now here's Columbia's military expert, Major George Fielding e Elliott, with an analysis of the situation in the South Pacific. The Japanese appear to be making a renewed attempt to establish naval control of the waters around the embattled island of Guadalcanal. What success they are having, if any, is as yet uncertain. It is quite possible that they may be beaten off once more. But even if they are, we should understand that they will keep coming back and keep trying until they are finally deprived of the means of doing so, which means deprived of the basis from which such attacks can be launched. In other words, there is no victory to be chalked up for us in this part of the world until we have taken all the Japanese bases on New Guinea and New Britain, as well as their remaining footholds in the Solomons. And to do this, we must gain command of the sea so that we can move troop ships. If all this can be accomplished, 
We shall then have 600 miles of open sea between us and the next nearest Japanese bases in the Caroline Islands. And we can consolidate our positions for further operations. It will then take a major Japanese effort to get at us. While we shall have excellent new submarine bases for attacks on Japan's vital overseas communications. But as long as the Japanese remain close at hand, as they are now, with the support of their big advance base at Rabaul, making possible the continuing assembling of effort, the hit down the long line into the Solomon, we shall have no rest on Guadalcanal. The Japanese will not give us any. Their whole idea appears to be to prevent us from getting comfortably set in the southeastern Solomon so that we can launch new amphibious attacks to gain new footholds. And it is a very sound idea from the Japanese point of view. They have been willing to make great sacrifices to carry it through, and they are continuing to do so. One countermeasure which we are taking may prove to be of unexpected value, and that is the American-Australian advance on the mainland of New Guinea. The Japanese, having lost the mountain passes and their advanced position at Kokoda, have now been driven from Wairope by the Australians, while an American force is approaching the Japanese coastal base at Buna. There seems to be a distinct possibility that the whole of eastern Papua is about to fall into our hands. And this, if true, menaces the Japanese in the western Solomons and all the approaches from Rabaul toward Guadalcanal. But the real decision will be at sea, and not until we have been able to gain the upper hand there can we expect any decisive results in the southwestern Pacific. Merely beating off Japanese attacks will serve no permanent purpose. We now return you to CBS New York, and John Daly. And that's World News Today. Now here's Warren Sweeney with a word from Admiral Radio. Do you know what radio goniometry is? Well, probably not. But the United States Army Signal Corps does. For radio goniometry is the science by which it locates enemy radio stations. Hundreds of radio terms and devices are unfamiliar to us, yet vital to the armed forces. If you could walk through the Admiral plants you would see many of these radio devices in the process of being manufactured. Thousands have already been delivered. Many more will be. For Admiral's facilities have been pledged 100% to the war effort until victory has been won. This means, of course, that no Admiral radios, no Admiral radio phonograph combinations are being made for civilian use today. However, most Admiral dealers still have a limited supply of the new Admiral victory line. If you do need a radio, see your Admiral dealer. The Victory Line is comprised of the finest radios and radio phonograph combinations Admiral has ever turned out. See for yourself why Admiral, in peacetime, became the world's largest manufacturer of radio phonograph combinations with automatic record changers. World News Today is brought to you each Sunday at this hour by Continental Radio and Television Corporation, makers of Admiral Radio, America's smart set. Be sure to listen next Sunday when Admiral again will give you World News Today by shortwave, direct from the leading news centers of the world. Americans, this war is a matter of life or death. Don't pull your punches. If you've not already signed up for 10% in war bonds on the payroll savings plan, sign up now. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. The WBBM Air Theater, rig the building, Chicago. World News Today, brought to you by Continental Radio and Television Corporation, makers of Admiral Radio, America's smart set. By shortwave broadcast, direct from world capitals, as well as the leading news centers of our own country, CBS correspondents are waiting to bring you a complete report from the world's political and battlefront. But first, here's John Daly with a summary of headline news as received in New York. It is clear now that the Russians look for more than the lifting of the siege of Stalingrad. They're out to smash the German armies. Today's noon communique from Moscow announced that the surprise offensive of the Red Army on the central front west of Moscow widened breaches gouged out of the German lines and continued its advance against stubborn resistance. How deep the penetration is was not stated in the noon communique, but a special communique issued earlier announced a breakthrough which isolated Veliko Luki, 280 miles west of Moscow and only 90 miles from the old Latvian frontier. The statistics of the damage done to the Germans on the Central Front indicate that the successes before Stalingrad are being repeated. According to the Russians, 300 populated places have been recaptured on a breakthrough 20 miles wide. 10,000 Germans have been killed and five Nazi divisions routed. Perhaps even more important, two vital German supply lines in the area have been cut. One is the east-west rail line running from Moscow to Riga, the other a branch railroad running southwest from Velika Luki to the town of Nevel. 
The fighting west of Moscow demonstrates beyond all doubt that the Red Army is strong enough to sustain a winter offensive. The Nazis long ago built a powerful line of fortifications west of Moscow, fortifications that were constructed by Fritz Stott, who built the Siegfried Line to protect the French-German border. And it's these fortifications that the Russians have cracked. Meanwhile, at Stalingrad, the Russians continue to advance northwest and southwest of the city. Although the noon communique gave little detail, it did say that in the past 24 hours, another 2,300 Nazis were killed on two sectors northwest of Stalingrad, and 64 Axis planes were shot down. Later in the program, Larry Lasseur, CBS correspondent, who has just come home from Moscow, will give his first uncensored report of our Russian allies. On the other fronts in the West, an Allied communique has announced the occupation of Jadeda, a rail center 12 miles northwest of Tunis City in Tunisia, and says that operations are proceeding satisfactorily elsewhere. And now for a first-hand report of the Tunisian fighting, Admiral Radio takes you to CBS Algiers, Charles Collingwood reporting. GMT. I'll give you that check which is coming up now. This is CBS in North Africa, time checking for CBS in New York. 1832 coming up in 10 seconds. In five seconds, four, three, two, one, what? 55 now. That was 1832 GMT. I'll be going ahead in a minute and a half. Oh, come on, New York. You have just heard Charles Collingwood, the CBS correspondent in Algiers, checking through with our offices here in New York, and you heard his report saying that we would hear from him in a minute and a half by our clocks. Until that time, we can give you some more news of the activity in North Africa. Although the reports from Libya say that there is no land activity and little air activity, the slim details that we do have of the fighting indicate that the Allied forces in Libya and in Tunisia are working together, and that the air forces are going ahead of the land forces acting as artillery, softening up the German spots and hammering at their supply line. It's very much the type of action which preceded the British Eighth Army's great offensive at El Alamein, which crushed, as you know, Ronald's Africa Corps. An earlier report from the CBS correspondent in Cairo said that the leaders of the two allied forces in Africa, the forces in Libya and Tunisia, have conferred recently at General Eisenhower's headquarters, indicating that the two forces are working very closely together. And now we will make another attempt to get the report of Charles Collingwood direct from Tunisia. For that first-hand report of the Tunisian fighting, fighting that is going on at land perhaps heavier than we know, CBS Algiers is called in. Charles Collingwood reports. signal from Algiers seems to have failed. Either that or technical difficulties are offering too much interference. We'll see if we can pick it up later on. Meanwhile, we take you to CBS London. Bob Trout reporting. This is CBS in New York calling CBS in London. Go ahead, Bob Trout. We regret that the circuits with Europe seem to have failed for the moment. We will come back and try and pick them up again. Meanwhile, the news here at home is news of new activity in the Lucians, where the Navy says the Japanese have reoccupied Atu. But the war news is shared here at home with a terrible tragedy in Boston. Fire swept through the Coconut Grove, a nightclub in the Hub City last night, and up to the present it's known that 431 people lost their lives. It was the third most disastrous single fire in modern history. And now for a report from our own capital, we take you to CBS Washington, Lee White reporting. It's been evident for some time past that we're fast approaching a manpower crisis and that very little has been done to avoid it. Congress has been doing a lot of talking, but adequate legislation has yet to be drafted. Meanwhile, it appears that President Roosevelt has decided to solve at least part of the problem by reorganizing his cabinet. 
rumors of the past few days have been confirmed, at least to the extent that the president has offered the Department of Labor to Harold Ickes, now Secretary of Interior. If Mr. Ickes accepts, it's understood that he would assume control of both manpower and selective service, as well as routine labor administration. Friends say that Mr. Ickes is reluctant to give up his beloved Department of Interior, especially for a job so full of dynamite as that of labor czar. But he will obey the orders of his commander-in-chief if the president sees fit to insist. If Mr. Ickes does accept, he will relieve Madam Secretary Perkins, who will probably be appointed Director of Social Security. Paul McNutt, now manpower czar, but with none of the authority accompanying czardom, would replace Mr. Ickes at the Department of Interior, it's understood. One reason for so much undercover negotiation seems to be that the Army is opposed to unified civilian control over both labor supply and the draft. General Somerville is said to believe that the Army should have control of both. But Mr. Ickes is said to have made it clear that he wouldn't consider taking over manpower control without similar control over the draft boards. He believes, and so it appears as the president, that labor supply and selective service are both integral parts of the same problem, that neither can be solved independently. This solution of manpower control is said to please both government officials and congressional leaders who've advocated centralized control for some time, but apparently it doesn't please the War Department. Advocates of the cabinet shift point out one further advantage to the plan of making Mr. Ickes czar of both labor supply and the draft. As Secretary of Labor, they say, Mr. Ickes would become a member of James F. Burns' Economic Stabilization Board. And thus, Mr. Burns and Mr. Ickes would be vested with sufficient authority to coordinate manpower control with control over wages and prices. As John Daly has told you, the Japanese have succeeded in reoccupying Atu Island in the Aleutians. The Navy communique gives no details, but merely reports that flying fortresses on Thanksgiving Day bombed a small cargo vessel off the island. Three hits were scored and the ship was sinking when last seen. Army fighters which accompanied the flying fortresses strafed enemy anti-aircraft installations on the island. On Guadalcanal, the Navy says, there's nothing to report except minor patrol activity incident to the consolidation of our positions. Yesterday, Solomon's time, United States aircraft carried out a night attack on enemy shipping in the Munda Bay area of the New Georgia Islands. Recently, minor enemy activity had been observed in this group, and Japanese destroyers had shelled several villages. A simultaneous War Department communique announces that Allied forces have occupied the rail center of Jededa, only 12 miles outside Tunis, and operations are said to be proceeding satisfactorily around Matur, 25 miles south of Bizet. Yesterday, the War Department says, we bombed the airdrome and docks at Bizet, causing considerable damage. Ten, airplanes were shot ten enemy planes were shot down in dogfights over the city at a loss of only two planes of our own. The War Department adds that the enemy twice bombed Bonn yesterday. Three out of a flight of eight German bombers were destroyed, and later one out of eight Italian bombers were shot down. I now return you to CBS New York and John Daly. Here in London, I mean rather here in New York, we find that our circuits with Europe have been reinstated and we will attempt to call our correspondents in Europe in for their reports. For the first of the reports from overseas, Admiral Radio calls in CBS Cairo, Winston Burdett reporting. This is Mr. Morrison speaking from Cairo. This is a beautiful season in Egypt, the best time of the year. The weather is like mid-spring at home. In every backyard, rusty chrysanthemums and poinsettias are in bloom. The army has gone into winter uniform and has acquired that comfortable feeling of superiority that comes with a new suit. We have just had a great victory in battle, and they're beginning to hand the medals around. The brass hats get to be commanders of the bar, and the aviators put up the distinguished flying cross. And now and then, somebody back in England or New Zealand gets a package with a Victoria Cross in it to remind them of an unlucky relative. Did you ever see a fellow win a medal? I saw Lance Corporal Baker win a medal. I know Baker better than I know a lot of friends back home, but I have to stop and think to remember that his name is Bert. I call him Cock, and he calls me Uncle. In peacetime, he used to work in a laundry, and now he drives a truck and he cooks. And in his spare time, he practices American. He talks like a movie gangster. He drove his cock into a mess of German mortars one day near Merzimatru. 
and people were getting hurt all around. And the mortars were blasting him personally at Baker. And Baker was using horrible language at the mortars while he moved his truck into position to shield the removal of a badly wounded Scott captain who was very bloody and who probably is dead by now. And Baker got blood on his soldier suit. And he was gentle as a girl with the wounded officer. And all the time, the language he was using was not fit for a dying man to hear. But the Scott wasn't listening. And then Baker climbed into his truck again and moved over to another truck that had been disabled. He got out and hitched up a tow line while the mortar bombs kept making loud noises. And he towed the truck off up the road, swearing, swearing like a baker. So they announced today that Baker has the military medal. I left him in Benghazi three days ago. I kind of hesitate to go back. It must embarrass Baker to be an official hero. This is Chester Morrison returning you to CBS New York and John Daly. Now here is Warren Sweeney with a word from Admiral Radio. Have you ever stopped to think how important your radio has become? Not only to you, but to your country as well? This is a total war. We are all in it, every man, woman, and child. What we do on the home front has a direct bearing upon the success of our men on the fighting fronts. Radio not only brings us many pleasant hours of entertainment, it tells us how to fight the battle here at home, the importance of getting in the scrap, the whys and wherefores of rationing, the urgent need for blood plasma by the Red Cross. Do you want to know how you can help win the war? Listen to your radio, then act. Yes, that radio of yours is mighty important to Uncle Sam these days. That's why Admiral dealers throughout the country are standing by to lend a helping hand when something goes wrong with it. Admiral dealers have the experience and facilities to put that radio of yours, regardless of make, back in perfect operating condition promptly and economically. See your Admiral dealer. He's nearby, waiting and wanting to help. Now here once again, for Admiral Radio, is John Daly. While the past week did not produce any sensational developments in the Pacific, there was plenty of news of our continued offensive against the Japanese. For that news, Admiral Radio turns next to CBS Honolulu, Webley Edwards reporting. With the first anniversary of Pearl Harbor at hand, America can take new pride in her Navy as a result of the Pacific Fleet's recent major victory in the Solomons. A first-class disaster was visited upon the Japanese fleet there between November 12 and 16. Recognition has rightfully been given to the battleships, cruisers, and destroyers, and their personnel who blew the Japs out of the water in the two night actions off Savo Island. But equal credit is due to the tough crew of Navy, Marine, and Army flyers who've been fighting out of Guadalcanal for nearly four months. It was the ceaseless efforts of these lads who've made it possible for our forces to retake Guadalcanal with its important airfield and to hold it against everything that Japs could throw at them. The success of their stubborn defense of our vital toehold on the road to Tokyo made our great sea victory possible. Now, the spearhead of this crew has been Lieutenant Harold Swede Larson of Birmingham, Alabama, and his pilots of Torpedo Squadron 8, he has just returned from the Solomons, where he and his men took part in every action within range of Guadalcanal since last August. He's right here beside me. Lieutenant Larson, I thought uh, Torpedo Squadron 8 was wiped out in the attack on enemy carriers in the Battle of Midway. No, not all of us. Lieutenant Commander John Waldron, who raised us all from pups and who we all admire greatly, went in with 15 planes in that attack. The only survivor was George Gay. We also had six planes operating from Midway Islands, led by Lieutenant Langdon Feverling. They made a torpedo attack in the same action and were all lost except one plane. Our detachment, held in reserve, was later reinforced and embarked in a carrier and sent to the Solomons. We supported the attack and occupation of the Guadalcanal Tulagi area, August 7th and 8th, and were in the carrier action against the Japs August 24th. Shortly thereafter, we were based ashore on Guadalcanal. How many attacks have you been in, Lieutenant? Our squadron has been in 40. I've been in 27. Many of these have been bombing attacks as well as torpedo attacks. Uh, how many ships have you hit, Lieutenant Larson? Our squadron has hit 14. The last one we hit was on November the 15th. Well, that was after the two night ship battles around Savo Island then. 
Yes, the remnants of the Jap forces were then scattered up and down the groove and trying to escape to the north. Our job was to go out and pick off the stragglers. We hit a Congo-class battleship and a transport. Some days at Guadalcanal, we didn't fly. Other days, we made as many as eight attacks. I'd like to introduce my executive officer, Lieutenant Bruce Harwood, a very capable pilot and admirably suited to the tough flying conditions we faced at Guadalcanal. Where's your hometown, Lieutenant Harwood? Claremont, California. My wife's in Coronado. Now, what about these flying conditions Lieutenant Larson mentioned? They're not so bad. Just the usual tropical weather, lots of rain and no visibility. Plenty of mud, and about half the flies and mosquitoes in the whole world. We had a lot of fun out of it. It was a pleasure to be there and to operate daily so close to the enemy. Incidentally, our gang operated out of Guadalcanal longer than any other outfit. It was almost continuous bombing and shelling. Our pilots held up in great shape. Flight crews also did a grand job. Isn't that right, Swede? They certainly rate a lot of credit. So do the engineering and ordnance crews. They're the boys you don't hear much about, but we couldn't have operated without their excellent work. Right now, a few of us are having a short breathing spell and a chance to say hello to a few people. And then we're going back to take another crack at the Japs. And that's the word from a man who has just been in the thick of the Pacific fighting, cracking the Japs. Lieutenant Harold Swede Larson. With him is Executive Officer in Navy Torpedo Squadron 8, Lieutenant Bruce Harwood. All kinds of good luck to you. This is Wobbly Edwards at Pearl Harbor. And now here he is with his own story of the astounding Russians, Larry the Sir. The great Russian offensive, which Premier Stalin originally planned to drive the Germans out of Russia this year, is now taking place but it's taking place later in the year than Stalin planned. Last May 1st, you remember, he ordered the Red Army to push the invaders out of Russia in 1942. At that time, he was thinking in terms of a United Nations second front in Europe this year. But a lot of unexpected things happened last summer while I was in Russia. The Russians had become overconfident. They didn't expect the great German surge across the Don. And Great Britain did not expect the early German advance in Egypt last July. America did not count on the German submarine and air force strength to sink so many ships. But although Russia used up some of her best divisions in the defense of Stalingrad, the Soviet Union was not compelled to expend her mighty reserve armies. They remained fresh and intact. Now she's throwing them into the battle. Plenty of American equipment is going into the present offenses too. We piled a lot of stuff into Russia this year, and the Russians were hoarding it until this moment when they judged that the Germans in the South were exhausted. But we must not forget that the great German armies holding the line in Central and North Russia have seen little action this summer. They are still immensely strong. The first stage of the Russian offensive around Stalingrad is completed. The next phase will take longer. The German army trapped on the open plain between the Don and the Volga must be exterminated. This could take a short time if the Germans were inclined to surrender. But Germans rarely surrender, as long as they have food, ammunition, and shelter. But that's exactly what they will not have on the bleak steppes. Here there are no trees for firewood, and the iron-cold winds from Siberia pile the Russian snow ten feet deep. If the Germans could supply this army by transport plane, they could, conceivably, pull through. But Germany's great weakness lies in our overworked air force the Germans will undoubtedly try to break their way through this Russian ring. It's the new Soviet offensive on the Central Front which is the most remarkable. Here the Russians are scoring appreciable gains against a fresh German army which did not see much action this past summer. You see, there are really two worlds in Russia, Russia in summer and Russia in winter. The only people who understand winter are the Russians. Centuries of mere survival in the terrible six-month frost have better race whose vitality is their greatest attribute. They don't need so much equipment to run a winter offensive. When the snows really get deep, tanks won't work well. This may prevent the Russians from making really decisive gains this winter. But they'll kill a lot of Germans. And now a few words about the Russian civilians, and they deserve it. When I left Moscow, they were getting one square meal a day, if they worked. If they prefer to stay home as dependents, they are deprived of their entire fat ration. 
Matter of fact, they might have a hard time cooking at home because to save fuel, the gas is turned off in Moscow for days at a time. Last winter, entire blocks of apartment houses had their electric lights turned off for solid weeks. The workers sat in the dark from the time they came home until the time they went to work in the early morning. But still they carry on, alone. Soviet internal propaganda has fostered their pride and nationalism until it burns with a white glow. Years of deprivation have given these people their strength. If Soviet Russia had devoted its great industries to making creature comforts, the Russian people would have been happier, but they also would have been conquered. That was Larry Lasseur, CBS correspondent just returned from Moscow. Now, here's a message from Admiral Radio. Picture American dive bombers flying over an enemy fleet. Suddenly, the radio on every plane barks a command. Bombing three. Target contacted. Form echelon. One by one, the planes peel off, dive, release bombs. And another Jap cruiser heads for Davy Jones' locker. Today, Admiral Assembly Lines are building the radio equipment which makes such coordinated actions possible. Equipment that gets the message through regardless of altitude, below zero temperatures, the crushing speeds of dive bombings. Every owner of an Admiral radio has proof in his own home of Admiral dependability. Dependability that made Admiral in peacetime the world's largest manufacturer of radio phonograph combinations with automatic record changes. When victory is ours, look again to Admiral for the finest in radio entertainment. To Admiral for America's smart set. World News Today is brought to you each Sunday at this hour by Continental Radio and Television Corporation, makers of Admiral Radio, America's smart set. Be sure to listen next Sunday when Admiral will again give you World News Today by shortwave, direct from the leading news centers of the world. In spite of what you may have heard or read, this country is critically short of rubber. That, not a shortage of gasoline, is the reason for gasoline rationing. So when rationing starts Tuesday... Obey the spirit as well as the letter of the law. To do so is to help your country. Always share your car and go twice as far. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. The WBBM Air Theater, Wrigley Building, Chicago. World News Today, brought to you by Continental Radio and Television Corporation, makers of Admiral Radio, America's smart set. By shortwave broadcast, direct from world capitals, as well as the leading news centers of our own country, CBS correspondents are waiting to bring you a complete report from the world's political and battlefronts. But first, here's John Daly with a summary of headline news as received in New York. A year ago today, at exactly this time, World News Today began with these words. The White House has just announced that Jap planes have attacked Pearl Harbor. This means war. In the days that followed, an angry nation could only guess at the damage the treacher treacherous blow had caused. Today, we know the full story. And today, we can be filled with pride that our armed forces, fighting a terrible uphill battle in the Pacific, have already paid back in some measure for what President Roosevelt has called a day of infamy. The sneak attack, to all practical purposes, eliminated our Pacific battle fleet at the time. We know now why the Philippines could not be reinforced. We know now why a pitiful handful of American and Allied cruisers were sent out to face a Jap battle fleet in the Netherlands East Indies fighting. Those were black days, but they are well behind us. A few weeks ago, a rehabilitated American fleet, though heavily outnumbered, handed another Jap battle fleet in the Solomon area, a licking it will never forget. And just now, the Navy Department issued a communique saying that we have killed better than 400 more Japs on Guadalcanal. We'll have the full details from Washington shortly. A year ago, we, had, we may have been among the it-can't-happen-here boys. But now we have gone back to the old American tradition. Put your faith in God and keep your powder dry. One of our allies has a good reason to celebrate today. It's the first anniversary of the start of the Russian winter offensive last year that saved Moscow. Then the Germans were within 18 miles of the city. Today they are on the receiving end of heavy Russian attacks on front 130 to 250 miles west of Moscow. In the last 24 hours, 10,000 Germans have been killed, and 160 guns and 54 tanks destroyed. The Nazis are putting up stiff resistance, and it's clear that reinforcements have been poured into the Stalingrad area where the Russians admit the Nazis are using heavy tank forces. But there is every indication that the Red Army is still moving ahead, and that the German position is critical. Their army is still inside Stalingrad, but today's reports indicate that they have been pushed back into the northern and southern outskirts of the city in the last ten days. 
On the central front, the Nazis are using big fleets of air transport to bring up men and supplies. One Soviet anti-aircraft battery shot down 12 of them and damaged seven more. Generally, the exact position west of Moscow is confused. But there is reason to believe that Rzhev, the key to the German defenses, is surrounded. As at Stalingrad, the Germans are counterattacking desperately, and the Russians describe the fighting as particularly bitter. German attacks succeeded in capturing two of three villages, but Soviet counterattacks took the villages back, and field dispatches covering the fighting west of Moscow said that three more basic points in the German defenses near Rzhev and two near Velikia Luki had been cleared of the Nazis. Yes, this is a day of celebration for the Russians. Much of their country is still in German hands, but they have blasted the myth of the invincibility of the German Wehrmacht and with confidence have set out to destroy the despoilers of their country. In North Africa, the Allied lines near Teboba and Jadeda are straight and unbroken as the fighting grows in intensity and Allied reinforcements pour up to the front. French and American units moving forward in the southern sector are reported by the Morocco radio to have captured a new Axis fortified position near Sfax. Now for a direct report, Admiral Radio takes you to CBS Algiers, Charles Collingwood reporting. This is Charles Collingwood at Allied Force Headquarters in North Africa. No part of the battle for Tunisia is more important than the battle in the air. And General Doolittle's boys of the 12th Air Force are doing a magnificent job. Here in the makeshift studio that we've rigged up in Allied Force Headquarters, we have a couple of boys who are very lucky to be here. Wouldn't you say you were lucky to be here, fellas? Well, I'll say we were. You're not kidding. That was Lieutenant Dave Slater and Sergeant Ray DeVilla. Both of them from Houston, Texas, and both of them flying in the same bomber. And that laughter that you heard in the background came from the rest of the crew who were all packed in here watching Lieutenant Slater and Sergeant DeVilla getting ready to tell us how it came to be that they're all able to be here. Well, come on now, Slater. You're the pilot. Tell us about it. Well, you see, this is our first combat mission. You mean your very first? That's right. Well, this has nothing to do with the story, but were you scared? Well, I was scared. I don't know about the rest. You know, I was scared. Well, I'll bet you were. Well, let's get on with it. Where were you going on this first combat mission? We were bombing Gators. We had an escort of P-38 pursuit. We got over the target. We ran into an awful lot of anti-aircraft fire. And remember, Lieutenant Slater, that's when we all stopped being scared. That's right, Avila. And it was just as well, too. Because to make a long story short, we got hit. You got hit? Bad? Well, bad enough. I could feel this light start hitting us, but I didn't know where until I looked down at my pressure gauge and saw the port engine wasn't working. So what did you do then? Well, uh, let me tell him. Okay, the villain, you tell him. You see, the way we were hit, a medium bomber came flat far. This center fighter kept us in the air as long as we could, but we finally had to get back on an even eel and land. Anybody hurt? No, sir. We hit it about 150 yards. And then we all jumped out and nothing worse than losers. We kind of played a kind of noses. We kind of housed the co-pilot from San Diego, California. We kind of put him, the navigator from Wilma, Arkansas, Sergeant Duran, the way stunner from Muscatine, Iowa, and Sergeant Fleshman from County, Oregon, who's our tail gunner. All okay, but we were all miles behind the enemy line, right out in the desert. Well, what did you do then? We started taking this thing out of the plane and getting ready to burn it. And then the air starts popping up. Wait a minute, Ray. You haven't said anything about the P-38 yet. Oh, yes. I should have said we saw this P-38 from our escort circling around above us. Then it went off, we hope, to get help. Well, what about these airs that popped up? Well, they kept arriving from nowhere in particular, and by the end, we collected about 25 of them. Were they friendly? They kept seeing a Marikeen or Ali Mon. When we finally convinced them that we were American, everything was fine. But they don't like the Germans, huh? These fellas didn't. But they called us comrades. Oh, there's another word they use, eh? Oh, yes. They kept saying Ike Ike or something like this until this moment. I still don't know what it means. Well, well look, one thing that I haven't got straight yet. Uh, how far was all this from the German garrison at Davis? About 20 miles. 20 miles? And how long were you there? Two hours and 41 minutes, and that was long enough. Well, how did it finally end? Oh, simple enough. One of the ARAC said, shh. And we all listened, and we heard some airplane motors. Then we saw a light bomber and two P-38s coming our way. The bomber saw us, landed 
landed on that awful rough desert and tacked it right up to it. That's right. And we found Hollow of Seattle climbed out and said, Jump in, boys. Jump in quick. And I'll bet you did, too. And what's in? What happened? Then Lieutenant Hollow just set fire to the our plane, and the P-38 finished it off with incendiary bullets. And we were off. Nothing to it. If you ask me, there was plenty to it. And I'm darn glad that you fellows all made it and could be here tonight. We return you now to CBS in New York. On the old North African front, for several days, the dispatchers have been reporting a lull in the fighting. Today's report had nothing to say about the land fighting. And it's true that there hasn't been much land fighting since Marshal Rummel and his fleeing Africa Corps hold themselves up in the natural defenses of El Aguila. But actually, there has been no lull in the battle for Libya. There haven't been many tank and infantry clashes of any great consequences, but fierce air fighting is in progress for control of the Mediterranean, and Cairo is doing its part to help the Tunisian campaign. And now for further news from across the Atlantic, Admiral Radio takes you to CBS London, Bob Trout reporting. From Britain, flying fortresses attacked the locomotive works at Leo this afternoon. The weather was clear and good results were seen. At the same time, Liberators attacked the airfield at Abbeville. Squadrons of Royal Air Force, United States Army Air Force, Dominions, and Allied fighters gave protection. Seven enemy fighters were destroyed. One of our fighters and two bombers are missing. Sir William Beveridge spoke to a big meeting at Oxford today and drew for his audience a picture of a new Britain after the war. To think of this now, he said, is not to neglect the war. Victory in war and victory in peace are inseparable. Then he named five specific evils to be attacked. Want, disease, ignorance, squalor, and idleness. What Sir William Beveridge urged today at Oxford is the setting up of an economic general staff to make a national design for the use of Britain's national resources. Of course, none of this is going to come easily. And that's all right with Sir William Beveridge, who said, there are no easy times ahead in war or peace. Who wants that? London Sunday newspapers appeared today with carefully worded little stories written by the journalists the British call political correspondents. These all said that the political correspondent of, fill in the name of the paper here, understands that Minister for Air, Sir Archibald Sinclair, has been invited to be the next Viceroy of India, and it is believed that he will accept. This is a recognized method in Britain, as in other countries, of sending up a trial balloon. The British call it flying a kite. And the idea here, just as in the United States, is if the cautious little newspaper items bring roars of indignation, then the government can look surprised and can point out that nothing official had ever been said. So far today, there have been no roars of indignation. Not far from London is the town of Greenwich, home of the Royal Observatory. Through Greenwich runs the zero meridian on all maps and charts. Ships on all the world's oceans base their positions on the distance they happen to be at the time from this little town of Greenwich. Before they can even determine where they are, the ship's officers have to know just what time it is in Greenwich. All this worldwide activity is centered in Greenwich's Royal Observatory, where the astronomers have been studying the heavens for a good many years. Today, the observatory announced that sunspot activity, which has been interfering with radio and cable communications off and on for several years, is dying down. There was a storm at the beginning of this week, but the five or six year cycle is near its end. The disturbances are growing less severe and less frequent. Greenwich astronomers intended this to be good news for British radio listeners, but British listeners would have appreciated it more if the astronomers had told them where to buy a new radio tube when the old ones wear out. Now back to CBS New York and John Daly. And here's Warren Sweeney with a word from Admiral Radio. Admiral is devoting all its facilities to making radio communications equipment for the armed forces. Few new Admiral radios are available for civilian use, so today, we'd like to use Admiral's time in paying tribute to the Army Signal Corps. Do you recognize this sound? It's made by beating on a hollow log, a means of communication actually used by the Army when the Signal Corps was organized in 1859. For many years, the Signal Corps has been on the job. By 1899, over 40 years ago, 
The Army Signal Corps already had a radio station in operation. True, it sent messages a distance of only 11 miles from Fire Island to Fire Island Lighthouse, but the foresightedness shown in establishing it made possible the Signal Corps of today. Radio and trucks, tanks, planes. Complete broadcasting and receiving sets so small they can be carried in the palm of the hand. Others, so large, they develop twice the power of the largest commercial stations in the country. This equipment is saving lives, speeding victory, because the Army Signal Corps developed the kind of radio which meets all conditions imposed by modern war. Admiral is proud to be building such equipment for the Signal Corps. And now, here once again for Admiral Radio is John Daly. It was just one year ago tomorrow that the Japanese struck at the Hawaiian Islands, leaving our great naval base at Pearl Harbor a mass of sinking and battered warships. There's a different story there today. And Admiral Radio takes you next to CBS Honolulu, Webley Edwards reporting. It was on a Sunday like this, 365 days ago, that this war started for America right here at Pearl Harbor in the island of Oahu in Hawaii. I had a sickening in my stomach as I saw the great ships of our Pacific fleet bombed and torpedoed at the mornings that day. When it was all over, the Arizona was sunk and destroyed. The Oklahoma was turned over, her keel up. The California, Nevada, and West Virginia were far down in the water. The Pennsylvania, the Maryland, and the Tennessee had been hit. The cruisers Helena, Honolulu, and Raleigh were damaged. Two destroyers, the Cassis and the Downs, were destroyed in a dry dock. Another, the Shaw, seemed to be blown half away. The great old mine layer, Oglala, was down in the water, and so was the old target ship, the Utah. Two fleet task forces had been carrying out assignments at sea, and two Pacific fleet task forces were in the harbor after extensive operations at sea. Of the 86 ships in the harbor, 19 were sunk or damaged. Both our Army and Navy forces on Oahu lost scores of planes. All this had happened because we as a nation had thought Japan would play the game as an honorable nation. Dishonorably, the Japs threw a sneak punch. There was, of course, bewilderment, some confusion, and a lot of disillusionment. Ships stricken, planes crushed, airfields popped out with bombs. There was talk about our leaders. And then all at once, it didn't seem nearly so bad. Men worked as men had never worked before. And ships steamed out one by one to take their place with our fighting fleet. I'll never forget the thrill of seeing a battleship, another battleship that had been in the bottom of Pearl Harbor, going out through the harbor narrows one bright morning, her flag proudly flying, her men lining her decks. She was going out to fight, and we all had lumps in our throats. Of those ships that were struck that reeling blow, only the Arizona is permanently and totally lost. Air strength was replaced in a few days. The fleet had to start fighting immediately. The raids on the Marshalls, Wake, and Marcus Island gave us the fleet uh, gave the fleet the confidence that comes from action. And that action was shown in the Coral Sea and in the invasion of New Guinea. Then the Battle of Midway, and now the Solomons, each action of increasing importance. We have lost ships, but the enemy has lost far more. We have lost men, but the enemy has paid a price manifold. At this minute, our land and sea forces are busy in Guadalcanal and in New Guinea, blasting out the foothold for our future drive toward Japan. Today, one year later, Pearl Harbor looks mighty sweet. The old harbor is bustling, noisy, busy, and men have the bright look of confidence in their faces. And that's the situation out here one year later. This is Webley Edwards at Pearl Harbor. We return you to CBS in New York. American paratroops in North Africa have gone into action for the first time in this war. Their attack followed plans long and carefully rehearsed. For the story of the training of our paratroops, one of Columbia's correspondents has visited one of their camps. We take you to CBS over Lawson Field, Fort Benning, Georgia, Bill Slocum, Jr. reporting. I am standing at the door in the rear of an ace C-47, a cold and efficient piece of flying war machinery. Two benches run the length of the plane. Sitting on the benches, facing across the aisle, are eight young men of the 507th Parachute Regiment. They are going to make today's jump. Now, as we near the jumping point, they are smoking, chatting, and looking the way any man with a grain of sense should look when he's about to jump 1,000 feet straight down. I don't think they realize they are talking a little louder than usual, and that there is a grimness about their eyes. They are not afraid. If they were, they wouldn't be parachutists. They're just bright enough to realize that jumping out of airplanes is a job that requires more of the brain than the muscles or even the heart. When jumping time comes, the jump master will order the men to stand up. His next order is hookup. With that, each jumper fastens a hook to a steel cable running the length of the plane. This hook is on the end of a roving rope, which is fastened to the parachute. The third order is check equipment, and then come the orders for the actual jump. 
The men step out, right foot first, and arms folded across their chest. When the jumper exhausts the short length of rope attached to the cable, it snaps his chute open, and down he goes. He'll do the 1,000 feet in about 45 seconds. As they jump, you'll hear them yell their battle cry. The 507th battle cry is Geronimo, and they'll really yell it, too. Each jumper wears a chute on his chest as an emergency chute. They are operated by hand. The jumper packs his own chutes. There are a couple of riggers or repairers on this plane now. Every so often, a rigger has to jump. That custom tends to keep a rigger's mind on his work. Now the motors begin to slow down slowly, and I imagine we're coming in for our jump. Stand up and hook up! There, the lieutenant orders the men to stand up and hook their static Check lines. Check equipment! Check equipment. They are now checking the equipment. Each man checks the parachute on the back of okay, the man in front of him. Okay. Now they're okay. Seven, Four okay. Three okay. Two okay. One okay. All the up and stand in the door. All the parachutes have been checked and they're ready. You can hear them closing up now with their static lines and Are their hooks. Are you ready? Ready. Go. There they go. Go. They went through that like Roxyettes. The jump master's main job is to aim the shooters. He knows where he wants them to land, and after figuring out the wind, why he tells them to go. And he wants to know where he wants to put that lethal cargo which they carry. And lethal it is, too, because when these men land, they unload a devastating firepower and Tommy guns, rifles, mortars, and their very good pal, the hand grenades. Incidentally, the men who jumped for us that time, and they're all going down very nicely now, were Staff Sergeant Spanius, Cambridge, Massachusetts, Sergeant Price of Dillon, South Carolina, Private First Class Wilson of Louisville, Kentucky, Private First Class Sunsboro of Omaha, Nebraska, Private Harvey of DeMine, Iowa, Private LaVisa of Joliet, Illinois, Private Kelly of South Bend, Indiana, and Sergeant Bellow of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Yes, parachute jumping is nothing you do for laughs, but it is as safe as any of the arms of the Army of the United States, and it is the highest paid branch, too, which seems reasonable enough. I return you now to John Daly in New York and CBS. Got ...developments here at home, and for news of the fighting in the Solomons, Admiral Radio takes you to CBS Washington, Lee White reporting. In Washington, the reaction to the idea of a Pearl Harbor anniversary communique has been generally favorable. Few people here would deny that under the circumstances, our Navy could have done anything else but hide from the enemy the full extent of our tremendous losses. Release of most of the tragic details today has had a sobering effect on the people of Washington. But there's some consolation in the anniversary report of the War Production Board though we'll fall short of our production goal by 15% in 1942, the fact that we shall have produced 49,000 airplanes, 32,000 tanks and motorized artillery, 17,000 tons of anti-aircraft, and more than 8 million tons of merchant shipping is really more than we had any right to expect a year ago when we displayed such flagrant weakness at Pearl Harbor. Two hours ago, the Navy Department released another communique. It reports that Marine Corps raiders destroyed five enemy encampments on Guadalcanal last Friday and killed 400 Japanese with a loss to themselves of only 17 dead. Army Aracobra fighters, the Navy says, continue to attack the enemy's bases and on Friday strafed 15 landing barges and rafts near Tassafaranga. This would seem to indicate that the Japanese have been able to land small numbers of troops despite the battle of, the battle of November 30th when we destroyed their latest invasion convoy. Since the publication of the Beveridge Plan for post-war security in the United Kingdom, many people have been wondering if the United States government has not been working on a similar plan. The answer is it has, and it's now possible to reveal that a 50,000-word report of the National Resources Planning Board has been lying on President Roosevelt's desk for almost a month. We return you now to CBS New York and John Daly. And here's Warren Sweeney with a word from Admiral Radio. All over Europe today, the Nazi-controlled radio is pouring forth its usual torrent of lies, excuses, and edicts of cruelty. Here in America, radio serves a different purpose. To give Americans periods of honest news, such as this Admiral-sponsored program. To entertain, to promote free discussions of public matters, and to aid in understanding the various war measures. Because American radio does these things, a radio set is a necessity in the American home. 
and the radio you own should give the best possible service at all times. If it doesn't, have your Admiral dealer put it in tip-top shape. Never mind whether your set is an Admiral or some other brand. Admiral dealers are pledged to help keep all radios on the beam for the duration. When victory is won, they'll have new Admiral radios and Admiral radio phonograph combinations. For Admiral will again take its place as the world's largest manufacturer of radio phonograph combinations with automatic record changers. But until that time, Admiral will be busy supplying the radio equipment needed by the armed forces. And Admiral dealers will be on the job helping to keep our radios on the home front in perfect operating condition. World News Today is brought to you each Sunday at this hour by Continental Radio and Television Corporation, makers of Admiral Radio, America's smart set. Be sure to listen next Sunday when Admiral will again give you World News Today by shortwave, direct from the leading news centers of the world. In spite of what you may have heard or read, our country is critically short of rubber. That, not a shortage of gasoline, is the reason for gasoline rationing. Our armed forces need rubber as much as they need arms and ammunition. Do your part. Obey the spirit as well as the letter of the law. Share your car and go twice as far. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. The WBBM Air Theater, Wrigley Building, Chicago. December 7, 1942. The National Broadcasting Company today presents a special memorial broadcast of Eyes Aloft. Flash. One. By motor. Low. Scene. Fifteen Lucy four. Overhead. East. Flying the law. Watch the sky. Watch the planes flying the lanes up below. Fighter Command of the United States Army Air Forces, in cooperation with West Coast radio stations, presents this special December 7th program, paying tribute to America's war dead, honoring all of America's fighting men, and celebrating the first year of action of the 150,000 volunteer civilians of the Aircraft Warning Service. Ken Carpenter speaking. A gala program tonight. William E. Kepner, commanding general of the 4th Fighter Command, has flown to Hollywood to be with us. Also, you will hear from high-ranking officers of the anti-aircraft artillery at Army Air Corps. We will switch controls to an observation post, to a filter center, and an anti-aircraft target range. Gordon Jenkins and the Hollywood Choir have special musical presentations. And here now is your eyes aloft narrator, Jane Whitman. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Today, December 7th, 1942, America has been at war one year. But not only men in uniform fight this war. There is also a vast army of civilian volunteers who carry on the fight here at home. The Aircraft Warning Service. How many of you can look back and recall how it all started? Well, listen. In the summer of 1941... The 4th Fighter Command of the United States Army Air Forces planned a coast-wide border-to-border practice maneuver. For the first time in American military history, civilians were to become participants in the war games. Quietly, swiftly, the Army went at the gigantic task of organizing civilian forces. In the Pacific Northwest, Major Richard Calgren assumed the tremendous task of organizing the aircraft warning service. In the southern area, Major John C. Gray tackled the monumental job. In July of 1941, Major Gray went to Sacramento to talk with Dick Graves, then head of the State Defense Council. So there, Mr. Graves, I've told you the Army story. 
What a job you have ahead of you, Major Gray. I need help. In particular, I need your help. All right. What can I do? I'd like your office to contact every one of your county defense councils. Okay. And do what, sir? I want the name of some outstanding citizens in each county. You're after leaders. Absolutely. I select one man from each county as the organizer of the Ground Observation Corps. Hmm? What will that man do? It'll be his responsibility to work with the Army. We must select locations for observation posts, pick up area supervisors, and we have to work fast. For five intense months, the 4th Fighter Command worked with local civic leaders. The Ground Observer Corps was rapidly organized. It was a tightly formed system and intersystem of thousands of observation posts, filter centers, information centers. This Ground Observer Corps would, when the time came, alert Army aircraft, searchlight batteries, anti-aircraft artillery, barrage balloon units would set into immediate motion a vast and intricate maze of military defense. At last, all was ready to test. The system was to be tried December 11. The war games to be started, but... On December 7th, the tyrant nation started a different sort of war game. A real war game. Sunday morning, December 7th, 1941. The Hawaiian Islands. Honolulu. The dastardly bombing of Pearl Harbor by the Japanese. to this eyewitness account of the bombing of Honolulu. Major Ernest Keating, now commanding officer of a fighter group in the state of Washington, was in Hawaii last December 7th. Everything was peaceful and quiet at Wheeler Field at 7.50 on the morning of last December 7th. A few moments later, I heard an airplane in a dive, and it made a noise like a United States Navy dive bomber. At the end of the dive, I heard heard an explosion, and at that time, I thought the pilot had failed to pull out of his dive. Before I could reach a window... I heard many explosions in rapid succession. Then I realized somebody was bombing the devil out of the place. But I thought that the Navy had a bombing range nearby and was merely getting in some target practice. However, when I rushed outside, I saw a column of dense black smoke coming from a place on our flying field. I then surmised that one of the planes did fly into the ground and that what I saw was the smoke from his burning plane. At this point, the enemy swooped down and began to strafe Wheeler Field with machine gun and cannon fire. When I heard the machine guns, I at last knew we were being attacked, but wasn't quite sure who was doing it. Just then, I saw several dive bombers north of the hangars and recognized them as Japanese. The enemy machine gunned Wheeler Field for about 25 minutes. This was the longest 25 minutes I have ever spent. It would have been suicide to run out on the field to try to reach any of our planes. Two or three hangars was an, in, was an inferno of flames. Planes were burning on the field. Ammunition dumps were exploding all about us. Then the Japs left. I ran and helped carry wounded men from a barracks to the hospital. Then the Japs came back. This time I could see them bombing Pearl Harbor several miles away. I saw a great column of smoke rise. It later proved to be from the sinking Arizona. No man or woman who was in Hawaii last December 7th We'll never forget that horrible surprise. At home on that sunny Sunday morning, here in a trusting, believing America, people went about their way as usual. Those who weren't at church perhaps were relaxing in front rooms of homes. Sunday papers scattered about, children reading funnies spread out on the floor, wives in the kitchen contemplating the Sunday dinner menu. Daddy, Mm. Bill won't let me have the part with the funnies. He's just sitting on it. Matthew, Billy. Come on, give your sister the part with Blondie. Aw, here, sissy. Henry? Yes, dear? What are you doing? Reading. Now, you promised to clean the garage today. Oh, well, I I said some Sunday, not this Sunday, huh? I'm going to see what's on the radio for a minute. Yeah. 
Now, Henry, if you don't turn off that radio and go clean the garage, I won't cook dinner. Oh, now, Martha. Hey, do you hear that? Hmm? Sky Lombardo, your favorite orchestra. Henry, you're just stalling. Oh, well. We interrupt this program for a news flash from Washington, D.C. Hmm? One moment, please. What goes, Dan? Oh, wait, listen. At 7.55 a.m. Hawaiian time this morning, Japanese planes dropped bombs on Pearl Harbor Naval Base. Straight wheel to wheel. What? Many civilians, as well as Army and Navy personnel, are believed dead. Oh, Henry. The amount of destruction is unknown. Lord, Martha. Keep tuned to this station for our latest news developments. Turn it off. Yeah. Never have trusted those dirty Japs. That'll mean war for us, won't it, Henry? Yeah, that'll mean war for us, Martha. Oh. Oh, now, wait a minute. Don't get jittery. Probably just Jack Miller calling to see if I've heard the news yet. Will Daddy have to go to war, Mother? Oh, I don't know. Not, not for a while. Now, don't worry, Betty. Yeah? Yeah, this is Henry Smith. Who? Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, now? Me? What is it, Henry? Well, I'm glad to. Yeah, I'll put on my coat and be right up. Yeah, uh, goodbye. Well, where are you going, Henry? I don't want Daddy to leave. Now, Martha, now look, kids. Now, this is no time for nerves. That was Phil Lockhart. He's chief observer at our post. But where were you going? He's calling observers to man the post. Say, it's four days ahead of December 11th. Hmm. The aircraft warning service is going right into operation anyway. This won't be play war as you all had planned it. No, Martha, no. It's the real McCoy. Yes. We'll be watching for real enemy planes now. I gotta get my leather jacket. You don't know when you'll be back? I don't know. Hey, gosh, Martha, just think. What? The honor I've just had tossed at me. Why? I'll be standing guard on the first doggone watch. Hey, gee, kids, you ought to be proud of your old man now. Up and down the Pacific coast, in every city, town, village, and hamlet, civilian men and women observers and filter center workers were called to duty that Sunday morning. The Army supervised the job. The people of the country, volunteers all, were working in civilian clothes as part of the United States Army. Though they wore no uniforms of khaki, they knew on that ominous Sunday that they, too, were members of America's fighting forces. At this moment, we switch controls to a typical observation post. Located on northern California's Monterey Peninsula, the new little post building sits high on a rocky promontory that juts out into the turbulent waters of the Pacific Ocean, calling Monterey Peninsula. This is Captain E.G. Morrison, South Coast Ground Observer Officer, speaking to you from the sea cliffs in front of the observation post. With me are several oil observers. First, I want you to meet 82-year-old Hale and Hardy Sin Frolic. Sin's coming north by west tonight. And strong. Weren't you an old-time Norwegian sea captain before you retired, Mr. Frolic? As I was, Captain. I passed past the bridge many a night watching the sea. Now I am passing on this cliff watching for the enemy. Well, I know they'll never get by you, Mr. Frolic. Mr. Frolic has been an observer at this post since last December 7th. And here's Mrs. Caris Weston, another of the post observers. Can't we take the microphone inside now, Captain Morrison? I think people would enjoy meeting our chief observer, Whit Wellman, and his wife, Olga. They're on duty tonight, you know. Well, we'll go on in. But first, I want to point out about this stone wall around the shack here. Didn't you have something to do with building that wall, Mrs. Weston? Yes, Captain Morrison. Was it your idea? I began it. The other observers helped finish it. Well, this is certainly a splendid post now. The way all you people have worked and built it up from nothing. Let's go on in now. Will you open the door for me, Mr. Froelich? Yes, sir. Warm in here. I think we all spent enough time outside keeping this post going when we didn't have a shack. Oh, Mr. Wellman, you're chief observer at this post. That's right. Of course, my wife here did a, a large amount of the early work in securing observers. That was a long time ago. It was just a year ago today that we first started calling observers to come and stand duty on this coast. There wasn't any building here then, was there? No, from Pearl Harbor to January 3rd, observers just stood up there, exposed to the wind and the rain. Mm, that was pretty disagreeable work. 
Yes, but we knew it had to be done. On January 3rd, we bought a bag, and we brought it up here. Now, that was a sleeping bag? Yes, it was the one way to keep warm. Well, that is fairly warm anyway. Well, how far were you from the telephone? Oh, we had to run about 200 feet at the phone at the home down below. We couldn't run exactly. We'd stumble along the rocky path that leads down the hill. Then you'd have to climb up all over again and make another flash call. It was really pioneering in those days. Well, this post, like so many others in the Pacific Coast, have come a long way in a year. Well, Charlie Shepard, our county uh, uh, director, uh, explained that if, if we ever if we ever had to have any building or anything else, we would have to arrange for them ourselves, and we did. We raised enough to build this fine little shack. It's well insulated, warm, and it helps us to keep a full quarter of observers at all times. Some one of us in this community will be right here on guard as long as we're needed. And that seems to be the spirit of the Grand Observer Corps workers, to stay in the job as long as they're needed. This is Captain Morrison returning the program to Hollywood. The 4th Fighter Command's Aircraft Warning Service is composed of two major units, the Ground Observer Corps and the Filter Center workers. Filter centers are located in many of the key cities along the Pacific Coast. We now take you to Seattle, Washington, where you will hear from Mrs. Negley England, Director of Civilian Components and Signal Officer Colonel Richard Calgren. We've come a long way since our first meeting 16 months ago, haven't we, Mrs. England? Yes, indeed, Colonel Calgren. This anniversary of Pearl Harbor brings back many memories. Yes, but my 16 months with the Aircraft Warning Service seems small when I realize that as far back as 1939, you of the Army were actively engaged in laying the groundwork in this area for the AWF. Yes, we were planning a test maneuver even as far back as 1939. But looking back to the first cornerstone of our present AWS here in Seattle, laid in July of 1941, I can remember the afternoon at your home, Ms. England with ten Seattle women to whom you have gave, given the responsibility of each recruiting ten other volunteers. Yes, we were out to form a group of 100 workers for the first filter center training. Then I set out to organize similar groups in other western Washington cities where filter centers were to be established. Just think how long that was before Pearl Harbor. Little did we realize then how those first 100 loyal women would grow to the vast organization we have here now. No one of them at the time guessed they were signing up for a steady job. No. We expected to dismiss our volunteers right after Thanksgiving. Just call them back occasionally for brush-up training so they'd always be ready for any emergency. Remember the morning of December 8th, Colonel Cargan? Will I ever forget it? I mean, the way our volunteers reported for duty. Many without being called. Remember the speed and efficiency with which they took their places in the filter and information center? The great thing about it all, Ms. Zing, is that the same spirit has carried on these last 12 months without a waiver. And we're all going to carry on for the duration. Well, we of the military can never say enough in praise of our civilian volunteers. You yourself, Ms. England, with nearly 4,000 hours of volunteer service. Well, don't forget, there are many, many others who have served well into the 1- and 2,000-hour brackets. I'm sure we all feel that what we've done has been worth the time spent. Your compensation has come, no doubt, in knowing that you have all done your jobs well. You have the satisfaction of knowing that others may live in safety without fear of enemy attack. It is the fighting spirit, exemplified in our volunteer workers throughout the Pacific Coast, that has carried us all so successfully over this first hard year. The Gordon Jenkins Orchestra and Choir join in a modern song of hope. When the lights go on again... When we 
for the right to live and breathe free men. And when, at end of day, we turn unto our beds to rest in quiet peace, we thank introduce the man whose mission is the protection of the Pacific Coast. He has flown his plane here tonight so that he may speak to us on this memorable date. We present the commander of the 4th Fighter Command, General William E. Kepner. December 7th, 1942. We have been at war one year. The task undertaken by the civilian volunteers of the Aircraft Warning Service last September the 7th seemed a stupendous one. There were no signposts to guide us. We were hitting the Pioneer Trail, and we have come through our first year together. The Aircraft Warning Service is new to modern warfare. In the beginning, we may have lacked training, facilities, and background, but the 150,000 men and women of the AWS did not lack courage, initiative, and resourcefulness. Last December, a few good citizens told us that the volunteer system would fold up by spring. When spring came, some told us that summer vacations would strike a death blow to the volunteer group. In the fall, it was said by some that the volunteers would not go through another winter. But you, the volunteers of the Aircraft Warning Service, have shown how wrong the prognosticators were. Today, the target stands continued to march across the filter boards. To you who are in the audience here tonight, and to those who are listening at their radios, May I express my heartfelt appreciation for the work you have done. And may I thank you for the work I know you will continue to do, so long as your services are needed by the Army. Now may I present one of my staff officers. He is a man many of you know, for he has spent much of his time in the field organizing the Pacific Coast Aircraft Warning Service. Lieutenant Colonel John C. Gray. We have reached a mile post. Today we can look back with satisfaction upon the many problems we have solved together, but we cannot rest upon our oars. I am sure that all volunteers wish to join with those of us in uniform in rededicating ourselves to the task ahead and to pledge again allegiance to our nation and to the Aircraft Warning Service. There are in the studio audience tonight nearly 300 women who have served faithfully and continuously at the big Los Angeles Information Center since last December 7th. 
they will now rise and repeat after me the pledge. And those of you volunteers listening in at your radios, wherever you may be, we ask that you, too, repeat the pledge with us. Will all volunteers of the Pacific Coast please rise? The Fourth Fighter Command Oath of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the United States of America and to the Fourth Fighter Command and to the, of the United States Army Air Forces and to the mission with which it is charged. And to the mission with which it is charged. The protection of the Pacific Coast and of the nation. The protection of the Pacific Coast and of the nation. From invasion by enemy aircraft. From invasion by enemy aircraft. Another member of my headquarters staff is Colonel Carl Wally, anti-aircraft artillery officer. Colonel Wally. The anti-aircraft artillery is ready and, ready and waiting when and if the enemy ever dares to attack our western shores by air. Anti-aircraft guns can speak with real authority if our crews are warned ahead of time that the enemy is approaching. You, the volunteer aircraft warning service, must be ever on guard so that you can flash the message to us. You are vital to the protection of the nation. And now, General Kepner, we are ready to transfer our controls to an unidentified practice target range in the Southern California area. We are ready to pay our tribute to those who have died in the fight for freedom. It is a time-honored military right to fire a salute to the heroic dead. It is fitting that such tribute be paid the dead of this war, particularly to those of Pearl Harbor who received a stab in the back last December 7th. But we are a nation engaged in an all-out war effort. Today, every bit of war material must be used to stab back at a treacherous enemy. We cannot justify the waste of a minute of one soldier's time. We cannot spare one ounce of gunpowder, one scrap of brass. Today, our tribute to the war dead must be practical, as I am sure those valiant men would want it to be. When you hear the anti-aircraft guns firing, their purpose will be twofold. First, they speak our nation's solemn tribute to those who have not died in vain. Secondly, they are the snarling voices of guns, fired by crews perfecting themselves so that someday they may lay a well-placed blast into an enemy plane. We switch controls now to a firing point on the southern cliffs of the Pacific Ocean. General D.D. Hinman, commanding officer of the anti-aircraft artillery, is there watching tonight's practice. Are you ready down there, Joy Storm? Okay, Ken Carpenter. Here on the cliffs of the Pacific is a mighty battery of high-powered anti-aircraft guns. Above us has been flying an army bomber towing a sleeve, a target at which the gun crew has been firing. Their accuracy is amazing. From the hills around us, giant searchlights stab cold white beams of light up into the air, converge on the target being towed by the plane, follow it through the night. The plane, out over the ocean, will soon be coming back again. And oh, here I see General Hinman, who is here tonight inspecting this gun crew's working, walking across the field. General Hinman, would you come up here and tell us all that is permissible about what's going on? Well, Mr. Storm, this gun crew has been scoring heavily against the target. Well, uh, these are pretty big guns, aren't they, General Hinman? Big and powerful. I wish I could tell you how high up they can fire a projectile, but I can't. Well, I know that you had to clear the ocean more than six miles out before practice could begin. Yes, Mr. Storm, these guns will shoot straight up in the air as far as any anti-aircraft guns built today. If any enemy aircraft gets anywhere within their range, the enemy better start saying his prayers. Well, I'd hate to be an enemy plane trying to get through this gun crew that's firing tonight. Think they're pretty good, do you? Well, I have a new feeling of security for my family, General Hinman. That's one way I can put it. Light finder on target. Director on target. Command, firing. gun crew at practice, a salute to our war dead. Though the lights of the world are dim this December 7th, the torch of freedom shall always burn brightly. This is Gain Whitman on this memorable December 7th, 1942, 
saying good night to the 150,000 aircraft warning service civilian volunteers who keep constant vigil of our home front so that America will always be safe from any attack by air. Good night. is produced for the 4th Fighter Command by Robert L. Redd. Music is under the direction of Gordon Jenkins. This is Ken Carpenter charging you to always remember... Eyes Aloft! Eyes Aloft! Watching the sky! Watching the plane flying the lane up the floor! Eyes Aloft! Always on guard! Sending a hand protecting the land we roam! Eyes Aloft comes to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. I have this, uh, selected for discussion is the question of unity. How much unity do we have do we have to have to bring this war to a, su- a successful conclusion? Now, I would like to uh, ask uh, Sir Cedric Hardwick first to voice an opinion on the subject. Sir Cedric. Well, I think it's a very great compliment, Bob, that you asked me. It seems to me the question answers itself. But unless you have unity, you can't possibly win the war. And when you say unity, what kind of unity have you in mind? Unity of action, purpose, and thought? Well, first you must have unity of purpose, and then you must have unity of action. If I were able to uh, describe to you what the um, appropriate action would be, I would be a military expert. The last thing in the world I have many. Too modest. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chaplin, no. I understand you uh, just recently returned from the East. Yes. Now, I think that you are perhaps better qualified than any to tell us something about your impressions of the East. Do we have unity? No, by no means. We have a great deal of prejudice, which I think we know, if we're very fair-minded. We know that this prejudice comes from the bugaboo about communism. You find all your scare sisters and the columnists that every... Uh, uh, accusing and, and uh, laying everything and all the, all the fear of uh, of the disunity to communism we are the public are getting confused on this issue and uh, as we know the communists and in the pact that was announced by the anglo soviet american alliance on june the, the 11th not only made a program for for uh, the crushing of the hitler of hitler and his hordes but also outlined, outlined a, a program for, for, for to regenerate the world afterwards. Now, Russia is for that. And the pact that she made, the Anglo-Russian uh, pact, is to, the, to, is, is to the effect that, that, uh, that each country shall have, shall, deter- shall have the right to determine its own economic policy and its own... Uh, 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 a political system. Now, Russia is absolutely in full agreement with that, and so is every communist. And every communist in this country has subordinated his interest for the one purpose and for the sole purpose of victory. Uh. <clears throat> Dr. Ludwig, you were uh, perhaps one of the most uh, widely known and widely read observers of the European scene, especially Germany the Germany before Hitler and the Germany during Hitler. I would like to ask you a very important question. Uh, from your observation of conditions prevailing here in the United States, would you say that there are any characteristics that would point to a similarity of conditions such as existed in Europe before the advent of Hitler? We are here because they are not Europeans. We are happy that you are un-Europeans here. 
In other words, you don't think that there are any conditions uh, that would uh, contain the same danger signals uh, such as conditions in Europe before the advent of Hitler. Uh, I'm a guest in America, much too clever to give any critics on American situation. I can only know what we know about Europe. But first, I want to tell you why all what Mr. Chaplin said was so excellent. Because he's not an expert, but he's a poet. The expert. Uh, uh, ruined our situation. Asked as one of the great poets of this our time. What do you mean by a great poet? Because to be a great actor is not very difficult. But to be an actor, who, a poet who acts his own story, we had not since Moliere. I take the occasion to say it here to him directly. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's wonderful, and I agree with you 100%, Dr. Ludwig. However, you haven't answered my question. Is there anything else that you would like to say, except that uh, you respect the hospitality of this country too much and you don't want to voice any criticism? However, it isn't criticism that I want. I want a statement of fact. Do you see any conditions here that point to any danger to the democratic institutions, to the security of this country? That is criticism on America and propose myself to say all what you want on Europe. Well, all right, and tell I'm me what... I'm in this country. Uh, what kind of conditions would you say uh, led actually to the advent of Hitler? Oh, two or three different. For instance? First, Richard Wagner. <laughs> <laughs> Second... The disunity of the victors after the Great War. Well, there we have a very definite clue now. You say there's an existing disunity. That is exactly what yes. we wanted to hear. Yes. The, if you speak on the unity of the Allies, I would say one of the greatest aims would be to make disunity between our enemies. That's Italy and Germany, of course. Do you Second, think it can be achieved? Tomorrow, in six months, the Italian story is over. It was never so easy to predict than in this war. Because you have to know only the psychology of the, of the nation. If you don't read communists and you don't ask the stars, then you can exactly know what will happen. Mm. I see that. Uh, Mr. Bruce, do you agree with this uh, view uh, voiced by Dr. Ludwig, stating that Italy can be knocked out in six months? I wouldn't know enough about uh, about uh, about Italy and whether she can be knocked out at all. I think if the RAF gone as they are, it might be less less time than that. But as regards the the question of unity, if I may say, I'm a British subject and I want to be careful what I say. I've just come back from Texas, where I went right through, and I think that the the feeling amongst the poorer people in this country is absolutely magnificent. But there is far too much I felt criticism of everything, criticism of your president, criticism of the army, trying to criticize England, very Australia, well. and very India. Very and very I very feel well. this, that we are together now. We are United Nations. And I think that criticism is a very dangerous thing. And unless we know what we're talking about, the wisest thing we can all do is to not criticize and to back up our leaders and to keep our mouths shut. But you do know. Well, Amigo, you do know, but there is criticism. You know that these colon columnists are trying to divide the country. There are certain columnists in this country, and I'm going to speak because if this is a free country, and if we, you, and if, if this democracy advocates free speech, then I'm one that's going to speak my mind, even although I am a guest in this country. Because I believe unless, if you, your democracy is so frail that you, that you cannot be criticized, then I don't think it's worth fighting for. And we know there are, there, are, there are certain factions in this country that are trying to confuse the people. As you say, the people are all right. They're 100%. And so are the boys that are fighting in Africa there. And they don't question. They don't haggle. They're giving full cooperation with their life and, and, uh, with their life and they're shedding their blood and they're dying without question. And yet we haggle over whether $25,000 a year is communism or not. I, I certainly think if that's communism, there's a lot of people in the United States that will vote for it. Because, 
Well, believe me, uh, the people who ever th think that it's ter horrible for people to live on $25,000 a year just don't know how the other ha half live. <laughs> then they know very well there are certain sections. I just made a speech in Chicago, and I happen to say that while people are anti-communist, I am going to be communistic. I'm going to be pro-communist, in other words. I'm neither a communist and I'm not a, I'm not a, a, anything. But when I see that people are deliberately trying to divide this country, they've used the bugaboo, Hitler used the bugaboo of communism, in order to, he thought he could get the Allies to go on his side to fight against Russia. But we didn't fall for that. No. And then, then, had he, had he have succeeded in that, then he'd have used, he'd have used imperialism to, to defeat uh, uh, England. But we never felt for that, either. And had he, had he have succeeded there, then he'd have used capitalism to defeat America. His, uh, his whole idea is to divide and conquer. And there are still... And there, and there are still Nazi agents in this country, and watch out for them, I say. Because I tell you that the communists and everybody must be we must have a unity, and only by the strength of unity can we win this war. We must have the full strength from, from, from the capitalists to the communists, and they must, they must subordinate their interests for at least the duration of the war in order that we shall achieve victory, and it's not going to be an easy task. Mr. Lloyd. May we have a word from you on the question of unity? Well, uh, the question of unity, first of all, of course, everyone realizes we must have unity to win. Now, the matter of criticism, well, I think, personally, it's a very healthy thing. It's a part of the American way of life. We are fighting a war... And we are sending our boys, and I say our boys because 1921, I forswore allegiance to King George to become an American citizen. I did that because I felt this form of government was the finest. We're sending our boys out with the promise that they are fighting to keep our way of life. I hope that in spite of the criticism, no matter what commentators or broadcasters may say, and what the new Congress may do, I feel sure that it's getting into all our hearts, into all our souls, and I'm sure it's in the minds of all those men who are going back into Congress, that this country must be kept alive for our way of life, the, w the way of life that we've known. It's democracy. Just imagine what it means. <clears throat> With democracy, those people, way back in history, took a wilderness. And because they could think for themselves and speak out with no fear of man, they turned a wilderness into a beautiful garden into which we of the other countries could come and be men without fear of any man. And if that goes out of this country, I don't want to go on living. Thank you. Now we'll interrupt a moment for station identification. You are listening to Robert Arden's roundtable discussion of current events with Sir Cedric Hardwick, Frank Lloyd, Nigel Bruce, Dr. Emil Ludwig, and Charlie Chaplin, coming to you from Studio 5 and Warner Brothers Hollywood Studios. And now back to Robert Arden and his guests. Dr. Ludwig, as, uh, I understand that you are now preparing a new book on Beethoven. I think that uh, in this book you uh, are going to discuss, or rather I presume that you're going to discuss a great deal of the pre-Hitler conditions in, uh, in Germany. 
Free, free, free Hitler, yes. Three times. Three times free Hitler, uh, free Hitler Germany. Uh, I would like to uh, to ask a question which, uh, oh, I would say a uh, hundred times a week is being asked of me, either by telephone or by uh, by mail or in personal contact. Uh, what do you believe are the chances of a collapse of the Hitler regime before the Allies can crush it by a military victory? The collapse comes exactly as in 1918, because it's a collapse of nerves. The German nerves are not the English nerve. The English is stubborn. Excuse me, gentlemen, you are here. <laughs> <laughs> The English is stubborn. I say that with the greatest compliment, because without this stubbornness, you couldn't have held out. You understand. He has, he is educated <clears throat> since 300 years for self-responsibility, uh, to think himself, for himself. The German likes to die for his fatherland, but not to think for his fatherland. He had never some special responsibility, and if he is in his town without uniform, and without a boss who says, Prince Wide Right, right, then he is lost because there is no boss. How could he be an educated personality today after 300 years of lacking of liberty? When he had 14 years liberty, he was very unhappy. Mr. Hitler is absolutely right when he speaks against the popularity of the Republic, which we founded, my friends, and we wrote the books, and my friends were the minister. Nobody was happy. He, he's happy because he has a boss. And now, in the big bombing of the English, the boss is not there. He's a great soldier, an excellent soldier, because he's obedient and don't like to think. But if he is without uniform, he's lost. And that is one of the reasons, because you will have a quicker breakdown of nerves in 43 than in 1980. Second, you know that there is the greatest difference between the generals and the Nazis. You will have the breakdown of Germany when Germany is in Africa and in Asia. And yet in Berlin this will be breakdown just as in April, in, in August and then in October 1980. Do you agree with that uh, opinion, Mr. Bruce? I see you made some notes there. Well, I, I was just thinking that we're all talking about Germany, and I am not in the position to, to discuss Germany as much as, as uh, Dr. Ludwig. But I feel this, that both my friend Cedric Hardwick and myself fought against the Germans. We must realize that the, the German army is possibly the greatest army of all time. And the German army was not beaten in the last war. It was beaten because of internal trouble. I, want, I think we should realize we're not only fighting Germany, but we are fighting Japan. And I've just finished reading reports from Tokyo by a man, by your ambassador Gruz, who was ten years in Germany and ten years in Japan. He says, in his opinion, it's quite possible that Germany will give way, as they did in the last war, internally. He says that that's quite a possibility, and it might even be, as Dr. Ludwig says in 1940, they are the best trained troops in the world. They live on practically nothing except rice, and if they're asked to cut that to half, they can live on that and that they, it is a religious war with them, and that it's a very, very serious problem which you've got to all face. Forgive me for digressing for one moment from Germany, but we are at war with both those nations, and I think that we may hope for an internal disruption in Germany in the next year or 18 months, but I don't think we can hope for it or expect it in Japan if one is to believe, and I think we can believe, that book which I think that everybody listening to me should read, because it's a very true and a very frightening book. Thank you. Uh, I uh, would like to summarize what we have uh, stated so far. It seems that uh, every one of you is agreed on the fact that we need unity of action and unity of thinking to uh, win this war. Dr. Ludwig predicted a collapse of uh, Nazi Germany within 1943. Now, based upon these opinions, I should like to uh, go into the discussion of several questions that have been handed to me from our audience here. The first question reads as follows. How about fascism in the United States? Well, undoubtedly, I think there is a certain amount of fascism in the United States. I think it's easily recognizable if we're honest about it. I've seen it in some of the press. I've seen it, as I said before, in the colonists, amongst certain of the colonists. Undoubtedly, there are certain factions in this country who think that they can make a good deal with Hitler. 
And there are certain factions in this country who fear democracy and who, who fear the people and who fear the people's desire to make a better world after the war. Uh, how about uh, fascism in Great Britain, Sir Cedric? Well, it's some time since I was there, but I don't think that in Great Britain they're thinking about anything else but defeating Hitler. I've had a lot of very interesting letters from there recently, and I find that uh, there they have complete unity of purpose. I think where well, there's been a little confused thinking tonight, sitting here listening, is that you can have criticism of how to achieve something, but where the criticism becomes dangerous is criticism of whether or not you're going out to achieve it. And I think that that is a very serious point which uh, should be considered in the light of what we've been discussing. In England, there is no criticism at all, as I understand it, of what sort of government is going to, to, um, to be in the future. Neither is there any, any criticism at all of whether or not you should make a deal with Hitler. But there is criticism occasionally, and healthy criticism of the way in which it is to be accomplished. And that, I think, is the true criticism of democracy. Would you like to add something, Mr. Bruce? Well, I've talked enough of it. Thank you. Well, of course, the, 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 the experts are the people to, to decide how it's to be achieved. And after all, all we can do as laymen is to, is to be unified in thought. Uh, at the back of this war, we're not only going to win it by munitions and by soldiers alone. It has to be courage and heart and unity and enthusiasm and one whole purpose in mind. Let the generals uh, do the strategy. But we must be morally unified. Well, I wasn't referring so much to strategy. But if results are not being achieved, then perhaps some of the experts are not quite right. I find that sometimes I'm bewildered by, by reading the outpourings of the experts on this war. Yes, it's perfectly true. But nevertheless, in all wars, there's confusion. I think all nations and all governments muddle through. I don't think there's any, as, as such a thing as a, as a, as a perfect, uh, efficient government anywhere. Uh, I think if Mr. Chaplin uh, has read the beverage plan, he, he's, uh, I hope, feel that England is going to step in the right direction. Well, we, uh, we all hope that steps in the right direction will finally uh, bring us closer to the goal as it is. And uh, for the moment being, we are just trying to decide which steps to take. I'm not e interested in the post-war so long as each country has the right to determine its own kind very of government. Good, I'm not interested in it. Further. Here is a very interesting question which I'm uh, going to hand to Dr. Ludwig. Do you think that Hitler is going to sue for peace? Oh, going? Of course he will. He will try it. I hope nobody will follow him. Because the great danger here is on the day after the murder, after the death of Mr. Hitler, which we will see, he will be murdered by his own people. That was always so in history that any conqueror is on the end finished by the hand of his people. And that is the great danger because then in America, and perhaps also in England, Will it be people who think the General von Thoma, who is now in England, is a better man? He is not. He is not. Mr. Goering is much too fat to be an, an, a leader. That is false stuff on the scene. That's impossible. But even if he is slim like Mr. Thoma, he is not an honorable man. The great danger is that anybody could think here, and I speak with very important Americans, who thinks well the right way is unpolitical. He is highly political. And, and without the military caste, Mr. Hitler was nothing. They made him. So, the, the, what I am most, on what I am most astonished is the fact that in America they write every day a line, the Nazis are be bitten. Instead of saying the Germans, it is not the Nazis with which you have a here, war. Here. I think that's Dr. Ludwig, I would like to take this opportunity to start a little private quarrel with you, or rather a little private argument with Go you. On. A little while ago, you made the following statement. You said the Germans have been a uh, nation uh, used to being bossed around for about 300 years. Then after the last World War, when they had liberty or some semblance of liberty for about 14 years, they were miserable. Yes. Now, let us suppose we are going to crush the Nazis very shortly. Uh, what then has to happen in order to prevent the German nation from being miserable after 14 years again and creating a new Hitler? Three, three conditions. 
I wrote it 20 times. If you want, I say it 21st time. Now, three conditions. First, a great occupation army, which takes out of the hand of the Germans, who are passionate soldiers, any weapon. That is to say also the policemen. What is this? Police the club. Second, 500 or 2,000 edu educators, not to educate the boys, because the boys would laugh about them. They speak German as I speak now, colorful English. <laughs> people who supervise the, the teachers, because we were there in court team. You don't know, perhaps, and perhaps the gentleman on my right didn't know it um, all. We were there. The Republic was betrayed in the beginning, in 20. I received in 20 um, a letter, and there was an article in Turkish Beobachter, you know what was now Mr. Hitler said, in 20, if I don't leave Munich tomorrow, they will kill me. I was a very innocent private man and wrote some articles in favor of liberty and the Republic. The Republic was <coughs> boycotted in the beginning, and the great murders were of Ra my great friend Rathenau, you know, and others, were in 22, not by Mr. Hitler. So, if you want to make it better now, you must take education out of the hand of them or supervise them in a European way. Sir, you cannot leave them to government. There is no liberal Germany. There is in Germany or protectorate, or communistic Germany. I have nothing against both forms, but don't believe that some of our good emigrants here, we have the power, I am a Swiss citizen, I don't speak for me, but there are excellent people here. They have no background in Germany. In Germany you can govern only five or ten years with a strong hand. This strong hand may be, of course, helped by the great heroes behind the barbed wire that are the great heroes of today. There is Mr. Niemöller and others. But you cannot think that you make a new Reichstag and new free um, elections and then say the Germans are good people, they were misled. They like the whole story. Nobody in the world, no president, was elected in such a democratic way than Mr. Hitler. He was the head of the strongest party. The president, just like the king in England, took him as he has head of the strongest party. He had 52% of majority. Then he made three pledges seats and the whole German nation, 99%, were in favor. You can say that some 10% did it by fear, but not 99. Everybody was delighted because there was a boss. Mm. They, were, they were terribly shocked in 18, where there is not a boss and everybody had to think himself. We never think himself. We think on philosophy, music, and poetry. But there are the Yugas who have to think for us. Why have I to think? They told it to me. That so you can not educate, you cannot make a limp, do you say so? Vaccinate. Yes. You cannot make democratic limp here to vaccinate mm. them. That's not in five minutes. That's possible under the strong the occupation army, and if you say it is too mm, expensive, then I tell you that the occupation army for a month costs much less than one day of the war today. H.G. Wells put it very nicely when he said that <laughs> the Nazis was one fit in the case of epilepsy. <laughs> uh, in other words, I can summarize your opinion in this way, Mr. Uh, Dr. Ludwig, rather. Uh, first, you insist on uh, the maintenance of a strong occupa uh, occupational force in, uh, in Germany after this war is won, and secondly, to, uh, um, to begin an educational campaign yes. under our government. Yes. Now, that finishes that question. I'm sorry that I couldn't, I couldn't pick an argument with you, but I happen to agree with you on that. I, uh, because you have your but don't you think that that might encourage a militarism all over again? Isn't it a good excuse for other military uh, people throughout Europe? Everybody will be turned tired after this war. Well, don't you think Germany itself will? Do you really think that it's absolutely uh, compulsory, necessary to have an army of occupation? What are you going to do, sir? Well, I mean, to say they, they have been bled white just as much as Russia is being bled white and 
as we will be bled right before quite before we get through with this war. Of ah, course. And as you say, everybody will be very, very tired. And dangerous people the military spirit in idealist idealism in this sense. They have the idea of vengeance. In three hundred years they were beaten only twice. After the second time, everybody said, Next time we make it better, you know, like that. And now how can you think that they will not repeat it. You were betrayed once. How can you be, be have the intention to be betrayed another time? Of course, I, f I feel that if ever Russia gets into Berlin, uh, we won't have to bother about anything. <laughs> I think you'll find every German citizen in Russia building up Stalingrad. <laughs> Uh, Berlingrad. Berlingrad. <laughs> Berlingrad. Here is the next. Here is the next question, gentlemen, which leads us from Berlingrad to uh, Dalangrad. It says, "Can we and should we trust Dalang?" Now that is something which my learned friend Sir Cedric Hardwick would like to expostulate. I'm quite sure. Well, I've never met Dalang, but his record is not one. Uh, so I say that it leads one to trust anybody. But I think that is something that we have to wait for history to tell us. There may be a good deal more behind the Dalang business than we know. Uh, what do you make of uh, today's yes. proclamation? What do you make of today's proclamation in which Dallon stated that he has no political ambitions, that uh, the moment France is free again and the people can determine for themselves what kind of uh, leadership they want, that he would retire into private life? Well, I, I think there's a slight suspicion that he helps defense people who want him. Every dictator said, first, I have no political ambition, from Caesar on to Hitler. <laughs> That seems to finish the question of uh, of Dalon. Finish with Dalon. The only thing is, is uh, <laughs> uh, here is a question that seems quite interesting. Won't prohibition interfere with our liberty? I don't quite get the uh, the question. However, it sounds very intriguing. Is well, there anyone who wants me, Bob, to answer I'm it? Why do you look at me? When you say <laughs> because. <laughs> Why well, didn't you bring the prohibition? Is it is not so prohibitive, if I may say? Well, it did. Uh, it did uh, uh, take away a liberty from a lot of people in the last uh, prohibition era uh, because they were selling liquor, and a whole lot of them went up. <laughs> That's the term liberty. I think uh, uh, another reason that the people uh, of this democracy uh, will speak for themselves is. Uh, no sooner they realized that uh, prohibition was a horrible mistake, they changed it, and they did it through this form of government. It happened to be the democratic government, too. Right. <laughs> uh, here's an uh, interesting question. What are the chances of the four freedoms being realized all over the globe? Well, do you want me to speak on that? Of course. I don't think I have very much to say, other than uh, we know very well that Soviet and Russia have a 20-year alliance. And uh, it's more or less based on the fact, the mere fact that they want to, to uh, a post-war collaboration for the purpose of re-establishing the world, I suppose they will inject the four freedoms, freedom of fear and freedom of speech, and the want, which to me is the most important one. And I think England has made a gesture in that direction. Uh, as you said, Bruce, I, I, I think it's... Uh, that's, that's Co Nigel, Charlie. Ah. Did you say Johnny? Charlie. Uh, about oh. these alliances, though, quite seriously, Charlie, are you, these 20-year alliances, do you put much trust in alliances? I don't. Well, I, I Russia think... had an alliance with Germany not very long ago. I know, and Germany broke it. It wasn't yes. Russia. <laughs> and also, but uh, Russia, of all nations, of course, all nations are humbug, more or less. I mean, uh, you can, uh, as you say, all nations are opportunists. I'm speaking personally. Uh, this is perhaps off the record and on the air, but nevertheless, it's very personal. <laughs> and... Uh, but of all those nations, I think Russia has carried out her obligations and attacks and has kept to them more than perhaps any other nation. 
Speaking of carrying out obligations, here is a question which uh, fits right into this particular pattern. Uh, do you consider the military engagements between the forces of the United Nations and Rommel uh, in the North African desert a fulfillment of the pledge given by President Roosevelt and Prime Minister Churchill to Foreign Minister Molotov for a second front in 1942? In other words, the question uh, would be, is, is our uh, African invasion a second front or not? I think I would leave that up for Mr. Stalin to say. <laughs> and to General Montgomery. Who? Hmm? And to General Montgomery. Well, I mean to say, if it's not helping Mr. Stalin, who has three million Nazis on his neck, I mean, if he's dissatisfied, then I say it isn't a second front. On the other hand, if he is satisfied, then I think we in America should be satisfied. And but I, I should like to disagree with my friend Charlie Chaplin over his statement that he thinks that Russia have fulfilled their obligations more than any other nation. Yes. I want to know why they fulfilled them any more than Great Britain, with the exception of the Czechs, in which Great Britain, I don't let it down, the Czechs, they had no signed agreement, which France had. Yes. You yes. must remember that Great Britain went to war because Poland were attacked. And yes. uh, Russia, at one time, were actually an alliance with Germany. Great Britain had been at war for three and a half years. They have... Uh, backed up every promise they made to every nation, just, in my opinion, just as much as Russia. And I'd like to be, have it pointed out in what way Russia fulfilled the obligations any more than my country. Well, Thank I you, Mr. Yes. <laughs> they, I, I think it's on the record that they have fulfilled all their obligations and they've lived up to their pacts. Of course, I mean, we won't go back into past history because we want unity. You're talking about... <laughs> <laughs> If you're a... talking about the integrity of nations, they're all pretty near the cow's tail, pardon me. Uh, I would like to ask you a rather personal question off the record, if I may, Mr. Chaplin. Yes? Is there any intention on your part to uh, embark upon a diplomatic career? Not in the least. Not in the least. I am only interested in justice and trying to debunk the humbug. I would protest in the name of Europe if you become a diplomat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm we afraid. Would, we would lose the greatest actor, and we have actors enough about in the diplomacy. Uh, I'm, afraid I'm, I'm afraid I'm very undiplomatic. I've been accused of being a communist just because I want unity. Communists have the most excellent diplomats today. I know them. Well, here I'm, are two I've been trying to say that, Doctor. <laughs> <laughs> well, since it has been said now, I would like to uh, bring these two questions before you. One of them, uh, I'm going to give uh, Dr. Goodrich, and the other one, I'm going to formulate in such a manner that each one of you will have an opportunity to venture a guess or make a prediction, and I'm going to uh, note it rather carefully because it will be very interesting to come back to it next year. Uh, the, first point, the first part of the question is, Dr. Ludwig, is Hitler insane? He's very clever insane. <laughs> In other words, uh, you think he is insane? There are very many real insane men. He is not me. But insane is in any. Insane here. All right. Now I would like to take uh, this pencil here and make, uh, make a few notes in the order of the answers are being given by my experts here. The question is here, when will the war end? Now, I don't know... What war? What war? Which war? Germany or Japan? Yes. Well, let us, let us split it. Let us split it and say the European and the Pacific War. Let us split the Now, I'll start, uh, I'll start uh, with a roll call as we are seated here around the table. Sir Cedric, uh, what is your prediction? Well, first of all, I'm not quite clear what you mean by the war. Do you mean the actual cessation of... Uh, I think it is. Uh, that they may not all see some particular moment. Um, if, they, they, if there were a, a sudden collapse of Germany, my personal feeling is that Germany will collapse certainly before the end of 1943. Yeah. 1943. How about the Pacific War? The Pacific War, um, I think, may be a little more difficult, but it seems to me that with the combined forces of, uh, of um, the United States,
States, Britain, and the Soviet Union, that Japan certainly wouldn't be able to stand out for very long because the entire air power alone would be something that would be almost impossible to fight off. You've forgotten one factor, Frederick. That is China. I should, have, I should have included China, but China has already been fighting uh, Japan alone. I meant that the other forces would be released from combat elsewhere. That's why I didn't uh, include China. I think China would like to finish the job herself. Uh, and probably she will. Privilege. She may uh, have that privilege. Sir Cedric, may I ask for a clarification of the question? Well, how long uh, do you think the Pacific War will last after the European war is over? Give us any kind of a date that you believe in. Well, I would say 18 months. Eighteen months that would bring it up to uh, middle of 1945. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, Dr. Ludwig. I don't know anything about Japan. I was never there. Every child in America knows more about it. But I know Europe very well. And I can assure you that you can quote me as a very bad historian. A, a European war that to say cessation of uh, hostilities. hostilities. It's not over in 33. First, Italy and then Germany, both by psychological reasons. Right, uh, Mr. Bruce. I say that uh, Germany at the beginning of 1944. Yeah. And that Japan, it just depends whether Russia allow the Allies to have Vladivostok. Russia not yet at war with Japan. If Russia allow the Allies to have Vladivostok two years later, 19, 1946. 46. 46, yeah. 46. The end of 46. End of 46. Uh, Mr. Lloyd. Well, as regards Germany and Italy, well, I don't think we can take Italy into consideration anymore because that's Germany. We know if it was up to the, the Italian people, we wouldn't be at war with them today. <coughs> it's uh, just because they're controlled by the Germans, definitely from a military standpoint and from a policing standpoint, they're still more or less in the ring. Germany, uh, I hope, I hope she does collapse very soon. Uh... I feel it would be a very bad idea for any of us to listen too closely to stories of internal trouble in Germany. They're very clever. They're very clever in sending out that sort of propaganda. <clears throat> I think what we must do is to say, uh, let's forget the date, but go out and try to do the job as quickly as possible. Regarding Japan, I think the date or the year of finishing that job depends mostly on how soon we get to cleaning them out of where they've gotten in. I think the sooner we start it, the better. And the longer we delay, the longer it's going to take to get them out. Thank you. Now, Mr. Chaplin. Well, I have no idea when the war will terminate. I do know we mustn't be too optimistic. Even this North African affair we have a long pull of about 3,000 miles, as against 60 miles by water, and coming through that shoe of Italy, and being fed by Central Europe, and right down to the very toe, and then she crosses that small body of water. And I, I uh, wouldn't be at all surprised if we don't have to wait two or three months before we can clear them out of Tunisia. Then, as to the war itself, with the latest news in Russia, is not particularly uh, cheerful. And I think that, uh, however, we might, we might have to, uh, we might have to go two or three more years before we can defeat Germany. I think the question of Japan is a simple one. Give all the munitions to uh, the Chinese and they'll do the job themselves. Thank you, Mr. Chaplin, and I suppose this is all we have time for tonight. I want to thank you one and all for being my guests tonight. You've just heard a roundtable discussion of current events presented by Robert Arden, your foreign correspondent, whose analysis of foreign affairs is heard exclusively over these stations each weekday, Monday through Friday, at 7.45 p.m. Mr. Arden's guests tonight were Sir Cedric Hardwick, Frank Lloyd, Nigel Bruce, Dr. Emil Ludwig, and Charlie Chaplin. America Looks Abroad with Robert Arden is presented by the 12 Southern California offices 
of Dr. Cowan over KFWB and KFOX. This is Joe Yoakum speaking from Warner Brothers Hollywood Studios. World News Today, brought to you by Continental Radio and Television Corporation, makers of Admiral Radio, America's smart set. By shortwave broadcast, direct from important world capitals, as well as the leading news centers of our own country, CBS correspondents are waiting to bring you a complete report from the world's political and battlefronts. But first, here's John Daly with a summary of headline news as received in New York. The news from the battlefronts is good. The newest United Nations offensives... The Red Army's middle Don attacks in Russia and the British move into Jap-held Burma are making good progress. And in North Africa, the Allied pincers are slowly closing around the Germans and Italians as Hitler frantically tries to hold on to prepare the defenses against an Allied invasion of South Europe. In Russia, in the middle Don offensive, the Red Army is sweeping westward at a speed comparable to the Nazi advance eastward last July. They have taken Katamarovka, only 55 miles north of Milorovo, and now threaten the entire railway line from Voronezh to Milorovo. Milorovo is a junction point of the Moscow-Rostov Railroad. It has already been cut. In Russian hands, it can and probably will be the base of a Russian offensive south to retake Rostov and smash or trap the entire German force in the great Stalingrad salient. Once again, the Russians report that they have taken thousands of German prisoners, this time well over 10,000. That fact alone is extremely significant. It's unlikely that the Russians want to take any German prisoners and will not if any semblance of resistance is offered. The thousands of Nazis that are falling into Russian hands confirm earlier Russian reports that German troops are surrendering wholesale and that the morale of the Nazi army in Russia has deteriorated. About a year ago today, Hitler, with a great deal of fanfare, took over supreme command of the German armies. The best Christmas gift the United Nations could receive is the assurance that he will not relinquish that command. As the new Russian offensive hammers and tears chunks out of the Germans, dispatchers said that everywhere along the long Russian front, the Nazis are either in retreat, surrounded, or menaced on the flank. That, perhaps, is a bit on the optimistic side. But the Russians are holding on to what they've gained in the offensives at Stalingrad and west of Moscow. And although the Nazis have been reinforced and have launched vicious counterattacks, they have not been able to relieve the desperation of their position. Russia has regained 65,000 square miles of Soviet soil so far in the winter offensives. If the new Middle Don offensive maintains its momentum, it will probably force a general Nazi withdrawal that will finally lift the siege of Stalingrad. On the other side of the world, the Japanese Axis partner is still refusing to give battle. A communique from New Delhi said that the British forces moving into Burma continued their invasion without making contact with the Japs. In the air, Allied fighters covering and working with the ground troops are shooting up the Jap-held Akyab area, and Allied bombers are raiding the main Jap airport at Tonggu. In a night raid on the Jap airport at Tonggu, Jap fighters intercepted, but all Allied bombs were dropped in the target area and all Allied planes returned to base. The Japanese withdrawal without fighting is something of a mystery. It's not like them, and they themselves have been the authority for some reports received in the past few weeks that the British were going to launch an offensive to retake Burma. They've had months to prepare their defenses. But whatever the reason, British General Wavell is obviously looking for a fight, and the Chinese have announced that their army is ready to join in the invasion. In North Africa, the Eastern Allied pincer arm in Libya is moving steadily forward. The Western arm in Tunisia is still preparing for the land offensive. That Allied air power is smashing at Axis objectives all over Tunisia. And heavy Allied air action is also reported in Western Europe across the English Channel. There has been no official news as yet, but strong fighter forces and a large American bomber force have crossed the Channel and headed into France. We'll get the latest developments on the Mediterranean and European fighting from CBS correspondents abroad. In the Pacific, General MacArthur's forces in New Guinea have made new gains in the Buna area. The only Jap forces remaining in that area are to hold out as long as they can, but the Allies are checkmating all attempts to reinforce them. And now for the first report from abroad, Admiral Radio takes you to CBS Algiers, Charles Collingwood reporting. This campaign in French North Africa has settled down into a muddy struggle for supply. In this present phase, a truck driver or a good mechanic is almost as important as a general. It's not very romantic, this truck driver's war. But back in the early days of this campaign, there was romance and melodrama enough for anyone. Those were the days when generals were being spirited around the Mediterranean by submarines, and there were secret conferences beneath trap doors, and one if by day, two if by night, lantern signals hanging from steeples. No episode in these almost dime novel days 
was more genuinely thrilling than the dramatic appearance in North Africa of General Giro. I suppose you know that Giro escaped from France by submarine. But the whole story of that escape has not yet been told. Giro's rescue was engineered by an American naval captain named Gerald Wright. Wright had been with General Clark when Clark landed in North Africa before the campaign began. And he used the same submarine to get Giro out. It was a British submarine commanded by Lieutenant Jewell. This submarine left port late in October. Captain Wright didn't know where he was to pick up General Giro, but he knew about where, so they lay off the coast of France until November 4th. On November 4th, the submarine received directions. They were told to rendezvous and given information about minefields, and the escape was fixed for the night of November 6th. As Captain Wright says, the next step was the most ticklish of all, going submerged into a landlocked harbor in darkness. And lay to less than a thousand yards off the French Sea. An hour later, a large rowboat came alongside. In it were General Zero, his son, and two staff officers. As Captain Wright tells the story, by this time the sea was considerably rougher. The rowboat was pitching as it eased up to the forward casing of the submarine. Just as the general stepped from his boat, the boat pitched, and this threw him off balance, and he fell into the water. Captain Wright adds that the general was rescued unhurt. After that, the submarine left the harbor at, quote, maximum speed. But the escape was by no means completed. Zero was out of France, but he was not yet in safety. As the submarine proceeded out to sea, they received a signal from General Eisenhower telling them that a plane would meet them at dawn. That was dawn on November 7th. The plane didn't find them until 11.30 in the morning. The sea was choppy, and it was hard to transfer the passengers and their baggage. Just to make matters worse, an unidentified plane hove into sight and circled the area for 20 minutes. But finally, General Zero and his party were in the seaplane and the seaplane in the air, and thus, spoke Captain Wright again, on the afternoon of November 7th, some hours before the operation for the liberation of North Africa was launched, we delivered Zero to Eisenhower. This is Charles Collingwood returning you to New York. Despite the foreign background noise which followed the pattern of Axis jamming of Allied broadcasts, we hope that Charles Collingwood's report from Algiers was understandable. And now for our next report from overseas, Admiral Radio takes you to CBS London. Bob Trout reporting. London knew the United States Army bombers were out over the continent today for people on the southeast coast could see them flying out across the channel, so low that their American markings were plain and clear. They were gone a long time, some three and a half hours, so the air-wise people of the southeast coast knew this time they'd gone far inland. A few moments ago, United States Army Air Force headquarters in London gave out the news. A large force of flying fortresses and liberators flew this afternoon to rumilly sur seine 80 miles southeast of Paris, and 180 miles from the French coast. It's the location of a large airfield. It's too early to have the results of the day's activity, but the early announcement tells us that nearly 300 aircraft of Royal Air Force's Fighter Command cooperated with the large force of American bombers. The fighter's role was to support the bombers, providing some cover for part of the way in toward the target and out again, while others carried out sweeps. It was the first time in eight days that the weather has permitted large-scale air operations over northern France. A great part of daylight Allied air activity from bases in Britain is directed against the enemy's transport system on the continent. Today in London, the Parliamentary Secretary to the Ministry of Economic Warfare said that German-controlled railroads have to carry a greater burden than any railroad system has ever done before. A good deal of the strain has been thrown on the enemy railroads by Allied attacks on Germany's sea routes in the North Sea, in the Baltic, and in the Mediterranean. Late this afternoon, the Germans announced that Laval, Jano, Goering, and Ribbentrop had been holding one of those conferences at Hitler's headquarters. Political and military discussions was the way the Germans put it. Furthermore, the Germans say, the meeting was imbued with the determination of the Axis powers to make an all-out effort to win final victory. 
This is defensive talk from the people who started out to conquer the world in an offensive without intermission. And it's also something more. It's the kind of talk engaged in by people who have taken a severe blow and know it. Today's German announcement has in London a somewhat familiar ring. It sounds not unlike some of those statements from London back in the days when the British were taking it hard. The British were tough enough to come through, all right, and there's no doubt the Germans will make a very powerful effort to emulate the British example. For our next report, we go now to CBS Cairo and the report of Winston Burdett. This is Justin Morrison in Cairo. One trouble with being on the winning side of this war is that the Germans run too fast. And if a reporter stuck in Cairo wants to get to the front, he has to fly. The British didn't have a plane available when I wanted to go, but the Americans had dozens. So I was told by the handsome American major who runs that part of the show. Mind you, I don't think this was deliberate, but when I missed the plane he had arranged, through no fault of his, and came trailing back to the hotel in the evening, dirty and disappointed, it was probably only coincidence that the major was sitting in the lobby having a pink tea with my girl. So I got away the next morning, and for three days I waited at Gambit, a way station in the desert, for another plane to Adidabia. And when that plane took off, it was loaded with 50-gallon drums of gasoline, lashed to the sides of the cabin with rope. I was the only passenger. And when the dashing young American pilot came into Adidabia, he landed downwind and bounced across the rough field like a kangaroo and poked the plane's nose into the mud and nearly turned a somersault. The lashings on the gasoline drums broke and strong men groaned as they lifted the drums off me. I groaned, too. And in the week I spent with broken ribs in a hospital tent at Ajitabia, I missed the day we moved into a gala and the day the New Zealanders got behind the enemy and smashed a third of his tank and captured at least 500 prisoners. But lying in that tent, surrounded by men who had been blown up by mines, I discovered that no matter how badly a man's body may be hurt, his spirit can remain undamaged. You get a new viewpoint of the world when you lie on your back and look at it. And my girl didn't like the major anyway. She said he had more hands than a caterpillar. This is Chester Morrison returning you to CBS New York and John Daly. Before bringing you more news from CBS correspondents, here's Warren Sweeney with a word from Admiral Radio. Could this scene take place in your household? Hey, Mom. Oh, Mom. You know about that radio that went dead this morning? Pop said he'd fix it tonight. Well, he did. Our radio's in a worse mess than, in it, than the alarm clock was when I went to work on it. A year ago, we might have thought such a scene was comic. Today, it brought us on tragedy. A year ago, if Pop accidentally broke a vital part while trying to repair the family radio, it didn't matter much, for he could buy a new one. Today, however, new parts, like new radios, are difficult to get. Therefore, when your radio needs attention, it's important that you call not just a handyman, but a highly skilled radio technician. The best man to call is your Admiral Dealer. And there are three reasons why he is the best man. First... Admiral dealers are professionals. They have all the facilities, all the knowledge necessary to put a radio in perfect condition regardless of make. Second, Admiral dealers are businessmen in your own community. They'll give you honest service economically. Third, Admiral dealers realize Uncle Sam is depending upon radio to furnish war information to his citizens. So they pledge themselves to do their best for America's radio sets. Take care of your radio. And when it needs attention, call your Admiral Dealer. And now here once again for Admiral Radio is John Daly. For the news at home, Admiral Radio turns to CBS Washington, Lee White reporting. A Navy communique one hour ago reported the continuance of our air offensive against the Japanese airdrome at Munda on New Georgia Island. For the ninth successive day, dive bombers and flying fortresses attacked the installations and the runway at Munda yesterday. No American planes were lost, but three intercepting enemy fighters were shot down. Here in Washington, Senator Burton K. Wheeler of Montana, a pre-war isolationist and a leader of the America First Committee, 
has threatened to demand a congressional investigation of the way the Justice Department has been handling the prosecution of Nazi sympathizers. Mr. Wheeler says he thinks it's a disgrace the way 28 persons were indicted here in Washington on charges of sedition. Those indicted include such people as George Sylvester Virek, an admitted not German agent, Elizabeth Dilling, author of The Red Network, the Reverend Gerald B. Winrod, otherwise known as the J. Hawk Hitler, and William Dudley Pelley, the Fuhrer of the Silver Shirts. In an interview published today in the Washington Post, Senator Wheeler accused Secretary of Justice Biddle of attempting to smear him and present his pre-war isolationism as a crime. As for the 28 persons now awaiting trial for sedition, Mr. Wheeler said he knew nothing about them, whether they're guilty or innocent, but he said he's convinced they won't have a fair trial. Mr. Wheeler attacked the Washington Post as a stooge of the Department of Justice and called its reporter a spy. He added that he thinks reporters and newspapers who have helped to indict the defendants are engaged in a dirty business and predicted that the day will soon come when they will all regret it. The reply of the Washington Post was simply to print a detailed story about a speech the senator made before an America First rally in Los Angeles last year, charging that Franz Ferenc, a German agent now under arrest, had printed the posters and the banners displayed at the meeting and had otherwise assisted in the organization of the rally. The Post today also reprinted two letters from Senator Wheeler to Secretary Biddle, in which, among other things, the senator accuses Mr. Biddle of heading an inquisition. Mr. Biddle's reply was also published in the Post. He simply promised to consider any allegations of improper conduct on the part of the Justice Department, provided the senator can furnish him with specific information. At one minute after midnight tomorrow morning, the ban on gasoline will be lifted. A coupons will be honored and will still be worth three gallons. B and C coupons, however, will be reduced in value from four to three gallons each. Tomorrow, there's going to be a conference between economic stabilizer Burns, petroleum administrator Ickes, transportation director Eastman, and Leon Henderson, the retiring price administrator. Presumably, the whole gasoline rationing system is going to be reorganized entirely, but to what extent will depend on the results of tomorrow's conference. All we know at the moment is what Mr. Henderson told us last night, that gasoline restrictions are going to be much more rigidly enforced in the future, and that drastic steps are going to be taken to eliminate bootlegging, which is becoming more and more of a problem. As for Christmas travel, the government wants to discourage everyone it can from going home for Christmas, but no orders have been issued. The government is leaving it up to the individual's judgment and his conscience not to put too much of a strain on transportation facilities during the Christmas holidays. Today, Donald M. Nelson reiterated past warnings that the nation faces ever more drastic restrictions on all sorts of travel, by rail, by bus, air, and by private automobile. In a letter to James E. Murray, head of the Senate Small Business Committee, Mr. Nelson says, Travel by automobile is due for restriction much more drastic than that obtaining today. Travel by common carrier will be increasingly inconvenient and in some cases not permissible at all. He advises Mr. Murray to draft plans for storing up consumer goods in the immediate vicinity of local markets as a safeguard against possible temporary breakdowns in the distributive system. There may be occasions, hours, days, or weeks in duration, he predicts, when civilian goods cannot be moved in adequate quantities to supply certain areas. Therefore, says Mr. Nelson, it will be advisable for merchants to have considerable inventories of food, fuel, clothing, and medical supplies on hand at all times. Last Friday, when the gasoline ban was first announced, many people seemed to think it was designed mainly to prevent holiday travel by automobile. Thousands of people here in Washington had been hoarding their coupons in the hope of being able to drive home and spend Christmas with their families. They knew the government disapproved of holiday travel, and so they thought the suspension of gasoline distribution had been ordered on their account. Now it seems that it wasn't. And though the government still frowns on going home for Christmas, it will apparently be possible for many people to do so. Whether they will or not, of course, depends on how seriously they privately consider the gasoline shortage to be. But the three-day suspension seems to have had a sobering effect on many people, to judge from the number of telephone calls the local studio here has been receiving from listeners who want to help solve the problem. I now return you to John Daly in New York. One of the big news stories here at home today is the return of Captain Eddie Rickenbacker to this country. He will tell his own story over most of these stations at approximately 3.30 Eastern wartime this afternoon. 
Now, here in New York is Major George Fielding Elliott, Columbia's military expert, with an analysis of the significance of the new British offensive in Burma. Major Elliott. It is far too early to determine whether the British invasion of Burma is the beginning of a real attempt to recover all of Burma from the Japanese, or is merely a local operation with the limited objective of recovering the airfield and port of Akyab on the shore of the Bay of Bengal. The enthusiasm with which the news of the British move has been received in Chongqing, is, of course, understandable. Only by the recovery of Burma can China's communications with the outside world by way of the famous Burma Road be restored. Naturally, this is an operation in which the Chinese would be only too happy to cooperate to the fullest extent of their power. But the advantages to be derived from the reconquest of Burma would not be China's advantages alone. To reopen the Burma Road would mean an allied air power could move more freely into China because fuel and bombs and spare parts could be sent in. And the building up of Allied air bases at mainland positions is the best means of directing air attacks against the heart of Japanese industry, those air attacks which seem to offer the best means of bringing the realities of war home to the Japanese people. Moreover, the recapture of Burma would uh, do a great deal to offset the feeling of defeatism in India which has been the hidden cause of much of the political and social unrest in that great subcontinent. However, if Burma is to be retaken, the operations will have to be of a far more extensive nature than the present thrust toward isolated Akya. Other invasion columns, British and Chinese, will have to converge on the difficult frontiers of that country, and the British fleet in the Bay of Bengal will have to blockade Rangoon and Mulmine to cut off the Japanese supplies and reinforcements. These must, of course, come by sea, for the land communications between Burma and Thailand are as difficult as those between Burma and India, if not more so. The British report that the Japanese are offering no opposition to the thrust toward Akya. This is not like the Japanese, who have usually fought tooth and nail for every foot of ground when attacked. The reason is probably a tactical one. Probably the area into which the British are advancing offers no position suitable for defense, and the Japanese are therefore withdrawing toward stronger positions. That was Columbia's military expert, Major George Fielding Elliott. Here's a message from our sponsor. Today being the first day of Christmas week, Admiral takes this opportunity of extending cordial greetings to listeners from coast to coast. America's Christmas season this year is happier than last. All the luxuries on our tables may be less in quantity, and the trimmings on our gifts not so elaborate. But now, we and the other United Nations are solidly on our way to victory. There is happiness in knowing each of us is playing a part in bringing about this victory to free mankind from bondage. Working and fighting together for one cause forms a tie which binds every American to every other American. Admiral workers feel this spirit of brotherhood deeply. They are united in producing the best possible radio equipment for America's armed forces, as much of it as is humanly possible. Admiral workers are united in looking forward to the Christmas when they will again be turning out the radio sets America wants in its homes. Admiral radios. For when victory is won, Admiral will resume its place as the world's largest manufacturer of radio phonograph combinations with automatic record changers. Uncle Sam has provided V-mail service for your boy who is stationed overseas. For V-mail service, write your letter on V-mail stationery Obtainable at any store where stationery is sold. Use regular airmail stamps and put it in the mail box. The Army and the Post Office will do the rest. Photograph your letter on microfilm, fly it overseas, re-photograph, and hand it to your boy exactly as you wrote it. This is an extra service from Uncle Sam. World News Today is brought to you each Sunday at this hour by Continental Radio and Television Corporation... Makers of Admiral Radio, America's smart set. Be sure to listen again next Sunday when Admiral brings you World News Today by shortwave, direct from the leading news centers of the world. This is Warren Sweeney saying good afternoon and Merry Christmas from Admiral Radio. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. The WBBM Air Theater, Wrigley Building, Chicago.
Well, that carol came from some of the men of the 8th Army, and it was sung from the borders of Tripoli, Kenya. We are here. We just pulled off the coast road that goes along there towards Sirte and ultimately to Tripoli. And over by our recording truck, there come one or two men of the 8th Army, and they're led by a corporal. I can see him there in his great coat and tin hat, playing clarinet, as you've just heard. And they've just been having a bit of a sing song. And we've recorded this bit of it. As a matter of fact, uh, they've been singing all kinds of songs. There's a bit of a difficulty in getting them to sing a carol at all, to be quite honest. And I don't want you to get the impression that the 8th Army is just having a nice picnic and is going gaily singing carols up the road after Rommel. They're not at all. They're far too busy fighting this war, and a grim enough business it is, and all this sand and dreary desert, and there's very little time for singing at all. We are a good way at the moment behind our forward troop. We certainly won't be going about caroling tonight. And Christmas, although it will be remembered and celebrated in the desert, won't, to be quite honest, be an affair of plum puddings and merry crackers and parties and good feasting for the men of the 8th Army.